This is audible. Find Her. Written by Lisa Gardner and read by Regina Regan. Chapter One. These are the things I didn't know. When you first wake up in a dark wooden box, you'll tell yourself this isn't happening. You'll push against the lid, of course. No surprise there. You'll beat at the sides with your fists, pummel your heels against the bottom. You'll bang your head again and again, even though it hurts. And you'll scream. You'll scream and scream and scream. Snot will run from your nose. Tears will stream from your eyes. Until your screams grow rough, hiccupy. Then you'll hear sounds that are strange and sad and pathetic. And you'll understand the box, truly get, hey, I'm trapped in a dark wooden box, when you realize those sounds come from you. Pine boxes aren't composed entirely of smooth surfaces. Air holes, for example, can be crudely drilled. When you run your finger around them, when you poke your fingertip into them, desperately seeking something, you'll get splinters. You'll chew out the wooden shards best you can. Then you'll suck on your injured digit, lick the blood beating the tip, and make more hurt puppy dog sounds. You're alone in the box. It's frightening, overwhelming, awful. Mostly because you don't yet understand how much you have to fear. You'll get to know the box well, this home away from home. You'll wiggle against it with your shoulders to determine the width. You'll trace the length with your hands, attempt to bring up your feet. Not enough room to bend your knees. Not enough room to roll over. It's exactly your size. As if it's been made just for you. Your very own pine coffin, straining your lower back, bruising your shoulder blades, paining the back of your head. One convenience. Newspapers line the bottom. You don't notice this detail in the beginning. Don't understand it once you do. Until the first time you wet yourself. Then spend days lying in your own filth. Like an animal, you'll think. Except most animals are treated better than this. Your mouth will grow parched, your lips chapped. You'll start jamming your fingers into those air holes, ripping apart your own skin, just so you have something to taste, swallow, suck. You'll know yourself in a way you've never known yourself before, broken down, elemental, the stink of your own urine, the salt of your own blood. But you still don't know anything yet. When you finally hear footsteps, you won't believe it. You're delirious, you'll tell yourself. You're dreaming. You're a lost, pathetic waste of human skin. A stupid, stupid girl who should have known better and now just look at you. And yet the sound of the metal lock jangling on the other side of the box wall inches from your ear. Maybe you cry again, or would, if you had any moisture left. When you first see his face, the man who has done this to you, you're relieved, happy even. You gaze upon his puffy cheeks, his beady eyes, his gaping mouth, yellow-stained teeth, and you think, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God. He lets you out of the box, lifts you up, actually, because your legs don't work and your muscles lack all strength and your head lolls, which makes you giggle, head lolling, one of those words from English class that never made any sense. But there you have it. Heads loll. Your head lolls. God, the smell. Garlic and B.O. and unwashed clothes and skanky hair. Is it you? Is it him? You gag helplessly. And that makes him laugh. As he holds up the bottle of water. As he spells out, exactly what you'll have to do in order to earn it. He's fat, old, disgusting, repulsive. The unkempt beard, the greasy hair, the ketchup stains splotching the front of his cheap checkered shirt. You're supposed to be too good for him, young, 
fresh, beautiful. The kind of girl who could have her pick of the litter at a frat party. You have moves. Had moves. You cry for your mother. You beg him to let you go as you lie in a crumpled heap at his feet. Then finally, ultimately, with the last of your strength, you remove your clothes. You let him do what he's going to do. You scream, but your throat is too dry to make a sound. You vomit, but your stomach is too empty to yield any contents. You survive. And later, when he finally offers up that bottle of water, only to dump it over your head, you lift your hands shamelessly to capture as much of the moisture as you can. You lick it from your palms, chew it from your oily, filthy hair. You wait till he's distracted, then suck that spot of ketchup from his now-discarded shirt. Back to the box. The box. The box. The lid hammers now. The lock snaps shut. The repulsive man walks away, leaves you once again all alone, naked, bruised, bloody, knowing things you never wanted to know. Mommy, you whisper. But this monster's real, and there's nothing anyone can do to save you anymore. This is what I do know. There's not much to do day after day, trapped in a coffin-sized box. In fact, there's really only one thing worth imagining, obsessing, contemplating minute by minute, hour after terrible hour. One thought that keeps you going. One focus that gives you strength. You'll find it. You'll hone it. Then, if you're anything like me, you'll never let it go. Revenge. But be careful what you wish for, especially if you're just a stupid girl trapped in a coffin-sized box. Chapter Two She started with a pomegranate martini. Paid too much, of course. Boston bars being very expensive. Pomegranate juice being very trendy. But it was Friday night. Another week survived, and by God, she deserved at least an overpriced fruity cocktail. Besides, she had some faith in herself. Loosen another button of her white fitted shirt, pull a few clips from her shoulder length blonde hair. She was 27, fit, and with the kind of ass that brought notice. She might buy her first drink, but odds were, she wouldn't be buying the second. She took a sip, cool, sweet, biting. She warmed it on her tongue, then let the vodka slide down her throat. Worth every penny of the 14 bucks. For a moment, she closed her eyes. The bar disappeared. The sticky floor, the strobing lights, the high-pitched squeal of the opening band still warming up. She stood in a void of silence, in a place that was solely hers. When she opened her eyes again, he was standing there. He bought her a second drink, then a third, even offered a fourth. But by then, the vodka and the dance floor lights were starting to mix in a way that didn't make for a great morning after. Besides, she wasn't an idiot. Whole time Mr. Haven't I Seen You Around Here Before was plying her with martinis. He stuck to beer. He was nice enough looking. She decided somewhere near the end of martini number two. Muscular, clearly a guy who worked out. Uninspired taste in clothing, though, with his tan slacks, button-up blue striped shirt. Going for young professional, she supposed. But she noticed his pants were frayed at the hems. His shirt faded from too many washings. When she asked what he did for a living, he tried for charm. Oh, a little of this, a little of that, he said going with a wink and a grin. But his eyes remained flat, even distant, and she felt the first pinprick of unease. He recovered quickly, produced martini number three. Wasn't wearing a watch, she noticed, as he tried to catch the bartender with the 20, then failed, as the other patrons were flashing hundreds. Not a wedding ring, either. Unattached. Well-built. 
Maybe her knight was looking up. She smiled, but it wasn't a happy look. Something moved across her face, that void again, that realization that all these hours, days, weeks later, she still felt alone, would always feel alone, even in a crowded room. It was just as well he didn't turn around. He finally snagged the bartender, white shirt, black tie, the kind of pecs that produced big tips, and got her a fresh drink. She was ready for the fourth martini by then. Why not? It enabled her to talk about her little bit of this and little bit of that with a wink and a grin that matched the gleam in her eyes. And when his gaze lingered on the front of her shirt, the extra button that she might have slipped just moments before, she didn't back away. She let him stare at the lacy hint of her hot pink bra. She let him admire her tits. Why not? Friday night, end of the week. She'd earned this. He wanted to leave the bar at midnight. She made him wait till close. Band was surprisingly good. She liked the way the music made her feel, as if her blood were still alive, her heart still beating in her chest. He was clearly uncomfortable on the dance floor, but it didn't matter. She had moves good enough for both of them. Her white fitted shirt was now tied beneath her breasts, Daisy Duke style. Her low riding black dress jeans clung to every curve, her tall leather boots stomping out each rhythmic beat. After a while, he didn't even bother with dancing, but simply swayed in place, watching her. Her arms flung overhead, lifting her breasts her hips swinging round and round, taut bare abdomen glistening with sweat. He had brown eyes, she noted, dark, flat, watchful, predatory, she thought. But this time around, instead of being spooked, she felt a fresh spike of adrenaline. The well-chiseled bartender was staring at her now, too. She did a tour of the dance floor for both of them. Having accepted that fourth martini, her mouth now felt sweet and purple, while her limbs were liquid ice. She could dance all night, take over this floor, take over this bar, take over this town. Except that wasn't what Mr. Haven't I Seen You Around Here Before wanted. No guy bought a girl three overpriced drinks merely for the privilege of watching her dance. Band wrapped up, started putting away their instruments. She missed the music acutely, Felt it like a pang to her soul. No more driving bass to power her feet, mask her pain. Now it was just her. Mr. Haven't I seen you around here before? And the promise of a killer hangover. He suggested they head outside for some fresh air. She wanted to laugh, to tell him he had no idea. Instead, she followed him to the narrow side street covered in littered cigarette butts. He asked her if she wanted to smoke. She declined. He took her hand. Then he pinned her to the side of a blue-painted dumpster, left hand already squeezing her breast, palming her nipple. His eyes weren't flat anymore. They were molten, predator having secured prey. Your place or mine, he demanded. She couldn't help herself. She started to laugh, which was when the evening really took a turn for the worse. Mr. Haven't I Seen You Around Here Before didn't care for being laughed at. He struck quickly, right hand connecting, open-palmed against the side of her face. Her head rocked back into the metal dumpster. She heard the crash, registered the pain. But courtesy of four martinis, it all felt distant, a bad night happening to someone else. Were you a cheese? He yelled at her, hands squeezing her breast, face screaming just inches from hers. This close, she smelled the beer on his breath, noted the distinct webbing of red veins around his nose. Closet drinker. She should have realized that sooner. Kind of guy who liquored up before coming to the bar because it was cheaper that way. Meaning he wasn't there for the booze at all, but to hook up, to find a girl like her and take her home. In other words, he was perfect for her. She should say something, or stomp her heel on the instep of his foot, or grab his pinky, not his whole hand, just the pinky finger, and wrench it back till it touched his wrist. 
He'd scream. He'd let her go. He'd look into her eyes and realize his mistake, because big cities such as Boston were filled with guys like him, but also with girls like her. She never got a chance. He was shouting. She was smiling, maybe even still laughing, with her head ringing and the taste of blood salting her tongue. Then, Mr. Haven't I Seen You Before ceased to exist. He was there, then he was gone, replaced by the body-conscious bartender with the amazing pecs and a now very concerned look on his face. Are you okay? he asked. Did he hurt you? Do you need help? Do you want to call the cops? He offered his arm. She took it, stepping over the body of Mr. Haven't I Seen You Around Here Before, who was knocked, slack-jawed to the ground. He shouldn't have touched you like that, the bartender informed her soberly leading her away from the gawkers gathering around, leading her deeper into the shadows beyond the perimeter of the bar's flashing lights. It's okay. I'll take care of you now. As she realized for the first time that the bartender was gripping her arm harder than necessary, not letting go. She tried to talk her way out of it. Even when you knew better, it was a natural place to start. Hey, big boy, what's your hurry? Can't we just slow down? Hey, you're hurting me. But of course he never broke his stride, nor relaxed his bruising grip above her elbow. He was walking funny, keeping her tucked against his side like two lovers out on a very fast stroll, but his head was tucked down and tilted to the side, keeping his face in the shadows, she realized, so no one could see him. Then it came to her, the line of his posture, the way he moved, She'd seen him before. Not his face, not his features, but the hunch of his shoulders, the rounded bend of his neck. Three or four months ago, summertime, on the evening news, when a Boston College student went out drinking and never came home again, the local stations had repeatedly aired a video clip from a nearby security camera, capturing the girl's last known moments as she was hustled away by an unknown male, head twisted from view. No, she breathed. He didn't acknowledge her protest. They'd come to an intersection. Without hesitation, he yanked her left down a darker, skinnier street that already smelled of urine and dumpster trash and dark things never spoken of again. She dug in her heels, sobering up quickly now, doing her best to resist. At 110 pounds to his 190, her efforts hardly made a difference. He jerked her tighter against him, right arm clamped around her waist, and continued on, Stop, she tried to scream, but no sound came out. Her voice was locked in her throat. She was breathless, lungs too constricted to scream. Instead, a faint whimper, a sound she was embarrassed to admit was her own, but knew from past experience had to be. I have a family, she panted at last. He didn't respond. Fresh intersection, new turn, skittering between tall brick buildings out of public view, she already had no idea where they were. Please, stop, she squeezed out. His arm was too tight around her waist, bruising her ribs. She was going to vomit, willed it to happen, as maybe that would gross him out, convince him to let her go. No such luck. She heaved abruptly, purple liquid spewing from her mouth, spraying her feet the side of his pants. He grimaced, jerked reflexively away, then quickly recovered and yanked her once again forward, pulling her by her elbow. I'm going to be sick again, she moaned, feet tangling, finally slowing his momentum. Drank too much. His voice was filled with scorn. You don't understand. You don't know who I am. He paused long enough to adjust his grip on her arm. Shouldn't have come to the bar alone. But I'm always alone. He didn't get it. Or maybe he didn't care. He stared at her, gaze flat, face expressionless. Then his arm shot forward, and he socked her in the eye. Her neck snapped back. Her cheek exploded. Her eyes welled with tears. She had a thought, fleeting, faint, maybe the secret to understanding the universe. But then it was gone. And much like Mr. Haven't I Seen You Around Here Before, she ceased to exist. Friday night end of a long week. She'd earned this. He moved her, by foot, by car, she didn't know. But when she regained consciousness, 
She was no longer on the mean streets of Boston, but tucked somewhere dark and dank. The floor beneath her bare feet felt cold. Concrete, cracked and uneven. A basement, she thought, or maybe a garage. She could see faintly. Enough light from three small windows placed high on one wall, not letting in daylight, but a dim yellow haze, as if a street light was outside those windows, permitting an ambient glow. She used the wash of illumination to determine several things at once. Her hands were bound in front of her with plastic zip ties. She'd been stripped completely naked, and at the moment, at least, she was alone. Her heart rate accelerated. Her head hurt, her skin prickling with goosebumps, and odds were she'd miss this state of relative safety soon enough. The kind of guy who knocked out his date and removed every stitch of her clothing wasn't the kind that was going to leave her untouched for long. Even now, he was most likely preparing for the rest of the evening's festivities, humming away to himself, contemplating games he could indulge in with his new toy, feeling like he was the biggest, baddest asshole in town. She smiled then, though once again it wasn't a happy expression on her face. First off, inventory. Basement or garage inevitably meant storage, and as the saying went, one person's trash was another person's treasure. He'd been stupid not to bind her ankles as well. Not as experienced as he thought. Not as clever as he was about to wish he'd been. But then people saw what they wanted to see. She'd been taken in by his pecs. He, no doubt, assessed her as an easy blonde. Turned out, they were both in for some surprises this evening. She found a heavy work table. Raising her bound wrists, she skimmed her fingers across the wooden surface. She identified a thick metal vise built into one corner, moved on more quickly in search of what she hoped might be an assortment of tools. But no, he wasn't that stupid and she wasn't that lucky. No abandoned sharp objects, pliers, hammer. She searched the room's perimeter next, almost tripping over a metal can, then reaching out quickly to grab it before it fell. No sense in alerting him to her conscious state any sooner than necessary. Lid steady, nerves still shaky. She forced herself to continue. The metal can yielded a filled plastic garbage bag. She set it aside in the short term, then paced the remaining two walls. She identified a collection of empty gas cans, as well as two plastic jugs. Based on smell, one gallon jug held the remains of windshield wiper fluid, the other antifreeze. So she was most likely in a garage, being Boston, probably a detached unit, allowing the bartender even more privacy. She didn't dwell on what might happen next, why a man like him required such privacy. For that matter, she refused to get caught up in the stickiness of the floor in the rear corner, or the smell that was becoming nearly impossible to ignore, an odor that matched the taste of blood on her tongue. She took the jug of antifreeze and moved it to the bare wooden work table. His first mistake, her first victory. She found a shovel propped up against the wall. With renewed vigor, she placed her plastic bindings against the blade and rubbed vigorously. After a minute or two, she was breathing heavily, sweat stinging her swollen eye. Yet to judge by the feel of the zip tie, nothing. The edge of the spade was too dull, or the plastic too durable. She tried for another moment, then forced herself to abandon the effort. Zip ties were tough. Frankly, she would have preferred metal cuffs. But at least he'd done the courtesy of binding her hands in front of her, where she still had considerable use of them, while not pulling the plastic so tight she lost all feeling in her fingertips. She could move her feet. She could move her arms. She could hold herself perfectly still and feel the void right there. Dark comforting, silent. Alone in a crowded room, she thought, and for a moment, her body swayed, listening to music only she could hear. Then she grew serious again. Trash. It was time. She tore through the thin plastic bag using her fingers. First thing that hit her was the stench. Rotten food, rotted flesh, something worse. She gagged, felt tears well in her eyes, and forced down a flood of bile. 
Now was not the time to be squeamish as she forced her fingers into oozing garbage she could feel but not see. Paper towels, wet piles of God knows what, discarded food containers, takeout. From inside the home or food he'd brought out here to share with his catch or munch on himself when taking a break from his entertainment. Halfway through the bag, she came upon a new batch of rotten, more organic smelling this time. Her fingers moved quicker. Paper dried petals, squishy green stems, flowers, a tossed bouquet. Because in addition to food, he plied his playthings with treats. More likely, she decided, the last ruse he'd used to lure an unsuspecting victim. Then, in the next instant, it occurred to her. Where there's a cheap florist's bouquet. Bound hands moving quickly now, diving into the foul pile, digging determinedly through rancid Chinese food and sticky duck sauce, tossing aside empty coffee cups and more and more gooey flower carcasses. Plastic. She was seeking the edge of a thin plastic packet, small, square, with a sharp edge. Bang! The noise came from directly behind her, the sound of a hand, a foot, connecting with a metal garage door. She couldn't help herself. She froze, naked, shivering, elbow deep in garbage, and listened to him once again announce his arrival. Because he wanted her to know he was coming. He wanted her shaking, terrified, curled into a ball, already fearing the worse. That was the kind of man he was. She smiled. And this time, it was a happy expression on her face. Because now, in her right hand, she had it the thin packet of flower food, generously included with most bouquets and exactly what she'd been looking for. She hadn't lied to him before. He didn't know her, which had been his first and would now be his last mistake. Behind her, the garage door began its shaky ascent, him dragging out the suspense as he slowly heaved it open. No more time to wait, no more time to plan. She gripped the packet between her palms, then grabbed the nearly empty jug of antifreeze, moving swiftly across the cracked concrete floor until she stood beneath the row of eyebrow windows, the weak light streaming above her, bathing the middle of the space in a dim glow while keeping her in shadow. Garage door, quarter of the way open. Now a third. A half. She released her grip on the packet, grabbed the antifreeze jug first, pinning it between her feet, then used both hands to press down the child's safety lid and twist. The plastic cap clattered to the floor, but the rattle of the heaving metal door covered the sound. Two-thirds of the way open. Now three-quarters. Enough for a grown man to walk through. She placed the antifreeze to the side, forced herself to take the time to shake the packet, settling the crystals to the bottom. Couldn't afford to waste any if this was to work. He stepped into the space, the bartender with the amazing pecs. Shirt already off. Muscles rippling in the moonlight. A beautiful physical specimen. She should feel guilty for what she was going to do next. But she didn't. She stepped forward into the dim stream of light. Her nakedness clearly exposed. Her wrists clearly bound. He smiled, right hand already moving to the waistband of his jeans. You don't know who I am she said clearly. He paused, regarded her quizzically, as if she'd challenged him with complicated math. Then, the bartender moved toward her. She ripped open the plastic packet, took three quick steps forward, and tossed the contents into his face. He reared back, coughing and blinking as the flower food hit his eyes, nose, mouth. What the? She grabbed the open jug of antifreeze, swirled it three times, and then, a suspended heartbeat of time. He looked at her, stared hard, and in that instant, they finally saw each other. Not a ripped bartender, not a stupid blonde, but dark heart to lost soul. She sprayed the antifreeze straight into his face, splashed it onto his exposed skin and the granules of potassium permanganate still clinging there. One more heartbeat of time, then the first tendrils of smoke from his hair his cheeks, his eyelashes. The man lifted his hands to his face. Then basic chemistry took over, and the bartender's skin burst into flame. He screamed, he ran, 
He beat at his own head as if it would make a difference. He did everything but stop, drop, and roll, panic having its way. She stood there, not moving a muscle, not saying a word. She watched until at last he collapsed into a pile of smoking ruin. Other sounds penetrated then, neighbors calling out into the dark, demanding to know what was going on. The distant sounds of sirens, as apparently one of the smarter ones had already called 911. The woman finally stepped forward. She peered down at her attacker's remains, watched the smoky tendrils drift from his now blackened skin. Friday night, she thought. She'd earned this. Chapter Three Who is she? Don't know. Neighbor over there, Kyle Petrakis, claims he found her standing over the body, stripped naked, hands tied, face bashed. She did all this with her hands tied? Sergeant Detective D.D. Warren knelt down, studied the charred remains of their victim, perpetrator. Body was curled in a near fetal position, hands clenched over the young male's face, a protective gesture which, judging by the burn patterns across his head, shoulders, and face, had been too little too late. Chemical fire, the third detective spoke up. Combine potassium permanganate with antifreeze and poof. Didi ignored the third detective, glancing up at Phil instead. So what do we know? House belongs to Alan and Joyce Goulding, her former squadmate rattled off. Older couple, currently waiting out the winter chill in Florida. They left behind, however, their youngest son, 28-year-old Devin Goulding, who trains as a bodybuilder by day, works as a bartender by night. This is Devin, Didi asked, gesturing to the body. Uh, gonna have to wait on the fingerprints for that one. Didi grimaced, made the mistake of breathing through her nose, grimaced harder. Where's our victim turned vixen now? Back of the squad car, refused medical attention, waiting on the feds, whom she called directly. The feds? Didi rose to standing, voice curt. What do you mean, she personally invited the feds to our party? Who the hell is this girl? Detective number three did the honors. She called the Boston field office and requested Dr. Samuel Keynes. Dial the number off the top of her head, I might add. Would you still call it a party? The newest member of Boston Homicide asked conversationally. Or is it more like a barbecue? Dee Dee walked away, turned on her heel, left the body, exited the garage. In her new and improved supervisory role, she could get away with such things. Or maybe it was due to her current classification as restricted duty. The fact that Detective Number 3 had taken Dee Dee's former position with her former squad, an assignment Dee Dee could no longer hold, given her recent injury, was no reason to shun the 35-year-old recruit. No, Currently, Dee Dee held the woman's name against her. Carol, as in Carol Manley. Sounded like an insurance agent, or maybe a soccer mom, but definitely not a cop. No kind of serious detective went by Carol. Of course, no kind of serious homicide unit sergeant obsessed about a new detective's name or was petty enough to hold it against her. Maybe. A year ago, Dee Dee hadn't worried about women named Carol, or the future of her three-member squad, or her own role with the BPD's homicide unit. She lived, ate, and breathed death investigations and was a happier person for it. Until the evening she returned for a late-night analysis of a crime scene and startled the killer still lurking there. One brief altercation later, she toppled down a flight of stairs and suffered an avulsion fracture to her left arm. No more lifting her gun no more lifting her small child. For the next six months, Dee Dee had gotten to sit at home, nursing her wounds, worrying about her future, and, yeah, losing her mind. But slowly and surely, as her physical therapist Russ had promised her, the hard work had started to pay off, until one day she could shrug her shoulder, and another day she could slowly but surely raise her arm. Her strength wasn't there yet, nor full range of motion. She couldn't execute such things as, say, the two-handed weaver stance for shooting. But her pain was manageable, her injury improving, and her overall state of health excellent. 
enough to convince the powers that be to allow her to return under restricted duty status, meaning she now spent more time supervising as a sergeant than engaging in hands-on investigating as a detective. She told herself she could handle it. The work was the work, and either way, she was solving crimes. Of course, she continued to engage in thrice-weekly occupational therapy sessions, where she used a hand weight in lieu of her handgun and practiced the motion of unsnapping her holster, then drawing and firing over and over again. She also spent some time on the shooting range, one-handed, not as reliable, not department SOP. But she had to start somewhere. Otherwise, Phil and Neil, two of the finest detectives on the force, would forever be saddled with a rookie. The Goldings Garage was a detached, single-car unit set in the back of the property. Striding forward, Dee Dee vacated the structure, crossed the modest backyard, and headed for the street. Sun was just coming up, a gray, chilly dawn that seemed almost anticlimactic given the current level of activity. Patrol cars were stacked up along both sides of the busy neighborhood street, as well as the ME's vehicle and several larger, more impressive media vans. The first responders had done an admirable job of roping off the property. From the gray-painted two-story colonial to the dilapidated rear garage, the officers had seized it all, establishing a strict perimeter of yellow crime scene tape that would make Dee Dee's job that much easier. Nosy neighbors contained to the sidewalk across the street? Check. Rabid reporters confined to 50 yards away from the closest law enforcement officer? Check. And now for the trifecta. Dee Dee discovered the woman sitting in the back of the third patrol car, shoulders shivering slightly beneath a blue BPD blanket, face staring straight ahead. A district detective sat beside her. The rear car door sat open, as if they were waiting for something or someone. Neither was saying a word. Margaret, Dee Dee acknowledged the officer on the far side of the vehicle. This close, she realized why the vehicle door had been left ajar. Back at the crime scene, investigators had marked a bag of rotting food that had been pulled out of a trash can and torn open. The woman must have been at least elbow deep in that mess, given the scent of rancid meat and sour milk wafting from her skin, let alone the streaks of slime marring her cheeks and mucking her hair. Dee Dee, the district detective replied stoically. Heard you were back. Congrats. Thanks. Dee Dee's gaze remained focused on the woman, the alleged killer, the alleged victim. The girl appeared young, mid to late twenties would be Dee Dee's guess, with shoulder-length blonde hair and delicate features that would probably be found attractive if not for the assortment of bruises, smatters of blood, and smears of rot. The girl didn't look at her, but continued to focus on the back of the driver's seat. Flat affect, Dee Dee noted, an expression most often found in homicide cops or victims of chronic abuse. Standing outside the patrol car, Dee Dee leaned down until her face was even with the woman's. Sergeant Detective Dee Dee Warren, she said by way of introduction. And you are? The girl finally turned her head. She stared at Dee Dee, seemed to study her as if looking for something. Then she resumed her examination of the back of the driver's seat. Dee Dee gave it some thought. Quite the scene in the garage. Chemical fire, I'm told. Basically, you burned a man alive with some kind of preservative mixed with antifreeze. You learned that as a Girl Scout? Nothing. Let me guess. Devin seemed nice enough when you first met. Good-looking guy, hard-working. You decided to give love a chance. Devin? The woman finally spoke, gaze still locked straight ahead. Her voice sounded husky, as if she'd smoked too much or screamed too loud. Victim's name, Devin Goulding. What, you never got around to asking? Cool blue eyes, gray, Didi thought, as the girl glanced over. Didn't know him, the girl said. We never met. And yet here we are. He's a bartender, the girl offered, as if that should mean something to Dee Dee. Then it did. You went out tonight, to the bar where Devin worked. That's how you met. We didn't meet, the girl insisted. I was there with someone else. The bartender, he followed us out. 
She stared at Dee Dee again. He's done this before, she stated matter-of-factly. August. That girl who went missing, Stacy Summers. The way he grabbed me, tucked his head to hide his face from view as he pulled me down the back streets. He matches the man in the abduction video. I would search his property thoroughly. Stacy Summers was a Boston College student who disappeared in August. Young, beautiful, blonde, she had the kind of beaming smile and gorgeous headshots guaranteed to grab nationwide headlines, which the case had. Unfortunately, three months later, the police possessed only a single grainy video image of her being dragged away from a local bar by a large, shadowy brute. That was it. No witnesses, no suspects, no leads. The case had grown cold, even if the media attention had not. Do you know Stacy Summers? Dee Dee asked. The girl shook her head. Friend of the family. Fellow college student. Someone who once met her at a bar? No. Are you a cop? No. FBI? Another shake. So your interest in the Stacy Summers case? I read the news. Of course. Dee Dee tilted her head sideways, contemplated her subject. You know federal agents, she stated. Family friend, neighbor, but you know someone well enough to dial direct. He's not a friend. Then who is he? A faint smile. I don't know. You'll have to ask him. What's your name? Dee Dee straightened up. Her left shoulder was starting to bother her now, not to mention this conversation strain on her patience. He didn't know my name, the girl said. The bartender. This Devin? He didn't care who I was. I arrived at the bar alone. According to him, that's all it took to make me a victim. You were at the bar alone, drank alone. Only the first drink. That's generally how it works. How many drinks did you have? Why, because if I'm drunk, I deserved it? No, because if you're drunk, you're not as reliable a witness. I danced with one guy most of the night. Others saw us. Others can corroborate. Didi frowned still not liking the woman's answers, nor her use of the word corroborate, a term generally favored by law enforcement, not lay people. Dancer's name? Mr. Haven't I seen you around here before? The girl murmured. On the other side of the girl, the district detective rolled her eyes. Apparently, Dee Dee wasn't the first person to be asking these questions or getting these answers. Can he corroborate? Dee Dee stressed the legal term. Assuming he's regained consciousness. Honey, you should search the garage. There's blood in the far left corner. I could smell it when I was digging through the trash, trying to find a weapon. Is that when you discovered the potassium permanganate? He's the one who threw away the bouquet, probably after using it to lure in some other victim. I'm not his first, I can tell you. He was much too confident, too well prepared. If this is his house, check his room. He'll have trophies. Predator like him enjoys the private thrill of revisiting past conquests. Dee Dee stared at the woman. In her years in homicide, she'd interviewed victims who were hysterical. She dealt with victims who were in shock. When it came to crime, there was no such thing as an emotional norm. And yet she'd never met a victim like this one. The woman's responses were well beyond the bell curve, hell, outside the land of sanity. Did you know what Devin... The bartender. The bartender had done to these other women? Maybe a friend of yours told you something, her own scary experience, or rumors of something that it may have happened to a friend of a friend. No. But you suspected something, Dee Dee continued, voice hard. At the very least, you think he was involved with the disappearance of another girl, a case plastered all over the news. So, what, you decided to take matters into your own hands? Turn yourself into some kind of hero and make your own headlines? I'd never met the bartender before tonight. I left with a different loser. He was the one I was trying to set up. The girl shrugged, gaze once more locked on the back of the driver's seat. The evening's been filled with surprises. Even for someone like me, these things can happen. Who are you? That smile again the one that was not a smile, but something far more troubling rippling across the girl's face. 
I didn't know the bartender. I've read about the Stacy Summers case. Who hasn't? But I never thought. Let's just say I didn't plan on some overpumped nightclub employee knocking me unconscious or carting me off as his personal plaything. Once it happened, though, I know survival skills. I know self-defense. I utilized the resources I found on hand. You went through his trash, wouldn't you? The girl stared at her. For once, Dee Dee was the one who looked away. He started the war. The girl stated clearly. I simply ended it. Then called the FBI. I didn't have any choice in that matter. Dee Dee suddenly had an inkling. It wasn't a good feeling. She studied her victim, a mid-twenties female obviously experienced with law enforcement and personal defense. The special agent, is he your father? The girl finally took her seriously. She said, worse. Chapter Four In the beginning, I cried, which, in time, led to a sort of mindless humming, making noise for the sake of making noise, because it's hard to be alone in a dark wooden box. Sensory deprivation. The kind of torture used to break hardened assassins and radicalize terrorists. Because it works. The pain was the worst. The relentless hard surface denting the soft spot on the back of my skull, straining my lower back, bruising my bony heels. I would feel the ache like a fire across my skin until my entire nervous system roared its outrage. But there was nothing I could do, no new position I could adopt, not a twist here or a bend there to relieve the pressure. To be trapped, pinned really, flat on your back on a hard pine plank, minute after minute after minute. I think there were times, especially in the beginning, when I wasn't sane. Humans are interesting, however. Our ability to adapt is truly impressive. Our rage against our own suffering, our relentless need to find a way out, to do something, anything, to advance our lot in life. I made the first improvement in my living conditions by accident. In a fit of fury against the pain in the back of my skull, I lifted my head and smacked my forehead against the wooden lid. Maybe I hoped to knock myself unconscious wouldn't have surprised me. What I received was a sharp sting to my front right temple, which did, at least temporarily, alleviate the ache in the back of my head, which led to more discoveries. Your back throbs? Smack a knee. Your knee hurts? Stub a toe. Your toe hurts? Jam a finger. Pain is a symphony, a song of varying intensities and many, many notes. I learned to play them no longer a helpless victim in a sea of suffering, but a mad orchestral genius directing the music of my own life. Alone, trapped inside a coffin-sized box, I sought out each tiny register of discomfort and mastered it, which led, in turn, to leg lifts and shoulder shrugs and the world's most abbreviated biceps curls. He came. He worked the padlock. He removed the lid. He lifted me out of the depths and reveled in his godlike powers. Afterward, a small offering of liquid, perhaps even a scrap of food, as he tossed the dog the proverbial bone. He'd stay to watch, laughing as I cracked open the dried-up chicken wing and greedily sucked out the marrow. Then, back to the box. He would leave, and I belonged to myself again. Alone in the dark master of my pain. I cried. I railed against God. I begged for someone, anyone, to save me. But only in the beginning. Slowly but surely, dimly, then with greater clarity, I began to think, plot, scheme. One way or another, I was getting out of this. I'd do whatever it took to survive. And then, I was going home. Chapter Five 
Dee Dee discovered Neil in the upstairs rear bedroom of the two-story house. The youngest member of the three-man squad, Neil was famous for his shock of red hair and perpetually youthful face. Most suspects dismissed him as a new recruit, which Dee Dee and Phil had never stopped using to their advantage. These days, Neil carried himself with more poise. In the past couple of years, Diddy and Phil had been pushing him to step up, take the lead. It had resulted in a few battles, given Neil remained most at home overseeing autopsies in the morgue. But Dee Dee liked to think she'd raised him right. Certainly, with her gone, and Phil now serving as lead detective of the squad, Neil had better be lording over Carol, Dee Dee thought. It was the least he could do for her. Neil glanced up as she walked in. He was kneeling on the floor beside a rumpled queen-size bed, holding a shoebox pulled from beneath the mattress. Dee Dee made it three feet into the cramped, dank space and wrinkled her nose. It smelled like unwashed sheets, cheap cologne and gym socks. In other words, like the home of a bachelor male. Devin Goulding's room? she asked. Looks like it. Arrested development, she muttered. Neil arched a brow. Hey, we can't all be Alex, he observed. Alex was Dee Dee's husband, crime scene reconstruction specialist and instructor at the police academy, one of the more refined members of the species, Dee Dee liked to think. He had impeccable taste in clothing, food, and, of course, his wife. He also looked pretty good with mushy Cheerios glued to his cheek, which is how most breakfasts with their four-year-old son ended. Alex actually enjoyed doing laundry. Devin Goulding, on the other hand. Got anything? Dee Dee gestured to the shoebox in Neil's hand. Say, a stash of trophies from previous victims? According to our femme fatale, who apparently had never met Mr. Goulding before this evening, he's definitely done this before and might even be the perpetrator responsible for the Boston College student who went missing in August. Neil blinked. You mean the Stacy Summers case? So I'm told by the woman who torched Devin in his own garage with her hands still tied? The one and only. Who is she again? Interestingly enough, she was more forthcoming on Devin's alleged crimes than her own. But she's convinced he's a serial predator, and we should definitely check for trophies. She looks familiar, Neil said. I can't quite place her. But when I first arrived and spotted her, I thought I knew her from somewhere. Quantico? Dee Dee asked helpfully as Neil had recently attended a training seminar there for detectives, and it would certainly explain the woman's knowledge of criminal behavior. But Neil was shaking his head. I don't think so. And again, you ever hear about this chemical fire thing? She asked him now, Neil having the most extensive science background on her squad, former squad. Yeah, one of those survival tricks for when lost in the wilderness, that sort of thing. Gotta admit, though, if I woke up trapped in a garage with my hands bound, I'm not sure that's the first thing that would pop into my head. It seems to indicate higher-than-average self-defense skills. Here's the thing, though, Neil continued, rising to his feet. It shouldn't have killed Goulding. Incapacitated, maimed, traumatized, sure. But localized burning, relatively low heat. You'd be amazed at how much the human body can endure and keep on ticking. I've seen victims pulled from fiery wrecks with two-thirds of their skin toasted, and still, with enough time and treatment, they make it. Dee Dee shuddered. She didn't like burns. She'd once been sent to interview a survivor in a burn unit who was having the dead skin literally scraped from his back. Based on the guy's screams, she'd assumed he was dying, only to be told the whole treatment was designed to fix him. Not enough morphine in the world, the nurse had offered helpfully, scouring away. Now, it's possible Devin inhaled heat and smoke into his throat, Neil was saying. Maybe seared his esophagus, which swelled up, closing his airway. But what the witness described sounded more instantaneous, which made me think he maybe went into shock and his heart stopped beating. Okay, Dee Dee said. She still didn't know where they were going with this but Neil had worked as an EMT before he became a cop. He often saw things she and Phil didn't. Of course, the deceased is a young, obviously fit male, bodybuilder by the looks of things. You could see that? Dee Dee asked incredulously, recalling the curled-up lump of charred remains. Well, you couldn't? Never mind. 
which leads to further considerations. Bodybuilders have been known to dabble in anabolic steroids, which, in turn, can lead to a whole host of symptoms, including high blood pressure and an enlarged heart. And shrunken testicles, Didi offered up. High blood pressure is news to me. About the shrunken testicles, I'm pretty sure about. Neil rolled his eyes. We'll let the ME measure testicle size. Based on this, however, we're probably both right. He jiggled the shoebox, and Dee Dee could hear the telltale noise of glass vials rattling together. Devin Goulding was definitely shooting up roids. For how long, I couldn't tell you. But even short-term use could have impacted his heart and been a contributing factor in his death. What about roid rage? Dee Dee asked, considering the matter. I always thought that meant flying off the handle. But could it have led him to abduct a girl from a bar? Beyond my pay grade, Neil said with a shrug. Well, in theory, long-term steroid abuse leads to diminished sex drive, which begs the question, why would he want to kidnap a girl from a bar? Giving in to his darker impulses was the only way he could get interested anymore? Violence, his last remaining turn-on? Neil shrugged. Your guess is as good as mine. Based upon this box, I think we can safely assume Devin Goulding used steroids, and it was probably a factor in his death. As for evidence of past crimes, additional victims, only one way to find out. Neil set down the box, took one step toward the narrow dresser that was crammed up against the wall, and started pulling out drawers. Didi let him do it. She was on restricted duty, after all. Neil could ransack the room. She crossed to the bed and inspected the contents of Goulding's shoebox. In addition to various colorfully labeled glass jars, there were numerous baggies of unmarked pills, supplements, hormones, God only knew. Could steroid abuse have led to Golding's crime spree? Their lone survivor had implied she hadn't known him at all, had been at the bar with another man until Golding had knocked out Bachelor A and absconded with the girl. Certainly sounded primitive enough. It also sounded impulsive to Dee Dee. Serial predators were more likely to stalk their victims, plan out the abduction or snatching a girl from outside a bar. Hey, Neil interrupted her thoughts. He'd given up on the drawers and was once more on his hands and knees, feeling beneath the bureau with his gloved hand. Got something? Maybe. It took him several tugs. Then he retrieved a large, plain, yellow manila envelope that had been taped to the bottom of the dresser. He shook it, and Dee Dee saw several small rectangular shapes move against the paper sheath. Neil carried the envelope to the bed. The top flap wasn't glued down, but fastened shut with metal tabs. He flipped them up, then did the honors of opening the envelope and pouring its contents onto the bed. Dee Dee counted two credit card-sized objects, except they weren't credit cards. Driver's licenses, Neil said. Two females, Christy Kelker, Natalie Draga, but not Stacy Summers. No Stacy Summers. Then again, Neil held up one of the licenses to show a single bloody fingerprint. I think our world's most dangerous Girl Scout may have been on to something after all. They tore the rest of the room apart, Dee Dee starting with the bed, Neil continuing onto the dresser. They moved methodically and efficiently, teammates who'd done this kind of thing before. Later, the crime scene techs would return with fingerprint powder, luminol, and alternative light sources. They'd retrieve fingerprints, bodily fluids, and, hopefully, minuscule strands of hair and fiber. For now, Dee Dee and Neil went for the obvious. Women's clothing, jewelry, anything that could tie back to other victims. Pay stubs and bar bills that might indicate other hunting grounds. And, what the hell, a killer's diary. You never knew when you might get lucky. Dee Dee had to have Neil's help to lift the top mattress. Her shoulder already throbbed, her left arm too weak for the job. Neil didn't say anything. He came over. Together they lifted. Then he returned to his corner, and she resumed her search of the bed. She was grateful for her partner's, former partner's, silence. The fact that he didn't comment on the sheen of sweat already collecting on her brow, her clear shortness of breath. Supervisors were hardly expected to work crime scenes, Dee Dee reminded herself. Request paperwork on the subject, review all notes, sure. But this actual work thing? No, 
she was supposed to be safely ensconced back at HQ, where her lack of ability to carry a sidearm wouldn't be a liability to herself and others. Didi searched every square inch under the top mattress, then went to work on the box spring. Later, she would have to ice down while enduring Alex's knowing stare. But she was who she was. He knew it. Neil knew it. It was simply the Boston Police Department she was determined to fool. Got something. She could feel it now. A hard lump near the top right corner of the box spring. Up close, she could see that the seam where the heavy-duty material from the sides of the box spring met with the flimsy top cover was frayed. She poked around with her gloved fingertips and, sure enough, wedged between a nest of coils. A box, hang on, slippery damn thing, and... Got it. Gingerly, Dee Dee withdrew the metal box. Her entire left arm was trembling with fatigue. More weights, she thought vaguely. More weights, more PT, more anything in order not to feel this weak, in order not to be this weak in public. But once again, Neil didn't comment. He simply took the small lockbox from her shaking hands and moved it to the corner desk, where they had more light. The box appeared fairly standard issue, gunmetal gray, maybe six inches wide by two inches tall, meant for a few precious or personal mementos, little else. Photos, Neil said. What? Diddy leaned closer, trying to make out the stack of pictures beneath the desk light. A black-haired woman. Again and again, Neil flipped through the stack. Each photo revealed the same subject, walking in a park, sitting with a cup of coffee, reading a book, laughing at someone off camera. The woman appeared to be in her early thirties and beautiful in a dark, sultry sort of way. Former girlfriend, maybe? Stashed in a container inside his box spring? Dee Dee was already shaking her head. I don't think so. Look like anyone you know? Stacy Summers? No, wait, she's a petite blonde. Or is this girl? Not Stacy Summers, Neil agreed. What about a Vic downstairs? Last I saw, she was covered in garbage. I don't remember hair color. Also blonde, with light gray eyes. No, not this woman either. Dee Dee. Neil spoke up quietly. He reached the last few photos. Both of them stilled. Same woman. Except she wasn't smiling or laughing anymore. Her dark eyes were huge, her pale face stricken. She stared straight into the camera, and her expression... Now it was Neil's hand that shook slightly, and Dee Dee, who didn't say a word. Neil set down the photos, then returned with the two licenses they'd found beneath the bureau. Natalie Draga, he said. He placed the ID next to the photo as both of them looked from photos to official ID, then slowly nodded. 31, address in Chelsea. But no pictures of the second victim? No, just Natalie. Personal connection. Dee Dee murmured. She meant something to him. Hence, all the images. Worshipped her from afar, Neil supposed. Or even a girlfriend. Except it ended badly. Maybe she rejected him, and then he turned on her. And the second victim, Christy? Plus the woman downstairs? Neil asked. They'd gone through the box. There were no more photos. Maybe he liked it, Dee Dee theorized out loud. The first time was personal. The second and third were for fun. There's no way of telling when these pictures were taken, Neil said. The framing is too close up. There's not enough backdrop. Our survivor claims there's blood in the garage. I could smell something, Neil concurred. Have the crime scene techs gather samples and send more uniforms to the bar where Devin Goulding worked with photos of all three known victims. Let's see just how close to home he was hunting. Grab a photo of Stacy Summers as well. See if she frequented that bar. If she was last seen at a different establishment, Birch's, over on Lex. I know. But if she spent time in Goulding's bar as well, how many psychopaths can one poor girl run into? Dee Dee straightened, wincing as the motion jarred her shoulder, the growing ache in her back. You should go home, Neil said. It's our job to handle all this. Your job to tell us how we could have done it better. But Dee Dee wasn't listening to him. She was thinking of the garage of Devin Goulding, of his latest victim, who'd beaten him at his own game and was now sitting in the back of a squad car. 
a blonde with FBI connections and knowledge of how to start a chemical fire, a woman Neil had thought he'd recognized. She should know this, she thought, could feel something stirring in the back of her mind. A knock came from behind her. Newbie detective Carol Manley stuck her head in the room. Dee Dee, the agent our Vic called at the FBI. He's here. Chapter 6 Once upon a time, I could have told you all about myself. I would have said with certainty that my name is Florence Dane. My mom, who dreamed big for her children, named me after Florence Nightingale and my older brother in honor of Charles Darwin. I would have said that the happiest place on earth was my mother's farm in central Maine. Mounds of blueberries in the summer, acres and acres of potatoes in the fall. I grew up loving the smell of freshly turned earth, the feel of soil beneath my fingertips. My mother's contented sigh at the end of the day, when she gazed over all that she had accomplished and felt satisfied. Our neighbors included several foxes, as well as bears and moose. My mother didn't mind our local wanderers, but was a firm believer in not feeding the wildlife. We were to coexist with nature, not corrupt it. My mother had grown up in a commune. She had many theories about life, not all of which made sense to my brother and me. Personally, I loved the foxes best. I would sit for hours outside their den, hoping for a view of the kits. Foxes are playful, like a kitten crossed with a puppy. They enjoy batting around golf balls or tossing small toys in the air. I learned this the way kids used to learn things, by hanging outside with the sun on my face, by trying a little bit of this or a little bit of that. I brought them an old rubber ball, a catnip stuffed mouse, even a small rubber ducky. The adult foxes would sniff at the offerings hesitantly, while the kits would come bounding out of the den and pounce on the new toys without a moment's hesitation. Sometimes I left a carrot or two behind, or, if my mother was particularly busy and not paying attention, scraps of a hot dog. Just being neighborly, I tried to explain to my mother the first afternoon she caught me shredding cheese outside the den's opening. She didn't buy it. Every creature must learn to make it on its own. Encouraging dependence doesn't do anyone any favors, Flora. But later, after a particularly bad snowstorm in early November, I caught her carrying scraps from dinner to the same den. She didn't say anything, and neither did I. It became our shared secret, because back then, we couldn't think of anything more scandalous than domesticating wild foxes. So once upon a time, here is something I could have told you about myself. I love foxes, or at least I used to. That's not the kind of thing that's easy to take from someone. But I don't sit around and watch them anymore, or bring them toys, or smuggle them treats. 472 days later, I try to find peace in the woods. I definitely prefer the wide open outdoors to small indoor spaces. But some pieces of myself, some feelings, it's just not like that anymore. I can do the things I used to do, visit the same places, see the same people, but I don't feel the same anymore. Some days, I'm not sure I feel anything at all. April is my favorite month. I'm fairly sure that's still true. The farm came with a rickety old greenhouse. How it survived each long, blustery winter, we never knew. But by late April, as the snow finally thawed, we'd trudge through the mud and force open the warped door, the whole structure groaning in protest. Darwin would lead the charge inside, the lone male and self-appointed family protector. My mother would come next with a wheelbarrow full of bags of loam and topsoil. I'd bring up the rear, carting plastic trays and, of course, packets of seed. My brother Darwin went for speed, tossing in handfuls of soil, jabbing in seeds. Even back then, he was impatient, wanting to be anywhere but there. My mother had named him well. He loved us, but from an early age, we could both tell staying home wasn't his cup of tea. 
If the deep woods sang to us, then the entire world sang to him. So he worked beside us, fast, efficient, but his mind always elsewhere. My mother would watch him and sigh. He's a young soul, she would say, with a tender heart. She worried for him, but never for me. I was the happy one. At least, that's how the story goes. My brother returned from college the minute he heard about my disappearance. He stayed at my mother's side, first as her anchor. Then, when the first postcard arrived, and it became clear I'd been kidnapped, my brother the adventurer became a warrior. Facebook, Twitter, these were the battlegrounds of choice. He created entire campaigns designed to rally complete strangers to help find me. And he brought me to life, personalized his little sister for the masses, photos of my first birthday, me on the farm, and, yes, me sitting on a knoll with fox kids. Except these photos weren't really for the masses. They were for my abductor, to make him see me as a little girl, a sister, a daughter, my brother made it his mission to humanize me in order to help save my life. I think that's why he took it the hardest when I returned home and I was no longer the young woman from all those photos. I didn't smile. I didn't laugh. I didn't play in the dirt or go looking for foxes. See, my kidnapper had a mission of his own, to remove all shred of humanity from me, to hollow me out break me down, to turn me into nothing at all. You think you'll fight, or at least endure. You promise yourself you'll be strong enough. But 472 days later. My brother had to leave the farm after my return. He had to get away from the sister I no longer was. I watched him go and was mostly grateful for his departure one fewer set of eyes to follow me everywhere I went, one less person to be startled by the new and definitely not improved Flora Dane. Once upon a time, I would have been saddened by my brother's departure. I would have told you I love him, miss him, look forward to seeing him soon. Once upon a time, I would have told you that I love my mom, She's my best friend in the entire world. And while it was exciting to go off to college, I still look forward to the weekends home. Once upon a time, I was that kind of girl. Outdoorsy, fun-loving, happy. Now, there are things I still can't tell you about myself. There are things I'm still having to learn as I go along. The sun is up now. Sitting in the back of the patrol car, blanket tight around my shoulders, garbage drying on my face, I feel the sky lightening around me. I don't look up. I don't look around. I don't have to see to know what's going on. To my left, inside the house of my would-be attacker, the crime scene techs are now scouring every inch. A handful of detectives are also going through the structure room by room, cataloging each electronic device, glancing at piles of mail, combing carefully through the bartender's bedroom. I hadn't been lying earlier. I'm not a cop or an FBI agent. I've never met the girl who disappeared three months ago, Stacy Summers. Like the rest of Boston, or the country for that matter, I've simply followed her case on the news. But then again, I know her. I recognize her beaming smile from her senior pictures, all big blonde hair and round blue eyes. I recognize her exuberance in all the high school cheerleader photos, red pom-poms thrust into the air. Then there's the ominous videotape, security footage of a petite blonde being forcefully abducted by a hulking brute. Morning, noon, and night. There was never a bad time for news producers to roll the sensational image of a tipsy 19-year-old former cheerleader being dragged down a dark alley. I read every account in the newspaper of her abduction, sat mesmerized by her parents' appearance on a nationally televised morning show, though in theory, I've sworn off that kind of thing. I watched her father, the strong corporate type, struggle with his composure, while her mom, an older, still beautiful woman, 
hand tucked firmly in her husband's, begged for her daughter's safe return. Beautiful, happy, bubbly Stacy Summers, who, according to her parents, would never hurt a fly. I wonder what things she didn't used to know. I wonder what lessons she's already been forced to learn. The truth is, I know Stacy Summers. I don't want to. I don't mean to. But I know Stacy Summers. It doesn't take a PhD in psychology to understand that every time I look at her photo or read another article, I'm really looking at me. No one called my mother the first 24 hours after I went missing. No one knew I was gone. Instead, she received a confused message four days into spring break from my college roommate. Is Flora with you? Why didn't she tell us she was heading home early? Of course, my mother had no idea what Stella was talking about. Apparently, it took a good 20 minutes to sort out that I wasn't in Florida with Stella, nor was I magically back in Maine at my mother's farm, nor had I miraculously returned to my college dorm room. In fact, no one had seen me in days. My mother is not the type to panic. She set down the phone and proceeded to cover the basics, contacted my older brother, checked her email, skimmed my Facebook page. Her heartbeat accelerated slightly. Her hands began to shake. She drove to the police station. Later, she told me she felt it was important to talk to someone in person. But even reporting her concerns became confusing. My mother lives in Maine, but I went to school in Boston and, in theory, had disappeared while on spring break in Florida. The Maine officer was nice enough. He heard my mother out, seemed to agree that I wasn't the kind of girl to run away, though, given the circumstances, they couldn't dismiss a drunken misadventure. He encouraged her to get the ball rolling by filing an official missing persons report, which was faxed down to the local PD in Florida. And then, nothing. The sun rose, the sun set. My college friends met with the police in Florida. They returned to campus in Boston. They resumed taking classes while my mother sat next to a phone that still didn't ring. And then, a single postcard delivered by mail. My handwriting, but another person's words. And suddenly, I wasn't a missing college student anymore. I was a suspected kidnapping victim who'd been dragged across state lines. Overnight, my case became red-hot news, and my family's world exploded with it. As a parent, my mother told me later, you'd like to think you'd have some control over your missing child's abduction case. But it doesn't work like that. The first thing law enforcement established was that she wasn't to call them. They would call her. In fact, my mother never even met many of the FBI agents working my case until the first press conference. Instead, she got to meet her new best friends, the victim advocates which, given their title, you might make the mistake of thinking meant they worked on behalf of her, the victim. No. Victim advocates work for law enforcement or the attorney general's office. It depends on the jurisdiction. My mother dealt with six of them over the course of my abduction. Local, state, federal. They took turns. Because those first few weeks especially, family members are never left alone. The advocates told her it was for her own sake. And when they first started answering her endlessly chiming cell phone, she thanked them. When they put up a sign in front of our yard warning the media it was private property and they were not to trespass, she was grateful. And as they miraculously supplied yet another meal while deftly shepherding her to a prepaid hotel room so she could snag at least one night's sleep, she wondered how she could survive this ordeal without them. My mother, however, is not stupid. It didn't take her long to realize that the victim advocates were always asking questions about her children's lives, past love interests, about her life, past love interests. And hey, now that she'd had something to eat, why didn't she chat with the detectives for a bit? Which, in the beginning, she thought was so that the detectives could update her on what they were doing to help find me, but later she understood was so the detectives could grill her with even more questions. 
and, oh yes, this morning her kind and compassionate victim advocate would take her around the house to collect possible pieces of information, cell phones, tablets, personal diaries. While the next morning, her victim advocate would chime out, hey, let's go take a poly, much in the same tone her friends once used to invite her for a mani-pedi. I disappeared in Florida and my mother's life became a high-profile investigative drama governed at all times by the nannies. Both of us, I guess, got lessons in survival, and both of us still know things that we wished we didn't know. For example, I know a victim advocate will appear on Stacy Summers' doorstep this morning, most likely someone close to her case. Maybe, like me, her parents actually value their advocate, having forged a bond. Or maybe, like my mother, they merely tolerate their relationship. One more intrusion in lives that certainly can't be their lives anymore. The advocate will bear a photo of Devin Goulding, my now-dead attacker and almost certainly a repeat offender. The advocate will ask if they recognize this man. Is there any chance Stacy once knew him? The Summerses will immediately be bold enough, crazy enough, to have questions of their own. Is this the man? Is this the guy who took their daughter? What happened to Stacy? Where is she? When can they see her? The advocate will say nothing. And eventually, the Summerses will succumb to bewildered silence, every crumb of information merely leading to more questions. They won't be able to ask Devin Golding any questions. That fault is mine. But closure, the actual discovery of their daughter. I glance back at the house, I hope these detectives can find the answers I didn't get a chance to hunt for, such as whose blood is in the corner of the garage, and is Devin the one who took beautiful, happy Stacy Summers, and what did he do with her after that? Because I know I've watched Stacy's abduction video more than I should. I know I sleep in a room wallpapered with stories of missing people who still haven't made it home. I know when I headed out last night, I was looking for things I probably shouldn't have been. Once, I could have told you all about myself. Foxes. Springtime. Family. Now, I hope Stacy Summers is stronger than me. I would like to sleep, lay down my head in the back of the patrol car and dream of the days before I ever thought of college or the lure of spring break, the promise of a sunny Florida beach. Back in the days before I was always and forever alone. A fresh clamor arises from across the street. I feel the shift and stir of the crowd accommodating a new and official arrival at the crime scene. I don't have to look up to know who it is. I called, and so he came, because that's how it is between us. My mother had her nannies, but for me, the relationship has always been something more. A minute passes, two, three. Then he is here, standing outside the open car door, perfectly attired as usual, with his long double-breasted coat buttoned up tight against the chill. Oh, Flora. FBI victim specialist Samuel Keynes sighs heavily. What have you done? Chapter 7 By the time Dee Dee made it down the stairs and out of the Golding residence, her cell phone had run three times, and she'd been stopped twice. She had good news, she had bad news, and she had a growing headache from a fast-evolving case and a long, sleepless night. According to the deputy superintendent of homicide, a.k.a. her boss, she was under strict orders to wrap up the scene and get the hell out of Dodge before her exhausted detectives inevitably let something slip in front of the clamoring media and this whole thing blew up in their faces. Dee Dee didn't disagree. Short and sweet was never a bad plan when dealing with a homicide investigation. Unfortunately, she had a feeling they weren't going to get that lucky. Didi finally cleared the front step. A roar went up from the reporters gathered across the way. You would have thought the champion quarterback was taking the field, she thought dryly, and not just an overworked police sergeant emerging into public view. 
Reflexively, she held up a hand. No need to block a gauntlet of flashes this bright and sunny November morning. She just didn't want to encourage any more shouted questions. She headed right to where she'd last seen their victim-turned-avenger sitting tight in the rear of the patrol car. And sure enough, Dee Dee drew up short. A tall, handsome black man stood beside the cruiser. No, a tall, beautiful black man. Perfectly sculpted cheekbones. Smoothly shaved head punctuated by an impeccably groomed goatee. Dark eyes fringed by impossibly long lashes. The man wore a double-breasted black wool coat, the kind favored by business executives and FBI agents. Except, up close, Diddy wasn't sure it was wool, maybe more like cashmere, paired with a deep red silk scarf, which, in the moment, made total sense to her. A man that handsome, with a face that intelligent and a gaze that direct, of course he wore a thousand-dollar coat, and his non-bureau-issued car was probably a Bentley. Belatedly, she realized she was staring, her mouth slightly agape. She snapped her jaw shut, squared her aching shoulders, and, what the hell, pretended like she was a professional. He held out a hand as she approached. Dr. Samuel Keynes, victim specialist, FBI. Mm-hmm. She returned the handshake. He had a firm grip, naturally. And you are? He awaited her reply patiently. Deep, deep, dark eyes, like melted chocolate, and clearly regarding her as if she were a lunatic. Sergeant Detective Dee Dee Warren, she managed. Supervisor. Homicide. This homicide. Wait a second. She frowned, regaining her composure. Victim specialist. Haven't we met before? Boston Marathon bombings. I assisted with several of the families, yes. Dee Dee nodded. It was coming back to her now. The Boston PD had assisted with the FBI's investigation into the April 2013 Boston Marathon bombings. Dee Dee had personally handled several interviews, given the number of witnesses they'd been to question. In the task force briefings, she'd spotted Dr. Keynes, as well as several other victim specialists, though at the time there'd been too much going on to make any introductions. They'd all been too busy grappling with the horror of the bombings, let alone an extremely complex, active case. You know our person of interest? She asked now, gesturing to her victim suspect, who still sat silently in the back of the patrol car. Flora? He prodded quietly. The girl finally glanced up. The bruise had started darkening around her eye, turning her skin dark purple, while the bridge of her nose was an angry red. The adrenaline rush had left her system, Dee Dee observed, and now she was crashing hard. You might as well tell her, the woman said, sitting in the back of the patrol car, wrapped in the blue police blanket. She shrugged, still not making eye contact. Coming from you, she might believe. Whereas anything I have to say can be used against you in a court of law, Dee Dee offered helpfully. The girl skewered her with a look. Exactly. Sergeant Detective Warren, Dr. Keynes began. Dee Dee, Dee Dee, might we take a walk somewhere quieter? He didn't have to specify the reporters. Already the noise had quieted down, all the better for the media to eavesdrop. Dee Dee gave it a moment's consideration, then jerked her head toward the Golding residence. It was bustling with crime scene texts, but no journalists, which was as close to privacy as they were going to get. She led the way, Dr. Keynes falling in step beside her. Nice coat, she said. Cashmere? Yes. Silk scarf? Yes. I gotta say, Boston PD isn't quite that generous. Then again, I don't have doctor in front of my name. My grandfather shines shoes for a living, Dr. Keynes offered lightly. My father, on the other hand, is a cardiothoracic surgeon, graduated Harvard. And you're continuing your family's upward mobility... In the FBI? Dee Dee gave him a dubious look. They'd reached the front door. Dr. Keynes held it open, a touch of chivalry that was hardly necessary at a crime scene. I enjoy my work, and I'm fortunate to be at a place in my life where I can afford to do what I love. I'm beginning to see what you and my person of interest have in common. Both of you do an excellent job of never actually answering my questions. The front door of the Golding House opened to a modest foyer, 
with the staircase straight ahead. Given that the room's wooden trim and staircase railing were currently being dusted for prints by a pair of crime scene techs, Dee Dee took a left turn away from the chaos. She and the good doctor arrived in a front sitting room that boasted a love seat, a coffee table piled with craft magazines, and a basket filled with balls of yarn. Someone, most likely Mrs. Goulding, must be into knitting. There was something about that small detail that pained Dee Dee. How did you go from being a woman known for your hand-knit scarves to being the mother of an alleged rapist? Dee Dee came to a halt in front of the coffee table. It felt too intrusive to sit, so she remained standing, Dr. Kane's doing the same. The small room was much warmer than outside, the air stuffy. Dr. Keynes unbuttoned his coat, loosened his scarf. Underneath, he wore a dark suit. Standard government issue, she thought, except once again, the cut and fabric were much nicer than anything worn by the average agent. Dr. Keynes, she began, then paused a beat to see if he'd offer his first name. He didn't. I haven't worked with too many victim advocates. Dee Dee continued at last. But my memory is that, in the FBI, you're not the same as an agent. Your role is... I'm a victim specialist. I report to the OVA, Office for Victim Assistance. And you're a doctor, psychologist. Specialty? Trauma. I work mostly with victims of kidnapping cases, everything from child abduction to the oil executive kidnapped for ransom in Nigeria. Dee Dee studied him. I don't think Flora is an oil executive. Florence Dane, he supplied, then gazed at her expectantly. The name rang a bell. Judging from the look on his face, it should. Plus, Neil's comment from earlier, that he knew the woman's face from somewhere. Dee Dee finally got it. Seven years ago, she was a college student, UMass. Went on spring break to Palm Beach and disappeared. The FBI handled the investigation. She had to think. Because of postcards, right? And the mom started receiving postcards, allegedly written by her daughter, but all from different states. The mom went on TV, held several press conferences, trying to get the kidnapper to engage. There were more than postcards. He sent emails, even a few videos. Reaching out to the mother, tormenting her, appeared to be as gratifying to him as the abduction itself. Dee Dee frowned. Florence Dane was gone a long time. 472 days. Jesus. Despite herself, Dee Dee blinked. Very few victims were found alive after that length of time, and the ones who did. Long haul trucker? She asked now. The perpetrator traveled for his job, trucking, something like that? Yes. Jacob Ness. He'd built a box in the back of his cab so he could keep his victim with him at all times. Most likely. Flora wasn't his first. He's dead. That's my memory. You guys got some kind of tip. SWAT descended. Florence made it. Jacob Ness didn't. Dr. Keynes didn't say anything. Very Phoebe of him, Dee Dee thought. She hadn't asked, so he hadn't answered. All right, she stated more briskly. My suspect, Flora, is your victim, Florence. Once, she was abducted by a crazed psychopath, and now... What, she tracks him down at bars? Only Flora can answer that question. And yet she didn't. So far, all I can get out of her are theories on Devin Goulding's crimes, not her own. That's the bartender? The one who allegedly attacked her? That's the victim, Dee Dee corrected. The once healthy male, now reduced to crispy carnage in his own garage, due to your girl's knowledge of chemical fire. Dr. Kane studied her, posture relaxed hands in the pockets of his ridiculously expensive coat. I'm sure you've made some inquiries. A couple of detectives reviewed the bar's security footage. They were able to corroborate that Devin Goulding worked last night. According to the video footage, as well as eyewitness accounts, Flora was also present, though she spent most of the night dancing with another guy, Mark Zalen. Interestingly enough, Mr. Zalen filed a police report shortly after 3 a.m., alleging that a bartender from Tonic physically assaulted him outside the establishment. Also consistent with Flora's statement, Dr. Keynes observed, a video camera from an ATM machine a block away captures what appears to be Devin leading Flora away by the arm. As for how willing she is, I'm told that could go either way. 
fast forward to the scene here. By all means, fast forward to the Golding's garage. First responders discovered Flora naked, with her hands bound before her. You seem to be well informed about the details. He dismissed that comment, saying instead, bound wrists don't seem to indicate willingness. Sorry, given that it's a Fifty Shades of Grey world, I can't make that assumption. Tell me something, Dr. Keynes. Are you Flora's victim specialist or are you her shrink? I am a victim specialist, Dr. Kane stated clearly, not a shrink. But she called you, not her mother, not a lawyer. She called you. Why? You would have to ask Flora that question. You have a relationship, Didi asserted. No. Uh, yeah. In the midst of a crisis, she called you. And I'm willing to bet this isn't the first time. Dr. Keynes thinned his lips. Such a handsome man, Didi thought again. Beautiful, rich, successful. The crosses he had to bear. And yet there was something about him. A seriousness. A sadness? She couldn't put her finger on it. But there was a somber edge to his composure that just kept her from hating him. You should ask Flora more questions, he said at last. She prefers honesty a straightforward approach. I think you'll find... She feels alone, Sergeant. Her experiences, what she's been through. She's a very unique, very strong young woman. But she's also very isolated. There are few people who survived what she survived. Meaning, in a time of crisis, Dee Dee murmured, she turns to the one person she thinks understands her, which is not her family, it's you. You should ask her more questions, he repeated. And don't dismiss her answers. Since her return five years ago, Flora has made criminal behavior her specialty. Oh, you don't say. If she believes this bartender took other girls, I wouldn't be surprised to discover it's true. Are you working with Stacy Summers' family? Didi asked abruptly. Kane shook his head. If he was surprised by this sudden change in topic, he didn't show it. A colleague of mine, Pam Mason, has been assigned that case. Flora ever talked to you about Stacy's disappearance, follow it in the news? Contrary to what you seem to believe, Flora and I don't speak regularly. Only when she's in police custody, Didi prodded. Judging by her bruises, she appears to be telling the truth about being kidnapped by Devin Goulding, Dr. Kane stated neutrally, meaning whatever steps she took to defend herself. Why won't she accept medical assistance? If she's so innocent... Why not let a medical expert conduct an official exam, corroborate more of her story? Victims of rape and other violent crimes often have an aversion to physical contact. Really? Which explains why Flora Dane showed up at a bar, tossed back several martinis, and hit the dance floor with a complete stranger? I'm not the enemy here, Sergeant Chekhov warned. I'm merely endeavoring to offer some insights which might lead to a speedier resolution of the situation. The situation being where your victim put herself in harm's way in order to do what? Trap a predator? Save the day? Exact vengeance for what once happened to her? Dr. Keynes didn't say anything. Abruptly, Diddy lost her patience. You want speedy resolution? Do us both a favor and cut to the chase. How many times has Flora done this before? How many middle-of-the-night phone calls have you gotten to answer? Might as well tell me, because you know I can look it up. Four. Four? Despite herself, Didi was incredulous. Flora Dane has killed four times before? What the hell? Not killed, Dr. Keynes interjected, voice firm. This level of self-defense is a first. What, she merely scorched the other ones? Seared them with a lighter versus full-on chemical fire? Flora has been assaulted prior to this occasion. If you read the reports, you'll discover that she responded with the appropriate level of force and didn't face any charges. She's a vigilante. Your girl, your victim, Flora Dane, is a survivor. Flora Dane is a nut. She's going to these bars looking for trouble, and she's finding it. Dr. Keynes didn't speak right away. Smart of him, Dee Dee thought, because really, at this point, what was left to say? I'm going to pursue this, she stated clearly. The room was small. Her voice carried, and she let it. Maybe case by case you can dismiss Flora's behavior, but the overall pattern... With all due respect, Dr. Keynes, Flora Dane's behavior is a threat to herself and others. 
let me be equally clear, Sergeant Detective warned. According to Flora, she didn't know the bartender, Devin Goulding, prior to this evening. She did not set out to meet him, nor did she engage in any activity that warranted him abducting her from outside a bar and tying her up naked in his garage. As for what happened after that, be very careful about blaming the victim. Flora doesn't call me to bail her out. She's never needed to be bailed out. What she does need is a ride home. Dee Dee stared at him. Seriously, she called you, an FBI agent, a victim specialist, to give her a ride home. There's more to it than that. You mean, such as, as long as you're here, you can run interference with the police? No, such as, as long as I'm taking her home, I can run interference with her mother. Chapter 8 I dreamed of French fries. Hot, golden greasiness. Salt-encrusted decadence. Licking them, smashing them, stuffing them in my mouth. I wanted dozens, bagfuls, boxes full. Dipped in ketchup, smothered in mayonnaise, coated in ranch dressing. And a burger dripping cheese on a pillow-soft white bun and piled high with fresh-sliced tomatoes, onions, and pickles. I take greedy, gulping bites, sinking my teeth, feeling the fat and carbs explode against my tongue. I dreamed of food as my stomach growled and my muscles clenched and I whimpered in physical pain. Then I woke up, and I could smell it here in the room, full fast food glory, cheeseburgers, french fries, chicken McNuggets. I could hear it, too, the rustle of food wrappings, the pop of a straw being thrust through a plastic lid. I think I whimpered again. There's no pride in starvation, only desperation. Footsteps coming closer. For once, I prayed for him to step faster, advance more quickly, insert the key in the padlock, twist it open. Please, pretty please. Whatever he wanted me to do, whatever he needed. French fries, the smell of French fries. When he lifted the lid, I had to blink against the flood of light, from narrow beams through finger-sized holes to a wash of bright white. My eyes welled, maybe in response to the sudden onslaught of visual stimulation, but mostly due to the smell, the wonderful, intoxicating smell. Memories, hazy, humanizing, running through sprinklers on short, chubby legs, laughing with little kid glee as I tried to catch droplets of spray on my tongue. Then a voice, distant but familiar. Tired, love? Let's go get a milkshake. Fast forward a couple of years. Fresh memory. Hands age-spotted, shaking unsteadily as they set down the brown plastic tray. Ketchup? Nah. Best thing on fries is mayo. Now, looky here. For a moment, I am four, or six, or eight, or ten. I'm a child, a girl, a woman. I am me, with a past and a present, with family and friends, with people who love me. Then he spoke, and I disappeared again. There was only the food, and I'd do anything for it. He had to help me out of the box. I did my best to exercise as much as I could in the narrow space, but time had grown long, and I didn't always remember what I should do or if I'd already done it. I slept a lot, slept and slept and slept. Then I didn't have to hurt as much anymore. When I finally rose to standing, my legs shook uncontrollably. I hunched reflexively, as if expecting a blow, but I couldn't blame my rounded posture on the box. I was always lying tall and straight in the box. Are you hungry? He asked me. I didn't answer. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to. Besides, my stomach growled loudly enough for words. He laughed. He was in a good mood, cheerful even. I found myself standing up straighter. He was cleaner tonight, I noticed. Hair damp, as if recently showered. And he was steady on his feet, gaze clear, which wasn't always the case. I found myself looking past him to the battered gray card table. Food, bags and bags, 
McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Burger King, Subway Sandwiches, a fast food banquet. He's binging, I realized. Food, not drugs this time. But why? And what about me? Are you hungry? He asked again. I still didn't know what to say. I whimpered instead. He laughed magnanimously. This room was his kingdom. I got that. Here I was his property, and he got to revel in his power. Beyond these walls, no doubt he was a loser, capital L. Men disrespected him, women laughed at him. Hence, his need for this room, this box, this helpless victim. And now, this exercise in terror. I moved tentatively. I'd learned by now that his permission was all important, and everything he gave he could also take away, so I had to proceed with caution. When he didn't object, didn't reach out a hand to stop me, I closed the gap with the food-covered table. Then I stood, head ducked, hands clasped meekly before me. I waited, though it was the most painful waiting I'd ever done, each muscle trembling, my stomach clenched unbearably tight. What do you want? he asked. I frowned, his question confusing me. I didn't know what I wanted. I'd been trained these past few weeks to be no one, to want nothing. That was my job. Now I was scared, because the smell was intoxicating, overwhelming. I could feel my self-control slipping, and I couldn't afford to mess up. Worse than starving would be to stand surrounded by food and still go hungry. You should eat, he stated at last. He jabbed my bony arm, pinched a protruding rib. Getting too thin. You look like crap, you know. He picked up the bag closest to him, opened it up, waved it under my nose. McDonald's french fries, hot and golden and salty. I could hear my grandfather again. Looky, kid, best thing on fries is mayo. I wondered if he was here to finally take me away except I didn't want to go away with my grandpa anymore. I wanted to be right here in this crappy room with this terrible man and these wonderful greasy fries. Please, please, please let me eat just one single fry. I'd do anything, be anyone. The man was unrolling the top of the bag. Now he reached in. Now he lifted out a red container marked with a single golden M. Fries jostled loose from the open top. They dropped to the floor, the grimy shag carpet. I watched them land, fingers clasping and unclasping, my whole body tense. He was going to eat them. He was going to stand in front of me and eat each perfect salty morsel, laughing, gloating, gleeful. And I'd have no choice but to kill him. I would lose control. I'd attack, and he would... He would... He handed me the container. Here, seriously, for fuck's sake, put some meat in your bones. I grabbed the fries, both hands snatching up the red box. It wasn't hot anymore. The fries were lukewarm, grease starting to congeal. I didn't care. I tossed half the contents into my mouth, swallowing faster than I could chew. Food, 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 needed food, had to have food. God, oh God, oh God. He started laughing. I didn't look at him, kept my attention focused on the bag. I needed to eat. I had to eat. My stomach, my body, every cell screamed for sustenance. My mouth was too dry, the smooshed fries too thick. I tried to swallow, but only managed to gag until my eyes watered. I was going to be sick, I thought, except I couldn't be sick. I couldn't afford to waste that many calories. I tried to force the food down, a giant glob of congealed potatoes, my eyes watered, my throat constricting painfully. My stomach heaved in protest. He placed his hand on my arm. I stared at him, stricken. This was it. He was going to take the macerated fries right out of my mouth, reach in a finger and scoop out the only food I'd had in days. And that would be that. He'd return me to the coffin-sized box and I would die there. Slow down, he ordered. Get some water. Take some time, otherwise you'll barf. He handed me a bottle of water. I took tiny sips, bit by bit, breaking up the glob of food, swallowing it down. When I finally reached for the next handful of fries, he took the box from me. This time, 
He separated out each fry on top of the grimy card table. One by one, I picked them up. One by one, under his watchful eye, I chewed, swallowed, chewed again. When the fries were gone, he opened up the fried chicken and handed me a drumstick. We ate together, me kneeling on the floor, him sitting in a chair. But we sat together, eating our way through bag after bag of food. I became full faster than I wanted. I threw up, my stomach protesting the very food it couldn't wait to have. He didn't yell, just ordered me to wash my face, then handed me a soda. He fell asleep on the sofa while I was still resiliently picking my way through a turkey sandwich. When I couldn't take it anymore, when no amount of vomiting eased the pain of my overstretched stomach, I curled up on the floor next to his feet and dozed off myself. When I woke up later, he was looking down at me. Girl, he said, you smell like fast food and piss. After another moment, he folded his arms, closed his eyes. Tomorrow, he grunted. Tomorrow, it's time for you to shower. And I was completely, utterly grateful to him. Chapter 9 the blonde detective doesn't want to let me go. She threatens to get a warrant to compel me to submit to a physical exam. Why not, if I'm telling the truth? A medical exam would only further corroborate my version of being attacked by Devin Goulding. I think she's a little hung up on the word corroborate. No one is touching me. Not a doctor, not a nurse, not a vet. When I make it that clear to her, that absolute... She seems to finally take the hint. She studies me long and hard, then agrees to my compromise. Photos of the bruises on my face. I understand what the detective wants. I understand what they all want. In this day and age, it's not enough to claim to be assaulted. A victim must prove it. For example, the size of this bruise on my face matches the approximate size of my attacker's fist. Or the one-inch laceration on my upper left cheekbone corresponds to the sharp edge on the perpetrator's oversized class ring. As for other areas of inspection, I'm very clear. There's no need for a rape exam. Devin Golding can blame the contents of his own garbage for helping me avoid that displeasure. And I feared for my life. Waking up bruised, battered, stripped naked, wrists bound. I feared for my life. I feared for my life. I feared for my life. Would you like my official statement? I feared for my life. Dr. Keynes and I don't talk as he leads me to his car. Frankly, it's all just been said. When I regained consciousness five years ago, Samuel was the first person I saw. He was asleep in the chair next to my hospital bed. He wore a charcoal gray suit, jacket unbuttoned, red tie askew left leg crossed over right. His black dress shoes were shined to a high gloss. I studied them for a long time, mesmerized. Dress shoes. Men's patent leather dress shoes. I almost couldn't fathom the concept. We discussed it later. One of our many conversations back in the day when I would talk to him and only to him. That something as simple as dress shoes could be so startling as in, I was awake a good hour before I ever said a word, ever alerted anyone to my newfound entry into the land of the living. Instead, I simply lay there, staring at a man's shoes. A symbol of civilization, we decided at last, a note of beauty and culture and care. In other words, his shoes represented everything that I'd lost, everything I thought I'd never see again. The brain has a way of simplifying complex thoughts into a single, simple symbol. Coping, Samuel would tell me. In the beginning, it was too hard for me to put into words everything I'd lost, everything I'd feared, everything I'd gone through. So instead, I fixated on a highly polished pair of men's dress shoes. You called her, I say. Now, not a question. We've been through this drill too many times for that. You knew I would. 
Samuel drives with both hands. His hands are relaxed, fingers long and elegant on the wheel. He's a shockingly beautiful man, unsettling even. In the beginning, I held that against him. How can you take anyone, but especially a doctor, seriously, when he looks like he should be starring in a Calvin Klein ad? In the years since, I've come to understand better. We all have our burdens to bear, even someone as pretty as Samuel. He doesn't dress down, however, or do anything else that might detract from his physical perfection. Far from it. I've never seen him in anything other than impeccably tailored clothes, hundred-dollar head shaves, and perfectly buffed nails. Even off-duty, he looks like he stepped from the pages of GQ. I think it's his own test. I dress myself up in cool girl trashy, waiting for the next asshole to take the bait, while Samuel presents himself as just another pretty face. Then he waits for you to underestimate him, because in that moment he has you, and he knows it. His car matches the rest of him, Acura SUV, black on black, immaculate leather seats, freshly vacuumed carpet. I'm surprised he didn't put a towel down before allowing me to take a seat. I might be immune to the scent of garbage, but he isn't. Maybe he's planning on removing the cushion later and burning it. When it comes to Samuel, nothing would surprise me. If you've met one survivor, he told me that first day in the hospital room, then you've met one survivor. That's what Samuel and I have in common. We are both survivors. Any chance she stayed in Maine? I ask now, forcing my voice to sound light. I turn away from Samuel and look out the car window. Daylight is still shocking to me. All these years later, mornings remain a surprise. What do you think? I think he not only called my mother, but she's now waiting in my apartment. I think I'd rather go back to the crime scene, duke it out with that blonde detective again. What are you doing? Samuel asks presently. I smile. I can't help myself. And I keep my face turned away. Samuel, of all people, knows me too well. Which is why I keep calling him, to remind myself that somewhere out there, someone knows who I am, even if I can't always remember. When I woke up that day in the hospital in Atlanta, my mother and brother were still en route from Boston's Logan International Airport. Given that I had no friends or family in the area, Samuel had remained in the room as a source of support. The minute the FBI agents started asking all their questions, however, I couldn't do it. I couldn't talk. I couldn't remember what they wanted me to remember. I absolutely, positively could not relive what they seemed to feel I should recall at a moment's notice. Instead, I curled up in a fetal position and shut down. They tried kindness, impatience, and then out-and-out -out badgering. It didn't matter. I didn't talk. I couldn't. Eventually, they left, under doctor's orders to let me rest. Only Samuel remained. He took his seat, crossed his left leg over his right, and that was that. He never said a word. I closed my eyes. I fell asleep, or tried to. The room would spin away. Other images replaced it, light and dark, screams and laughter, the feel of shampoo in my hair, the smell of ammonia, the way blood soaks into cheap carpet. I saw things I didn't want to see, knew too many things I didn't want to know, and had my first real insight into victimization. There's no undoing, there's no rewind or erasing or unmaking. The things that happen, they are you. You are them. You can escape, but you can't get away. Just the way it is. I reached my decision then. I would tell my story once and only once, to Samuel, and then that would be it. I would talk, he would listen, and then I would never speak of it again. For his part, Samuel wanted to ensure I understood that he was an agent of the police. Anything and everything I told him, he'd be reporting back to the special agent in charge. He wasn't my shrink. We did not have a doctor-client privilege. But as long as I understood that, he would listen to whatever I wanted, needed, to say. So I talked, the words rushing out, pouring out, 
one long, horrible deluge. I spoke for hours. Nurses came, checked vitals, adjusted monitors, then scurried away. Dark agents appeared in the doorway, only to be hastily dismissed. I don't know. I couldn't take it in, the room, the equipment, the endless interruption of bodies. I kept my body ramrod straight, hands at my side, gaze on the overhead lights, and I talked, and I talked, and I talked. First a whisper, then louder, steadier. Then, maybe I ended in a scream. I don't really remember, to tell you the truth. It was like an out-of-body experience. All this horror I had to get out of me, and the only way to do that was to talk and talk and talk. When I finally reached the end, midnight, small hours of the morning, Samuel staggered to his feet. His face was covered in a sheen of sweat. He didn't look so beautiful anymore. His breath was ragged, as if he himself had just completed a long, hard race. He made it to the bathroom. I listened to him vomit. When he returned, however, his gleaming bald head was polished, his features once again composed. He took my hand. He held it. And I slept. Hours and hours, maybe even an entire day. I finally slept. When I woke up, my mother and brother were there, and the real business of returning to the land of the living began. I kept my word that day. I've never told my story again. Not to the detectives, not to the rabid prosecutor, not to my own mother. Samuel must have turned in a report. That was his job, after all. I've never asked. I've never read it. I said all I had to say, all I could say, once, and then it was done. The nice thing about my captor, Jacob Ness, being dead is that there's no one to rebut. My story is the story. And both Samuel and I know it. Why did you go out last night? Samuel asked me now. He eases up in the accelerator. We're nearing my Arlington apartment. I'm a young single woman. People my age are supposed to go out at night. Alone to a bar? The band was excellent. He cast me a look. I didn't lie to the police, I hear myself say. The bartender was as much a surprise to me as everyone else. If I hadn't been there... Samuel pauses a beat. Shrinks love a good waiting game. You killed a man. Please. That golden guy would have attacked someone else, and that girl would now be dead. I saved a life last night. And saving this abstract girl has value. Absolutely. What about your own life? Doesn't it have value? I roll my eyes. I totally set him up for that one, and we both know it. You can't count that as a display of superior intellect, I inform him. More like basic reflex. He ignores my sarcasm, continues more pointedly. I believe your mother would argue that, given a choice between worrying about you and worrying about a stranger, she'd prefer to know you're safe. I don't have anything to say to that. Or maybe I have too much. Such as, what does it matter? I could stay in every night for the rest of my life, and my mother still wouldn't be happy. In fact, maybe she'd be better off if I finally did go out and meet a grand demise, get the waiting game over with. Because, as my mother will tell you, there are worse things than having your daughter abducted. There's getting her back and realizing you've lost her after all. You shouldn't have called her. I say now, but you knew I would. I can take care of myself. You know, just ask Devin Goulding. I did what I had to do. No. Samuel retaliates just as sharply. You set up what you wanted. There's a difference. I fall back into silence. We arrive at the three-story brownstone that houses my single-bedroom apartment. Samuel pulls into the driveway, temporary parking and a signal that he's not staying, just dropping me off. The local police are looking at you now, he says quietly. Nah, that was just posturing. Blondie didn't have a real perpetrator to arrest, so naturally she toyed with me. But I'm telling you, by the time they're done shaking down that house, they'll find evidence of other victims. Then they'll have real work to do, and I'll fall by the wayside. Just a curious footnote in the case file. Samuel looks at me. 
He has deep, dark eyes fringed by heavy lashes. I imagine women must fall in love with him every day, gazing into those eyes, fantasizing about him staring back at them just as soulfully. It's a bunch of effort wasted on a man who never does anything but work. You survived, he tells me now, by doing what you had to do, by adapting. That's the nature of survival, Flora, and you know it. I don't say anything. You're strong, and that helped you. But this doesn't have to define you. You're a young woman with your whole life ahead of you. Now, don't confuse what you had to do to survive with who you are. A woman who takes on rapists? Is that how you see yourself? He's waiting. He wants a better definition, a deeper look into myself. Am I a vigilante? A self-destructive freak? How about a self-defense enthusiast? Maybe I'm all of those things. Maybe I'm none of those things. Maybe I'm a girl who, once upon a time, thought of the world as a shiny, happy place. And now, I'm a girl who went missing too many years ago and remained away from home and from herself for way too long. My mother's waiting, I say, and he smiles, because Samuel, of all people, understands exactly what I mean. Sorry about your seat, I say as I climb out of the car. Don't worry, I'm going to take it out and burn it. My turn to smile. Are you working with Stacy Summers' family? I ask him abruptly. He shakes his head. Are you? He asks evenly. You know that's not my style. But you're following her case. Isn't everyone? Samuel flexes his hands on the wheel. Do you think he did it? He asks abruptly. Do you think the man you just killed is the same person who kidnapped Stacy Summers in August? I want to think that. So you can feel better about what you did? No. Opposite, in fact. If he's the one who attacked Stacy, he's dead now. Not exactly in a position to lead the police to her body. It'd be better, in fact, if it wasn't him. At least for our family. So why are you asking about Stacy Summers? I open my mouth. I close my mouth. There are things I can't say not even to Samuel. I glance up, my gaze going to the top window of the brownstone and the outline of my mother waiting for me there. Thank you, Samuel, I hear myself say. I close the door. He backs out of the driveway. Then my real work begins. Chapter 10 Deputy Superintendent of Homicide, Cal Horgan, a.k.a. Dee Dee's boss, stood in her doorway. Heard you got a live one, he said. We're still working this scene, but yeah, at first blush. The deceased, Devin Golding, was most likely a serial predator. We recovered two driver's licenses, not to mention a cache of photos, which seems to indicate other victims. Stacy Summers? Horgan asked immediately the missing college student being first and foremost on most law enforcement agents' minds. Given the terrible abduction video and urgent nature, the Summers case had gone straight to red ball status, detective speak for all hands on deck. While Dee Dee wasn't the lead investigator, she'd spent the first week of the girl's disappearance conducting interviews and combing through reports with the rest of her colleagues. Her biggest contribution spending several days interrogating the girl's boyfriend. All she got out of it was a young man's horror. Though Patrick Vaughn and Stacy had been dating only a matter of months, he was clearly smitten. Far from playing it cool, he'd broken down several times. Stacy was such a sweet girl, the real deal, thoughtful, considerate, the kind of girl who'd never dream of running off or doing anything to hurt her family. If she'd gone missing, then only the worst could have happened. There were days it was good to be a cop, when you got to browbeat some low-life schmuck into a righteous confession. Then, there were the days you made a clean-cut, 19-year-old college boy cry. Dee Dee hadn't loved that day on the job, or, frankly, anything that had to do with the Stacy Summers case. They could place the girl at a local bar, where she'd gone to hang out with half a dozen female friends. Two beers under her belt, probably a little buzzed as she wasn't a big drinker. She'd excused herself to use the restroom. Next thing anyone knew, 
a local business's security camera had captured video of the petite blonde being forcefully led away by a hulking male, face hidden from view. After that, nothing at all. Not a single eyewitness, not another video frame. In a city heavily populated by nosy people and observant cameras, 105-pound Stacy Summers ceased to exist. I'm told this Devin Goulding was a big guy, Horgan was saying now. Pumped up, steroid sculpted. Sounds like our cameraman. The size is right, Dee Dee agreed. M.O. Last night's victim he grabbed by the arm and dragged away. According to her, Golding's posture, the way he looked away from the cameras, reminded her of the summer's abduction video. So we got a lead, Horgan pressed, half impatient, half hopeful. Did he understood his pain? If Boston PD as an organization was under pressure to find a cute, perky, never heard of fly Stacy Summers, then Horgan, as the deputy superintendent of homicide, was feeling personally responsible. Welcome to the chain of command. I'm not convinced. Why not? Assuming the two licenses we recovered tied to past victims, there's nothing linking back to Stacy Summers. We also found photographs consistent with one of the females from the licenses, Natalie Draga, but again, no evidence of Stacy Summers. But you have at least two possible victims, Natalie Draga and Christy Kilker. According to Mrs. Kilker, her daughter is currently studying abroad in Italy. Horgan arched a brow. We're working on corroborating that now, she assured him. Same with Natalie Draga. Her driver's license is from Alabama. We're tracking down her family there. So you don't know if these two women are missing or not? No, sir. But you know he attacked a third girl, the one who burned him. You mean the one who killed him? Horgan shrugged. Apparently, a dead alleged rapist didn't bother him much. Dee Dee knew many on the force who would agree. I have some concerns about this new victim, Florence Dane. Horgan frowned. Diddy watched him mentally work his way back from the initial spark of name recognition. Then, you're kidding. Florence Dane? The Boston girl who was kidnapped in Florida? Held for over a year? That Florence Dane? Seems since her re-entry into society, she's made criminal behavior a bit of a hobby. Last night's attack marks her fourth instance of self-defense in the past three years. Horgan closed his eyes. Well, that's not going to look good. Something like that. Golding's family could argue she set him up. And suddenly, instead of us happily announcing there's one less predator in Boston, let alone possibly closing out two missing person cases, we're going to have to investigate a rapist as a victim? Exactly. What do you have to corroborate Florence Dane's version of events? Her bruises on Flora's face. Eyewitness accounts from the neighbors that she was discovered naked and bound in Golding's garage. Other testimonies from the bar where Devin worked that Flora didn't even talk to him last night, but was hanging out with some other loser, whom Devin punched in the face. Okay, sounds promising. Dee Dee shrugged, winced at the corresponding stabbing pain in her shoulder, then quickly recovered. I don't like it, she stated bluntly. The overall pattern of behavior. Flora Dane's good deeds are going to hurt us, especially if it turns out nothing happened to those other girls. If it's just Flora's testimony on Devin Goulding's true nature and his actions last night, and the Gouldings could make the case she baited their son, that, given her past trauma, she sees predators everywhere and took the law in her own hands. Isn't that a Hitchcock movie? Twilight Zone episode. Look, four instances of self-defense is more than bad luck. It's a pattern of bad behavior, and given the latest episode ended in a man's death, you can argue her behavior is escalating. Meaning what? Dee Dee stared at her superior officer. Meaning we should charge her. With what? Reckless conduct. Why not? She set in motion the chain of events that led to Goulding's death. She should be held accountable. I see restricted duty hasn't made you go soft. Cal, it's not her job to police the world. It's ours. We know what we're doing. She, on the other hand, is a threat to herself and others. Not to mention... Last night, she potentially screwed up at least two other investigations. How do you figure? Well, she killed Devin Goulding, meaning if he did do something to Natalie Draga and or Christy Kilker, now what? Where are their bodies? What happened to them? I'd ask him, but oh yeah, he's dead. 
Meaning, what the hell do we have to bring back to the families? Here's your daughter's driver's license. Hope that's good enough? Frankly, of all people, Laura Dane should know better. Tell her that, Horgan asked evenly. Waiting to get more information on the two women, then I'll bring it up. You're definitely going to interview her again. Oh, in my mind, this party is only starting. Dee Dee, her boss hesitated. I know you pride yourself on being firm in your opinions. It's one of the things that ensures working with you is never boring. But Flora Dane, you might want to pull her case file. There's a good reason for her to see predators everywhere. Certainly she spent more than a year getting a master class in criminal behavior. Now you sound like her shrink, I'm sorry, her victim advocate. Seriously, the girl basically has her own FBI agent on a leash. Never seen anything like it. All right, plenty of questions ahead. But first, if you don't mind, go home, Dee Dee. Shower. What's that smell, anyway? Human barbecue, or maybe rotten garbage. Her boss shook his head. Clean up. We have to do a press briefing in time for the evening news cycle. For now, keep it simple. Looking for information regarding Natalie Draga and Christy Kilker, or anyone else who may have known Devin Goulding. No mention of Stacy Summers. No mention of Florence Dane. Didi rolled her eyes at him. Now who wants the impossible? Horgan flashed her a smile, then disappeared down the hall, leaving Didi with mounds of paperwork and the smell of crime scenes still lingering in her hair. She went home. Given it was Saturday, Alex was home with four-year-old Jack. She discovered them sprawled on the living room floor, engaged in a fierce game of Candyland. Jack was less interested in winning the game than he was in drawing the various character cards. Jolly was his favorite, and he'd been known to snatch the card bearing the big blue gumdrop in his pocket or up his sleeve. Alex glanced up from the board game. He gave her a welcoming smile, even as he sniffed the air. Jack, on the other hand, came flying off the floor and flung himself around her legs. Mommy, mommy, mommy! No doubt about it, that never got old. Dee Dee ruffled his brown hair with her right hand, as her left arm had stiffened even further on the drive home. She was holding it protectively against her side. And sure enough, what'd you do? Alex asked. Long night, she offered. Jack was still hugging her. She hugged him back. Alex was no dumb bunny. Paperwork doesn't require long nights. Paperwork can generally be reviewed in the morning. Big case, she mumbled. Perpetrator found, incapacitated, in his own garage, with ties to other victims. Inca what? Jack asked. Incapacitated. Means he can't play Candyland anymore. I have Jolly, Jack announced, and sure enough, he whipped the gumdrop card from beneath his sweater sleeve. Hey, Alex complained. I've been looking for that. Nuh-uh. You like Grandma Nut. Everyone knows that. Grandma Nut advances you further on the board than Big Blue Gumdrops, Alex muttered, and saying I want Princess Frostine sounds funny. I'm home just to clean up and eat, Dee Dee announced, tone apologetic. Jack's shoulders sagged, but he didn't outwardly protest, at least not yet. Jack hadn't been thrilled when she returned to work after being home so long with her injury. He was a kid, and kids liked their parents close. In the good news department, she did get decent time off after working long stretches, but it felt like the past few weeks had seen more peaks on the job than lulls, and Jack was struggling with her long absences. Hell, she was still adjusting to the demands of full-time duty as well. Saw the news this morning, Alex commented. Figured you might be busy. One of the reporters was already speculating you had a fresh lead in the Stacy Summers case. What? How did they... Ugh. How could they? Ugh. Never mind. Like the press has to be informed to state their opinions. But no, no connection to that case. At least, not at this time. Alex smiled. It creased the corners of his deep blue eyes. He was a good-looking guy, she thought. Not for the first time. Salt and pepper hair. Distinguished features. And hers. All hers. Who knew one workaholic detective could get so lucky? She pried Jack away from her legs with a promise of future grilled cheese. That brought her enough time to shower, then throw on her favorite dark blue Ann Taylor pantsuit 
which was her outfit of choice for press conferences. In the kitchen, she poured two glasses of orange juice, then set to work slicing up a brick of cheddar. Her shoulder twinged again, and she couldn't completely suppress the wince. You overdid it, Alex said, coming up behind her. Just need a little ice. Or some rest, or a good night's sleep, or a little less stress. Blah, blah, blah. And Phil's worried about you. Said you were on the scene most of the night. That's hardly restricted duty. Phil's secretly a woman, and worries about me more than my own mother. Crime happens, Alex said. He was already opening the freezer door, bringing out her favorite ice pack, perfectly molded to the shape of her shoulder. And it will continue to happen, whether you're working or not. Especially if Flora Dane has her way, Dee Dee muttered. Who? Guy we found. She glanced around the kitchen, searched for signs of Jack, who was probably in the family room, stacking Legos. Seeing that they were alone, Dee Dee continued. Guy we found dead started his evening abducting Flora Dane, who turns out to be no stranger to kidnappings. She turned the tables on him, burned him to death with supplies she found in his trash. No kidding? I don't like it. Fourth time she's put herself in a dangerous situation since her return five years ago. What happens next? She takes on the entire Russian mob? Better her than me, Alex observed. You think she's a vigilante? Don't you? Seeking out predators time and time again? So says the woman on restricted duty who's about to go back to work. I'm a workaholic. Didi fired up the first grilled cheese sandwich. What's her excuse? Alex rolled his eyes. Sit. Ice your shoulder. I can flip a sandwich. She sat. She iced her shoulder. She relaxed. At least as much as a woman like her could. Then in came Jack for a fresh round of sticky little boy hugs and a fresh pat down for hoarded Candyland character cards. Normal life. Real life. Her life. Then, much as her husband predicted and respected, she headed back to work. Chapter 11 The first thing that hits me as I walk up three flights of stairs to my tiny one-bedroom unit is the scent of freshly baked muffins. My mother. Under stress, she bakes. Cookies, brownies, breads, homemade granola, scones. I'm told during my abduction, the entire community, not to mention the victim specialists, put on 15 pounds. She has a key to my unit. Three, actually, as I'm partial to that many locks. Having opened my front door, however, she has left it unlocked behind her. Now all I have to do is push it open. I know she doesn't do these things to consciously spite me, and yet already I can feel my shoulders tense. I'm not looking forward to the conversation to come. Most likely, she isn't either. Hence, muffins. She's in the kitchen, bent over the oven, checking her project when I walk in. The police haven't given me back my real clothes after the night's misadventure. Did they even find them? I have no idea. If they did, the items would be kept as evidence. In the meantime, the district detective rustled up oversized gray sweatpants and a navy blue Boston police hoodie, most likely extra clothes stashed in the back of some officer's vehicle. Both items are huge. I have to hold up the elastic waistband of the sweatpants as I walk. My feet remain bare, meaning I don't make much noise as I pad across the hardwood. I chose this unit for several reasons. One, being on the third story, it's harder for an intruder to access. Two, the old brownstones are famous for their high ceilings, bullseye molding, and bay windows. My unit is small but flooded with light from the old windows and charming with its battered oak floors and beautiful wooden trim. Is there water damage on the ceiling? Sure. Peeling linoleum in the kitchen. Not one of the owner's better renovation ideas. Yep. A shower that only yields hot water after three or four strategic whacks? Well, a girl like me can hardly afford the best. Besides, I like my unit's flaws. It's scarred, like me. We belong together, not to mention the elderly couple who are my landlords know my story and charge me only a fraction of the going rate for rent. Having turned down the requisite book deal and movie rights, reduced rent is as close to a post-abduction perk as I'm going to get. 
and given that I've never returned to college and still have no idea what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, money is an issue. For the past few months, I've been working down the street at a pizza parlor, popular with college students and local families. My hourly weight is miserly, the tips only slightly better, but the work is mindless, and I appreciate that. Is this the life I thought I'd be living at 27? No. But then, when I first left my mother's farm for college in the big city, what did I know? I enrolled to study French, for God's sake, mostly because I liked the idea of going to Paris. Maybe I would have become a teacher, or returned to Maine and set up a small farm of my own involving goats. I'd sell goat milk, goat cheese, maybe even goat milk lotions and goat milk soaps, all with labels in French. I was happy enough, naive enough back then, to have those kind of dreams. But everyone's dreams change, not just the dreams of girls who wind up kidnapped for 472 days. At least I'm not dealing with kids, because that happens too. Held captive long enough, pregnancy, babies can ensue. Jacob, however, was adamant on that subject. Once a month, he forced me to swallow some god-awful homemade brew he swore would prevent pregnancy. It tasted like turpentine and led to immediate, excruciating stomach cramps. The sexual assault nurse who performed my initial exam had been curious about the potion, though in her professional opinion, it was my extreme emaciation and total lack of body fat that probably truly did the job. Frankly, I didn't even have a period through most of my captivity. I was that thin. Now, I watch my mother straighten in front of the stove, muffin tin clutched in an oven mitten hand. She turns, spots me, and immediately stills. Her gaze takes in the oversized sweats that obviously aren't mine, then the garbage smeared across my cheek, my hair. She doesn't speak. I watch her chest fill, a conscious inhale. Then the slow exhale as she no doubt counts to ten, wondering yet again how to survive a daughter like me. At her throat is a necklace with a single silver charm, a dainty but perfectly rendered fox. She bought that after I went missing. When the FBI prepped her for the first press conference by dismissing her usual attire of wide-legged yoga pants and flowing hand-woven wraps, such as the kind favored by Afghan tribal elders. No more bohemian, organic potato farmer from Maine. Her goal was to look like Mom, with a capital M, an instantly recognizable and relatable maternal figure who would appeal to my captor's kinder sentiments, assuming he had any. They stuck her in jeans and a button-up white shirt, probably the plainest outfit she'd ever worn in her life, not to mention the real shoes versus her usual Birkenstocks. I didn't see that first press conference, or the second. I think I caught the third, when things were truly heating up. Even then, spying her, my mom, on the TV, standing in front of the microphone, flanked by suited FBI agents, wearing a light blue button-up shirt, more jeans. My mom, but not my mom. A surreal moment in a life that had already taken a completely, horrifically surreal turn. I would have shut the TV off, wasted my rare privilege, rather than see this mom but not my mom. Except then I spotted the fox charm, nestled in the hollow of her throat. I never heard her words that day, but I knelt on the floor of that cheap hotel room and placed my finger against the charm around her neck, my fingers so large, her form so diminutive on the small TV that the tip of my index finger obliterated most of her head. I might have cried. I don't really remember. I'd already been gone months by that point. I don't know if I had any tears left. But I tried to touch her, this mom but not my mom. And for one moment, I was a child again, running wild on the farm, throwing golf balls for the fox kits and laughing as they batted them across the tall grass. Now, she sets down the muffin tin on top of the stove. Her hands are shaking slightly. Are you hungry? She asks, her voice almost normal. Her farm is three and a half hours north of Boston. Assuming Samuel called her the minute after I contacted him, she got into her truck immediately and has been driving since the crack of dawn. 
I should shower, I hear myself say. Of course, take your time. There doesn't seem to be anything else to say. I pad away, still holding the waistband of the sweats. Four whacks of the old plumbing later, the water turned steaming hot. I shed the baggy sweats. I step into the hard spray, and I let the water scald me. For a moment, I can almost smell it again. Freshly roasted human skin, like a pork barbecue. Then the moment passes, and I close my eyes. The void fills me, and I welcome its emptiness. To always be alone in a crowded room. The only time I ever feel safe anymore. After my abduction, when I returned to the land of the living, one of Samuel's first tasks was to develop my post-captivity support plan. Basically, he conducted an assessment of my coping skills, while also working with the victim specialists who'd assisted my family to understand the level of support network already in place. While Samuel is an expert in post-traumatic stress, he informed me that he's not a fan of the term. In his opinion, it's often applied too readily and as a one-size-fits-all model. He's worked with dozens and dozens of survivors over the years, and while all of us experience trauma, only a few genuinely qualify as suffering from PTSD. In fact, he warned my mother explicitly about making such an assumption or even such excuses on my behalf. Survivors make it because they learn to adapt. Adaptation is coping. Coping is strength. My mother, my brother, myself should not expect me to be weak now, nor actively foster dependency. Instead, we should all focus on reinforcing my natural resilience, which got me through the ordeal in the first place. As for myself, the biggest mistake survivors can make, according to Samuel, is second-guessing their actions now that they're safe. So, no wondering why I went to the bar in the first place that night, or why I didn't struggle harder, or escape the first time Jacob left the cab of his truck unlocked. No matter that Jacob had pulled over his rig in the middle of nowhere, and he was standing right there, taking a leak in a drainage ditch. The past is the past. It doesn't matter what mistakes I might or might not have made. What matters is that I survived. Samuel was right about the pitfalls of second guessing. I don't suffer nightmares about Jacob as much as I suffer terrible anxiety over the might have beens, should have dones. My first enrollment in a self defense course was an attempt to help mediate those nerves, make me feel more comfortable. Ironically enough, my mother supported that step even took that first class with me. Samuel had approved as well, reinforcing a feeling of personal strength, excellent. It was right about the fourth or fifth class and my growing interest in marksmanship that my mother became concerned. I was living back home those days, and I overheard her discussing it with Samuel during one of his check-ins, trying to assess how either of us, both of us, were doing. Samuel is not a therapist, and certainly not my therapist. He had, however, recommended counseling for me, or therapeutic support, as he liked to call it. I'd resisted all attempts, though. Private sessions would, by definition, involve telling my story, and I was sticking to my guns. I told my story once, as promised. Never again. Ironically enough, it was my mother who took Samuel's advice. I moved on to tactical driving classes, while she started meeting with the local pastor once a week. Another one of those realizations that all survivors have to make. My abduction hadn't just victimized me, but my entire family, too. My mother, who, after the third postcard, pretty much gave up on the farm and turned her attention full-time to reaching out to a depraved kidnapper in the desperate hope of seeing her daughter again. My brother, who dropped out of college, first to answer endless police questions, and later because, in his own words, how could he possibly concentrate knowing I was out there, somewhere, needing him? Major crimes are like cancer. They take over, demanding an entire family's full resources. My brother became a social media expert, building a Facebook page, running Twitter feeds, and frankly, trying to manage the press who camped out in the yard for weeks at a time, especially after Jacob mailed out a new postcard offering fresh bait. 
My mother spent her days with the victim advocates, as well as with fellow parents of missing kids. They offered support, mentorship, as she sought to come up to speed quickly on law enforcement, criminal behavior, media management. She got to learn how to craft messages for strategic press conferences, while also making the rounds on the morning news shows and nightly cable stations. She got to handwrite replies to hundreds, then thousands of letters from total strangers wishing for my safe return. And she got to endure other notes, Facebook posts, stating an obviously immoral teenage girl like me got exactly what I deserved. In theory, there are some financial resources available to victims of crime. The specialists diligently produced paperwork, enabling my mother to possibly collect a couple of thousand here, or apply for a grant there. My mother will tell you she had neither the time nor mental focus. No, having your child abducted is a fairly impoverishing ordeal. My sin of heading out for a night of spring break drinking becoming our entire family's punishment. In our case, the community rallied. Neighbors showed up and worked the farm in their free time. They got seeds started, crops planted, and then as the ordeal continued to drag on, dealt with the fall harvest. The church held bake sales. Local businesses sent over checks. Local restaurants and delis provided food. My mother will never leave her farm. Probably wouldn't have anyway. But the land, her place, her community, it's her solace, her anchor. It was there when she needed it most, and without it, I don't know what she would have done. She has her place in the world. It's my brother and I who remain adrift. Darwin left. A year after my return, when I couldn't magically smile on command, when the pancakes I once loved were now a smell I couldn't stomach, he'd had enough. The family protector melted down, had a little episode involving driving way too fast with no headlights, and my mother realized all the love and attention I didn't want should be turned on him instead. After many heartfelt discussions, she sent him to Europe, got him a passport, a rail ticket, a backpack, and sent him off with a kiss and a hug. Go forth, young man, and find yourself, and all that. Darwin doesn't send postcards. He knows better. But from time to time, we get a call. He's in London now. Likes it a lot. Is thinking of enrolling in the London School of Economics. Certainly he's bright enough while having some pretty interesting topics to write about for his college entrance essay. I think, more than anything else in the world, I would like my brother to have a happy ending. I wish he'd fall in love, land a great job, build a life. Then my mistake doesn't have to be his punishment anymore. Which is funny, because I think he would say exactly the same about me. I've showered long enough, Soaped, shampooed, conditioned, done everything except feel clean. The smell of burning human flesh. Not pork, maybe more like roast beef. I saved a life, I remind myself, as I whack the ancient faucet to off. Another girl is safe because of me. Another animal is off the streets. The sun is out. My apartment smells like blueberry muffins. This is one of those moments when I should stop. Give thanks for the day. I think of Jacob. I don't want to. I just can't help myself. I remember Jacob Ness, the man who took me, broke me down, and then rebuilt me for 472 days. And in the back of my mind, he's laughing at me. My mother has cleaned the kitchen. If I hadn't emerged dressed and freshly showered when I did, I'm pretty sure she would have taken down and washed the French-printed balances she bought and installed last year. My mother is a farmer mostly because she needs to keep busy. She's one of those people who require a long list of chores or her life lacks all meaning. She's dressed like herself today, black, wide-legged yoga pants with a funky print on the bottom hem and a loose-fitting seafoam green 100% organic cotton-wrapped shirt. Over that, She's thrown on a man's unbuttoned gray flannel shirt. In Maine, she'd blend right in. In Boston, not quite so much. About six months after I returned home, she boxed up all the clothes the victim specialists had helped her buy for the press conferences. Together, 
we took the items to the thrift shop that operates out of the Congregational Church's basement. The ladies were pleased to receive such high-quality, hardly-worn clothing items. We called it liberation, an ongoing campaign to get our lives back. My mother gave away clothes that were never really her. I painted my childhood bedroom butter yellow and resolved to be more appreciative of everyday beauty. Let's just say my mother is doing better with the campaign than me. When I reappear, she has heaped the muffins on a plate in the middle of the rolling butcher block piece that serves both as my kitchen prep island and sole dining table. She has also poured two glasses of orange juice and cut up fresh fruit. Given my refrigerator held mostly bottles of water and cartons of stale takeout, she went to the corner store while I was showering. Which, of course, compels me to turn around and check the front door locks. I snap the bolts home. When I return to her, I know my expression is disapproving, but I can't help myself. Muffin, she says cheerfully, gesturing to the plate. I take one. Suddenly I'm famished. I eat two muffins, then devour half the bowl of fruit. My mother doesn't say anything, but picks at her own food. She probably ate hours ago, waiting for me, worrying about me. Now she's working on playing it cool. Samuel says you killed a man, she says at last, waiting game obviously up. I pick up my plate, carried to the tiny sink. Self-defense, I won't face any charges. You think that's what scares me? She's standing right beside me, and despite her best attempts at deep breathing exercises, I can tell she's agitated. It hurts me. It does. I don't know how to be her little girl anymore. I don't know how to turn back the clock and undo what was done. I can't feel what I can't feel. I can't be what I can't be. But it pains me, this look on her face, this worry in her eyes. It kills me to know that the person I am now hurts the mother who's never done anything but love me. I didn't plan on what happened, I hear myself say. But I was prepared, and I handled the situation. This guy, he's hurt other girls, Mom. But not anymore, he's done. I don't care about other girls, she says. I care about you. She hugs me then, hard and fierce, the way I know she's always hugged me. And I force myself to stand there, to not flinch, to not go rigid, to remind myself these arms are my mother's arms. Her hair smells like my memories of my mother's hair. This is the woman who tucked me in at night and read me stories and offered me warm milk when I couldn't sleep and made me cinnamon toast when I was sick. A million tiny moments. But it's all detached now. This is what I can't tell her, can never completely explain. The memories don't feel like mine. All of this, all of what was, feels like something that happened to someone else. Home movies from somebody else's life. Jacob Ness wanted a completely compliant companion. So he broke me down, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Then when I was nothing, just a raw, helpless mound of human clay, he remolded me into being exactly who he wanted me to be. He became my world, my center, my guiding star. And then, that last day, those final few moments, the story I told once and will never repeat. He's gone now, and I am lost, forever untethered, until my mother's hug feels like the comfort of a stranger. My own brother ran away from the person I've become, but my mom is more stubborn. You can come back home, she says now, an old argument. Foster's dependency, she knows it, and hastily adds, just for a visit, a few days. We could make a girl's weekend out of it. I'm fine. Going out alone to a bar on a Friday night? I can take care of myself. Isn't that the point? She draws back. She can't talk to me when I'm in this mood, and she knows it. Again, the worry on her face, which I feel as a fist in my chest. Flora, I know you don't like my choices, I hear myself say, but they're my choices to make. A winning argument in my mother's world, and she knows it. I watch her inhale deeply, exhale slowly. If you won't come home this weekend, she says presently, then tell me when. 
I accept her compromise. We pick a date two weeks from now. I need to rest now, I tell her, but she's welcome to stay. She shakes her head, though. A city apartment is no place for a Maine farmer. She prepares to leave, driving back another three and a half hours. A seven-hour round trip to spend one hour with her daughter. These are the things mothers do, she tells me as I watch her turn and walk downstairs. When she's gone from sight, I close my front door. I work my locks. I turn back to my sunny, charming, battle-scarred apartment. And I do exactly what I told my mother I would do. I head to bed. I sleep. I don't always. Usually slumber comes fitfully for me. But now, fresh off my most recent kill, I sleep like the dead. When I wake up, the sun is gone, my room is dark, and I know immediately that I'm not alone. I can feel a draft against my cheek, the muted hush of an intruder's shuffling footstep. Then, from just outside my open bedroom door, a shadow, dark and menacing, I open my mouth to say, who's there? Except, of course, I already know. The world is filled with monsters. I need to move, leap out of bed, assume the defensive. Instead, I make the mistake of inhaling. Then, all I hear is the distant sound of laughter, right before the world goes dark again. Chapter 12 the hardest part about being held captive? You'd think it would be the starvation, punishment, degradation. The unbearable thirst for water, maybe. Or the relentless pain of a pine box pressing against your shoulder blades, flattening the back of your head. Or perhaps the moment you realize you don't know how long you've been gone anymore. The minutes, hours, days have become a blur, and you can't remember now. Has it been a week? Two? Three? Is it still spring, or is it now summer? And what about Easter? Did Easter happen while you were gone? The annual brunch at your mother's house? Did your brother eat your chocolate bunny? You try to hang on to these thoughts, because they connect you to a larger world, some piece of reality where you're still a real person with a real life. But the truth is, these moments are hard to remember. So inevitably, you let them go. You think less and less of home and the person you used to be and the person you'll never be again. You just are. You're bored. Which becomes the toughest burden to bear. There's no friendly conversation or polite chit-chat. No places to go. No people to see. There's no TV to entertain you with mindless blather or a radio to engage you with a catchy song or a smartphone to entice you with an exciting new text. You exist in a sensory-deprived void, where you hum just for the sake of having something to hear, where you take turns counting by twos and threes and five just so your mind has something to do, where you gnaw on your fingertips just to have something to feel. But even this can only kill an hour or two a day. You sleep. Too much. You don't mean to. You understand you probably shouldn't. It would be better to remain alert. But you're tired, you're weak, and you're bored. Oh, so bored. Sleeping becomes the only thing left for you. I told myself stories. Children's books I remembered from school. Bible stories from church. In the beginning, I whispered them out loud. But my mouth was so dry and parched, the words got stuck in my throat. So after a while, I played the stories like movies in my mind, not fantasies of my rescue or images of my family and friends. That would hurt too much. Just fables, legends, fairy tales, anything with a happy ending that would pass the time in my head. But mostly, the stories put me back to sleep, so I would doze on and off, growing more and more disoriented, until at last... The sound of footsteps pounding down the stairs. A door squeaking open across the way. The rattle of the padlock so wonderfully close to my ear. Then, at long last, the wooden lid would be lifted. He would appear. 
and I would live again, saved from my boredom by the very man who'd put me there. Tell me about your father, he demanded one day. He lounged on the sofa in dirty underwear, alternating smoking a cigarette with taking long pulls from his beer. I sat naked on the floor, where I was allowed to remain longer and longer after our various sessions. Of course, the pine box remained in full view. I would sneak glances at it from time to time, as if contemplating a scary mask or coil serpent, the object of my abject terror. And yet, from this vantage point, nothing more than a cheap wooden coffin. I didn't answer right away. I was too engrossed in combing my fingers through the dirt brown carpet, which turned out to be not one shade of shit brown, but many. He kicked my shoulder with his foot, demanding my attention. Tell me about your father. Why? What the fuck, why? I asked. You answer. Another kick, this time to the side of my head. His thick yellow toenails were long and ragged. One sliced my cheek. I didn't move away. By now, I knew it was pointless. Instead, I kept my gaze on the carpet. So many individual threads woven into one color pattern. Who would have thought? I wondered if it was difficult to make carpet. I wondered if I could pull out enough strands that it would be possible to choke myself with them. I don't remember him, I said at last. When did he die? I was a baby. What happened? An accident. His truck rolled. What was his name? I dug my torn fingernails deeper into the matted carpet. I could feel dust and dirt and small rocks. The fibers were so short, too short, really, to serve as much of a death weapon. Pity. And yet I still couldn't stop touching it. As far as entertainment went, dirt brown carpet was as good as the room got. I still didn't know where I was. A basement, I thought, because the only windows were set up high. It always sounded as if someone was descending a staircase right before he barreled through the door. I didn't think Florida had basements, or not many. Did that mean I wasn't in Florida anymore? Maine had basements. Maybe he'd brought me all the way back to Maine. I was just down the street from my mother. If I could summon the strength, the energy, the good fortune to crawl up out of one of those high windows, I could walk back to my mother's farm. And just like that, I'd be home again. He kicked me again. Do you have a father? I asked. Of course. Do you remember his name? Nah. Too busy calling him dickhead to learn the real thing. He was a trucker, though, like me. You're a trucker? I couldn't help myself. I looked up in wonder, the discovery of personal information finally pulling my attention from the filthy floor. He caught the look on my face and laughed. Well, shit, what'd you think I did in my spare time? Gotta work. Love nests don't come free. Are we still in Florida? I asked. Is it still spring break? He just laughed again, took another pull of beer. Then I'd take off soon, he offered conversationally. Big job this time. Could be gone as long as a week. The look he gave me was calculating, but I didn't consider that. I was too busy feeling the blood drain from my face. A week, seven whole days, all alone in the box. My brain shut down. My bloody fingertips dug painfully into the carpet. A week. Molly, he said. He wasn't smoking anymore. Instead, the burning cigarette dangled from his fingers as he stared at me. What? Your name is Molly. What's your name? I opened my mouth. I closed my mouth. I honestly didn't get it. Every muscle and bone in my body hurt. I wanted to escape the pain by going to sleep, except I couldn't sleep, because he was here, and I was out of the box, and the carpet contained half a dozen shades of shit brown, and this was as close to an experience as I was going to get. Better than movies or video games or texting. The feel of grimy carpet beneath my fingertips. A real adventure park. What's your name? He commanded again. Um, Molly? Not like that. It's an answer, not a question. Come on now. What's your damn name? Molly. I stayed with more conviction, starting to catch on. So he wanted to call me Molly. Whatever. 
Molly, frankly, was hardly the worst thing that had happened to me. Now, your father's name. I paused. And for just one second. It's Sunday afternoon. I'm all dressed up. I'm standing at my father's grave, holding my mother's hand while she cries silently, my brother standing stoically on her other side. He loved you kids, my mother is saying, fingers tight around mine. He would be so proud. And just like that, I couldn't say the name. I could picture it engraved on the black granite marker, but I couldn't give it up. My daddy was nothing but a legend, a myth once told by my mother to me. But he was mine, and I had so little left. The man kicked me again, back of the neck. I whispered, Edgar. In response, he slammed his foot against me harder, this time catching my ear. Liar. I'm not fucking idiot. He waved his cigarette at me. I watched the glowing end nervously. I knew what it could do. Your father's name, I mean it. Edgar, I murmured again. Fucking liar, he roared as he came off the sofa. Name, 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 give me the fucking name. Molly, 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 I tried. He whacked me on either side of the head as I cowered with my face against the carpet. I thought, frantically, crazily, I should pull out some of those brown threads, grab them between my fingers and twist. I could tuck them behind my ears, take them with me back into the box. Oh, the hours of entertainment ahead. Give me his fucking name! The man was still screaming at me. Last chance, girl, or I walk out that door and you'll never see me again. Hell, you'll never see anyone again. You're gone, don't you get it? You're just another stupid drunk girl who disappeared on spring break. Think anyone knows where you are? Think anyone cares? My mother, I thought, but I didn't say anything. I kept her to myself, just like my father's name and my brother's face. I'll stick you back in that box, he was threatening now. I'll lock the lid and that'll be that. You'll die down here, rot away, become just another stench in this room. And no one will ever know. Your family will never see you again. Never even identify your body. I was crying. He hit me harder. But it wasn't the beating that had me undone. It was the thought of him locking me in the box and then taking off, of me dying all alone in a coffin-sized box, like my father rotting away beneath the earth. When I was a little girl, I used to think my father could see everything, like Santa Claus or God, I suppose. My father wasn't a real dad at all, but an all-knowing ghost, and I would look for him in the sunlight dappling through trees, in the shadows of the deep woods. Daddy. I would whisper, and always, 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 I knew he was there, because, according to my mother, my father had always loved the forest. Where I could not find him was in the stillness of a coffin-sized box. Ernesto, I whispered, but the man was now too busy beating me furiously to hear. I curled up tighter against the dirt-brown carpet. Edgar, I shouted suddenly, Evan, Ernesto, Eli, Earl. I made them up quickly, frantically. Another game to pass the time. Names that begin with E. Yelling the names again and again. Because the shit brown carpet was composed of so many threads. And so was I. And I couldn't afford to give anything more away. There was too little of me left. And my father's name was part of that. A highly polished granite marker in the ground. A small but precious memory. Eventually the man wore himself out. He stopped beating and kicking, falling to the floor instead. He lay beside me, breath ragged from his exertions. We remained side by side in silence. Damn shame, he said shortly. I didn't respond. I mean, considering how nice I was planning on being and all. I mean, hell, taking you with me. I couldn't help myself. I stirred, shifting slightly against the grimy floor. A week in a big rig. Maybe it's not for everyone. I mean, I would definitely have to take the box, being your first outing and all. But still, you'd be on the road. Maybe I could let you out at night. You know, versus seven days shut up alone here. Maybe even eight, nine, ten days. A delivery takes as long as it takes. Man's got to do his job. Water? 
I couldn't help myself. Seven days alone was terrifying enough, but a possible ten days without water. I'd never paid enough attention in science classes, but I was pretty sure no one could survive that long. All the more reason to join me on the road, he informed me. All the more reason to give me a name. I lifted my head at last. I stared at him, his hard-lined face, his unshaved cheeks, his crooked, tobacco-stained teeth. He was ugly and awful. He was powerful and divine, even more so than a ghost dad in the woods. And I knew then, just as he no doubt knew all along, what I was going to say next. Everett. Everett Robert Dane. The man smiled at me. Now, was that really so hard? He asked me. I didn't say a word. He climbed off the floor, started rooting around on the coffee table. So, time to write a note. I mean, as long as you're running off with me. Don't you think you should at least tell your mother? Chapter 13 Dee Dee's Sunday morning began with a phone call. Walking into her office, no rest for the wicked or for a homicide supervisor who just landed a major case. She was juggling coffee in one hand and her crossbody leather messenger bag in the other. She barely set down her travel mug in time to snag the receiver. Sergeant Detective Dee Dee Warren, is it true? Did that man take my daughter? Do you know what happened to her yet? For the love of God, why are we having to learn all this from the press? What kind of unfeeling monsters are you? Diddy slowed. She didn't recognize the voice, but could deduce from the level of anguish she was most likely talking to Stacy Summers' father. Given the beating Boston PD had taken in yesterday's news cycle, rumored suspect in college students kidnapping found dead, Boston police refusing to discuss circumstances, she shouldn't be surprised. And yet still, sir... With whom am I speaking? Colin Summers. Who the hell do you think? I'm sorry, but I have to ask the question. As I'm sure you've learned by now, the press isn't above resorting to tricks to get inside information. An angry sigh on the other end of the receiver. The sound of a man trying very hard to pull himself together. Did he use the moment to set down her messenger bag, then pull out her chair and take a seat at her desk? Is it true? Colin Summers whispered at last. At this time, we have no evidence linking Devin Goulding to your daughter's disappearance. Stop. That's cop speak for bullshit. This is my daughter we're talking about. Please just give me the truth. Sir, I personally attended the crime scene. We've spent the better part of 24 hours tearing apart the Goulding's house. I am telling you the truth. We found nothing to link him to your daughter. But in the news, they said he was a big guy. They said he matched the picture in the video. That's true. And he was a bartender. That could be the connection. Stacy was last seen at Birch's downtown. He could have worked there. We've checked. Devin Goulding has no employment history with Birch's. But what if Stacy met him at the bar where he did work? Maybe he spotted her there, and he liked her. That's how these things sometimes work, right? He took one look at her, and she became his target. Dee Dee hesitated. Talking to grieving family members was her least favorite part of the job. It was tempting to answer all their questions, to soothe and to explain. But the truth was, her primary obligation wasn't to Colin Summers or his wife. It was to Stacy. And working a case was as much about safeguarding key details as it was about discovering new ones. She couldn't risk telling Mr. Summers everything they knew about Devin Goulding, there had been too many other occasions where the grieving father had shared valuable information with his wife or best friend, who, inevitably, shared it with another person, then another, until the next thing the police knew, everything they couldn't afford known about their ongoing investigation was now fodder for the evening news. Most family members would tell you they'd do anything to help find their loved one. Unfortunately, for their sakes, what the investigating officer genuinely needed from them was restraint. Dee Dee said, Did Stacy ever frequent Tonic Bar? I don't know. She wasn't a big drinker or a big partier, but she was social, he conceded. If her friends wanted to go, she'd follow along. Dee Dee nodded. 
That was consistent with what they'd established up to this point. Yesterday afternoon, Phil had personally visited Devin Goulding's place of employment, Tonic, with a picture of Stacy Summers. Several bartenders recognized her from the news coverage of her case, but none could place her in the establishment. Of course, that didn't rule out Devin Goulding having crossed paths with her at a different time or at a different bar. Boston offered up a robust scene for the college crowd. The choices were endless. Not to mention, given Goulding's abduction of Flora Dane, they couldn't argue that blondes weren't to his taste. Do you know Florence Dane? she asked abruptly. There was silence on the other end of the phone line. Silence that definitely went on several beats too long. Why do you ask? Colin Summers spoke up at last. Has she been to your house? Has she met with you? We met with her mother. What? When your child disappears, is a program through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Another parent, someone who's been there, calls to offer support. Rosa Dane was appointed as our mentor. Within the first 24 hours, she called and stayed on the phone with my wife while she cried. Have you personally met with her? She's been to our house a couple of times. She's been very helpful, Sergeant. After what she went through, she understands. She listens and she helps, which is more than we can say for the rest of you. Diddy winced at the man's bitterness, reminded herself again it was nothing personal. The family wanted answers. They wanted their daughter back. But, to date, the detectives could only provide more questions at best and fresh suspicions at worst. And her daughter, Florence, Didi pressed again. I'm familiar with her case, Colin Summers said, which was, in fact, no answer at all. She accompanied her mother on one of her visits, Didi stated. No. Reached out via phone, email, Facebook. You know her, don't you, Mr. Summers? You've spoken to her personally about your daughter. No. But Didi didn't believe him anymore. There was something more here something he still wasn't willing to say. And then, was she the one who killed him? Colin Summers asked. Who? Flora. Did she kill the bartender, the suspected kidnapper? Is that why you're asking all these questions? Dee Dee didn't say anything. So far, they'd managed to keep Florence Dane's name out of the news, mostly by virtue of not having pressed any formal charges against her, meaning there wasn't any information for overeager reporters to discover. Why would you assume that, Mr. Summers? You investigators have your sources of information. The families of victims have ours. And given how likely you are to share with us, we are all on the same side, Mr. Summers. We're all doing everything in our power to get your daughter back. Then why isn't she home? A click in her ear as Colin Summers hung up, clearly having gotten in the last word. Didi held onto the phone receiver for a moment longer, feeling the weight of his rage. Indeed, three months later, why hadn't they found Stacy Summers? And what the hell did Flora Dane know about the college girl's abduction that the rest of them apparently didn't? 8.30 a.m., Dee Dee had mounds of reports to sort through and approve from the night duty detectives on down. The joys of management, the burden of restricted duty. As a field detective, She'd always groused about the need to dot every I and cross every T. And yet reports mattered. Paperwork created the building blocks of a prosecutable case. And there was no point in identifying perpetrators and making arrests if you couldn't actually put the rat bastards away. Paperwork mattered. Sitting here at this desk mattered. And again, so did asking the right questions. What was it Dr. Keynes had said yesterday? Flora preferred an honest, straightforward approach. Dee Dee got up, retrieved her messenger bag, grabbed her travel mug, and headed out the door. Florence Dane's registered address turned out to be a third-story walk-up in an older, slightly tired-looking row home. This time of morning on a Sunday, the house and street appeared quiet. Dee Dee walked through the unlocked outer door into the requisite inner vestibule lined with half a dozen metal mailboxes. Some were labeled with names. Flores wasn't, instead providing only her initials, F.D. 
another security-conscious decision from a woman who clearly took self-protection seriously. The vestibule's inner door was locked, but, as often happened in frequently trafficked areas, hadn't been pulled tightly shut. Flora definitely wouldn't have approved of Didi's ability to nudge open the door and walk straight in. She could buzz up. It would be the polite thing to do. But where was the fun in that? Instead, Dee Dee spied the stairs straight ahead and made the executive decision to hike up three floors to Florence's apartment. Of course, she hadn't counted on her breath growing quite so labored. Maybe it was time to cut back the hours in PT and work in some cardio instead. Nor was she expecting to arrive at Flora's door and discover it cracked open. Dee Dee hesitated, already feeling the hairs rise on the back of her neck. At first blush... There was no need for alarm. The door looked perfectly fine. No scratches on the locks, as if they were jimmied. No shredded door jam. And yet, she rapped hard. The door yawned wide. Flora Dane? Sergeant Detective Didi Warren here to see you. No response. Didi took the first step forward, reaching instinctively for her sidearm, for remembering she still wasn't authorized to carry. Flora? You home? Florence Dane. Nothing. Not the sound of footsteps or rushing water or creaking in her doorways. Dee Dee took another step inside, encountering a kitchen dead ahead, tiny family room to the left, and another open doorway that provided a glimpse of a bedroom beyond it. Lights were off. Granted, daylight streamed through the large bank of bay windows. But the sky was overcast, meaning corners of the apartment were still cast in gloom, giving the place a neglected feel. More than that, however, the apartment felt empty. For whatever reason, the front door had been left open, but Florence was no longer here. Which made no sense at all. A woman who made studying criminal behavior her bread and butter, leaving her apartment unsecured in downtown Boston? No way. Something was up. But what? Slowly, keeping her back to the wall, Dee Dee made the rounds, Except, in the end, there wasn't much to see. The kitchen appeared immaculate, the modest seating area untouched. She used her toe to push in the bathroom door, taking in a pedestal sink, toilet, and standing room only shower. Nothing. Finally, the single bedroom, again using her foot to open the door wider, careful not to touch anything. She spied a double bed, covers pulled back and obviously recently slept in. Next to it was a single nightstand table bearing a lamp and a charging iPhone, which gave her pause. Because in this day and age, who stepped out for even the briefest errand without first grabbing her cell phone? Next, Dee Dee eyed a rickety old desk, which bore a state-of-the-art Mac laptop. Finally, she let her gaze take in the room's main attraction, newspaper articles, photographs, dozens of them plastered across all four walls. It took her only a moment to deduce the theme. Missing persons cases, each and every one. Thirty, forty, fifty people, male and female, who'd stepped outside one day never to be seen again, including Stacy Summers. The Boston Globe article announcing her disappearance posted in a place of honor right above Flora's bed. Definitely, Flora had been following the case. And now, Dee Dee circled in place, taking in the full weight of one survivor's obsession. And she suddenly had a very bad feeling about things. Chapter 14 When I was little, I had a hard time falling asleep. I would spend my days running wild across the fields of my family's farm and through the dark Maine woods. And yet no matter how often my mom ordered me outside to burn it off, come nightfall, I'd lie in bed with a spinning brain and twitchy legs. My mother developed an elaborate bedtime ritual to help wind me down. First, she'd place both hands on the top of my head. She'd gently stroke my hair. This is Flora's head. Then she'd move her fingers down trace the shape of my eyebrow, the curve of my ears, the line of my jaw. These are Flora's eyes, cheeks, ears, 
face. This is Flora's face. Next, she'd squeeze both my shoulders, not too hard, but firm. These are Flora's shoulders. More squeezing of both elbows, my wrists, all five fingers of each hand. Compression, I later learned. My mother was practicing a basic therapy often used for hyperactive children. Basically a joint-by-joint -joint bear hug as she squeezed my ribs, pressed against the sockets of my hips, then finished with my knees, ankles, feet. This is Flora's leg, Flora's knee, Flora's ankle. This is Flora's foot. And now it's time for all of Flora to get some sleep. When I was little, I would giggle at the end. And of course, I would beg her to do it again. Sometimes she would. But mostly I got a peck on the cheek, maybe an affectionate tousle of my hair. Then my mother was up and out, a busy single mom with many worries to tend and chores to complete. By the time I turned 10, 11, 12, the ritual died a natural death. Another stage from childhood passed through. Sometimes, when I was sick or feeling blue, my mother would return again, a quicker, abbreviated version, but just as comforting. Once I hit high school, my mother teased it was now my turn to tuck her into bed. Being someone who regularly started her day at five, she certainly didn't stay up much past nine or ten. Sometimes, if I was feeling mischievous, or maybe just missed her, I would show up and make a big production of it. This is Mom's hair. This is Mom's eye. Oh, my God! What happened to Mom's face? If my brother was home, he might even join us. Holy crap! Is that really Mom's hand? Before long, the three of us would have collapsed with a fit of giggles, my mother at the bottom of the pile, shaking her head. Moments of a family. The kind of thing that somewhere in your heart you know is special, and yet you can't help but take for granted. After I was found, my mother arrived at the Atlanta hospital. That first night, she touched my hair, traced the line of my brow, followed the curve of my ear, this is Flora's face, she whispered to me. I didn't look at her. I kept my eyes open, my gaze fixed on the ceiling. I didn't have the heart to tell her that her hands felt like sandpaper against my skin, and that, far from soothing me, I wished desperately, with every fiber in my being, that she'd just stop. And yet in the weeks and months to come, on the very bad nights when I woke up screaming again and again and my brother hovered uncomfortably in the doorway, my mother would take her place on the edge of my bed. She'd once again trace my cheekbones, squeeze my shoulders, compress the joint of my elbows, wrists, all five fingers of each hand. Slowly but surely, my patient mother would help me find slumber again. I am asleep now, but it is wrong, bad. I need to wake up. I have a sense of urgency, dread, a bad dream. I'm having a bad dream and I need to wake up now, scream, yell, thrash. Then my eyes will pop open. I will find myself back in my own bed. My mother will be beside me, rubbing my temples even as I flinch. I'm moving. I shouldn't be moving. Wake up, Flora, wake up. I try. I will my eyelids to roll up. I order my limbs to jerk to life. Nothing happens. I can't move. I can't see. I can't find my way back to the safety of my locked apartment or my childhood bed. A mist. I feel it cool against my cheeks. I inhale instinctively, wrinkling my nose at the smell. And then, I am rushing away into the dark. My mother disappears from view, and even if her touch feels like sandpaper, even if I'm the one who constantly pushes her away, I still wish I could call her back. I need to tell her something. I need to say I'm sorry. 
Wake up, Flora, wake up. But I can't. I'm moving. I shouldn't be moving. I am in trouble. Chapter 15 Flora's cell phone was password protected. No surprises there. Instead, Diddy used her own phone to make the call. Boston FBI field office, requesting one Dr. Samuel Keynes. It took another three minutes for the operator to take her seriously enough to track down a federal employee on a Sunday. One more minute for Keynes to return her call. From there, however, the rest was a matter of seconds. Yes, he'd returned Flora to her apartment on Saturday. And no, she would never leave her apartment unlocked. He'd be right over. Which didn't surprise Dee Dee at all. She didn't know much about victim specialists and their interactions with their charges, but it already had struck her that Keynes and Flora had an unusually close relationship. Dee Dee had just finished conducting a visual tour of the outside of the apartment, as well as an inspection of the fire escape, when Keynes pulled up. Keynes was wearing the same knee-length, double-breasted cashmere coat as the day before. How he'd gotten it dry clean so fast, she'd never know, but it didn't contain the faintest whiff of human barbecue or rancid garbage. Maybe he'd simply willed the odor away. Walking up to the building now, shoulders set, gaze direct, he had that look about him, the kind of guy who could take over the world through sheer presence alone. He also appeared grim. When did you arrive? he asked. Thirty minutes ago. When you dropped Flora off yesterday, did you go inside? No, her mom was already here. I spotted her truck parked down the street. Flora headed upstairs to see her. Has Flora contacted you since? Phone, text, Facebook post? He shook his head. Sign of forced entry? He headed up the stairs, already on his way to the third-story unit. Negative. Fire escape also appears clear, but get this. That door is also unlocked. The bolt's been undone. Same with all the windows. Each and every one of them may still be closed, but they're unsecured. Well, sounds like a message. He was frowning. My thought exactly. But from her or about her? Topping the stairs, Kane strode straight into the apartment, clearly familiar with the layout. He glanced around only briefly, then stated, Definitely, her mother was here. What makes you say that? Rosa cleans when under stress. The kitchen? That's her doing. And Florence? More relaxed in her housekeeping standards, prone to clutter. So, you dropped her off yesterday. She came upstairs to her mother, and then? Keynes produced his phone from his coat pocket. He had a number while still walking around the gray-lit space. Rosa, Dr. Keynes, how are you? I'm fine, thanks for asking. You spent some time with Flora yesterday, didn't you? I thought I saw your truck parked down the street. Exactly. I understand. I, I know. Her behavior does appear to be escalating. Yes, thank heaven she was all right. Her staying at the farm is an old argument, Rosa. You know I can't intervene. Not that it would make a difference with Florence anyway. Did you speak to Flora again last night? Maybe before bedtime? Oh, you called, but she didn't answer. Thank you. I'll do my best to follow up with her today. But of course. Pleasure to speak to you again. Bye. Keynes pocketed his phone, once again frowned. Florence's mother left her shortly after one yesterday. She hasn't heard from Flora since. That unusual? Not necessarily. But the unlocked apartment is. He walked into the bedroom, glanced at the plastered walls, but didn't seem surprised by the onslaught of articles. Instead, he headed for Flora's phone. Password protected, he observed so no way of checking the messages immediately. It's possible she headed out to meet someone. And left her front door open behind her? No sign of forced entrance, or signs of a struggle. Given Flora's training, if someone had tried to grab her, she wouldn't have gone down without a fight. Unless she was ambushed. Maybe while she was sleeping. Dee Dee gestured to the bed, which bore the only signs of disturbance in the whole place. But how would the attacker gain entrance? Flora would have definitely checked the lock before heading to bed. Dee Dee sighed. That was the piece of the puzzle that kept stumping her as well. She'd only just met Florence Dane yesterday, 
but she already knew enough to know the girl was hardly foolish about these things. Let's check with the landlords, Keynes decided. Maybe they heard something. The landlords turned out to be an elderly couple, Mary and James Reichter, who'd owned the residence for the past 52 years and lived in the first floor unit. They recognized Keynes from other visits and greeted Dee Dee with beaming smiles that made her feel like she should have come bearing some kind of housewarming gift. She and Keynes politely declined their offer of coffee, but still found themselves ushered into the front parlor, which bore an antique love seat and enough original oak trim to make Dee Dee salivate. She perched tentatively on the edge of the delicate sofa, letting Keynes take the lead with the questions, as he seemed to know the couple. It took some loud, if not downright shouted, inquiries to determine the Reichters had seen Flora return home yesterday, sometime around mid-morning. Her mother had already arrived by then, showing up again after lunch with some blueberry muffins to share. Excellent, excellent muffins. Rosa was an exquisite baker. Oh, yes, Flora. No, they did not remember seeing her again. But then, they'd been watching their shows in the back of the unit. So she could have gone out. Possible. Was anything wrong? Something they should know? Keynes trod carefully. He had a delicate touch with the couple, Dee Dee observed more neighborly than official, and yet at the same time keeping just enough reserve to have them striving to answer his questions. Had they seen anyone else enter the building yesterday, say, a stranger, someone they didn't recognize? No. What about sounds or commotions? Maybe a disturbance in the middle of the night? No, sir, and they would have been woken up by such a thing. Didn't sleep so well these days. What about new friends or acquaintances they'd recently seen with Flora, or any inquiries about her apartment. Well, except for the building inspector. Dee Dee and Keynes both drew up, exchanged a glance. Building inspector? Dee Dee spoke up. Day before, or maybe the day before the day before. Time gets a little confusing, James began, looking at his wife. Tuesday, his wife provided. The building inspector came on Tuesday said our place was overdue for review. All private rental units have to be inspected by the city every five years, you know. Why, it's been ages since anyone's visited us. Guess we really do lose track of time. You showed him around the entire building, all the units? Keynes asked. James showed him around the outside, the fire escape. But inside the units, well, navigating the stairs at our age... Mary smiled apologetically. We gave him keys to the units, asked him to please knock first to alert the renters. He wasn't gone long at all, did his thing, then came down to tell us all looked well. We'd get our updated certificate shortly. Wait, Diddy interjected. You have keys to all the units, even Flora Dane's apartment? James seemed insulted by her tone. Of course, this is still our home. We are entitled to access. Plus, for the sake of maintenance, or, heaven forbid, something like a fire. Our renters, they're very busy. It's easier if we can just go in, do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. We've never had any complaints or problems, not even from Flora. We respect her privacy, of course. We understand. The way he said the last word implied enough that they knew Flora's history and were familiar with why she felt a need for extra security. Was Flora home for the building inspection? Dee Dee asked. I don't know, dear, Mary answered. Did you tell her about the inspection? Mention it when you saw her again. No, I don't believe we've run into her since it happened. What did the building inspector look like? Keynes asked. Oh, he was a nice-looking young man, dressed a little casual for my tastes, Tan slacks, a blue dress shirt, but then no one wears suits anymore. He had ID. I'm not naive, you know. I did make him show it. What about his size? Dee Dee spoke up more softly. Big guy? Small? Young? Old? Oh, he was very official looking. Clean shaven. Short, dark hair. And big. Strong. Like a fireman. He looked like a very capable young man. Mary smiled brightly. A big man, 
a strong man, who'd been handed over the keys to Flora's apartment by her well-intentioned landlords. Diddy looked over at Keynes, could tell from the expression on his face he just connected the same dots she had, such as all the best locks in the world couldn't offer protection against a man with a key. Flora took pride in her preparations, and yet, if their suspicions were correct, her attacker had already been one step ahead. Keynes rose to standing, offering his hand, finalizing their departure. Out in the foyer, phone in hand, it only took Dee Dee a matter of minutes to confirm what both she and Keynes already knew. Boston's Inspectional Services Department hadn't sent anyone to this building in the past few days, let alone had anything scheduled for any time soon. The building inspector guise had been a ruse, a very effective means of gaining access to Flora's keys in order to make a master copy. I'll call the crime scene, Tex, Dee Dee said quietly. They headed back upstairs to wait in silence. Chapter 16 I'm awake. My head jerks up. My eyes pop open. But I'm immediately disoriented by the fact I can't see. Black. Thick and impenetrable. I feel a sense of urgency. Fight or flight. I gotta fight. Except, I can't see. Not at all. Up, down, left, right, I have no idea. I bulge my eyes as if that'll make a difference. Then it comes to me. I'm in a room. I'm sprawled upon a bare mattress, wearing some kind of silky nightgown. My arms are bare, and cool metal bracelets encircle both my wrists. Handcuffs. I've been handcuffed, arms in front, hands at my waist. Furthermore, the manacles appear attached to a lead line of some sort, maybe rope, maybe chain. But I only have to give the slightest tug with my wrists to feel the corresponding resistance. I'm not just bound, I'm tethered to the ceiling or a high spot on the wall. As for the dark, I blink my eyes. Nothing. I try again. Still nothing. My eyes are open. There's no blindfold around my head. It's the room itself. Windowless and, most likely, painted pitch black until not a single ray of ambient light can penetrate the gloom. I wonder if I'm underground, and despite my best intentions, my heart rate accelerates, my breath growing ragged. Not underground. Not buried. Please, please, please. And for a moment, a split instant of time, other images come to me. Scenes from the past, another lifetime, another nightmare ago. I want to yell, scream and beg, bang my fists against wooden walls, kick my heels wildly. Lying on the mattress, shivering uncontrollably, I dig my teeth into my lower lip, then ground myself with the pain. There will be no panic. There will be no pleading. So stuff it. It takes a few deep breaths, the taste of my own blood against my tongue. But bit by bit, I feel my heart once again settle in my chest. Then I close my eyes, because whether it's logical or not, it makes the dark easier to take. Slowly, it comes to me, my last memory, waking up in my own bedroom, the sinister shadow in the doorway, then a mist in the air. Chloroform, I'm guessing, or some other aerosolized sedative. I was drugged, and then a sense of movement. I wanted to wake up, but I couldn't. I was brought here, wherever here is. Immediately, I'm dismayed, not for myself. Instead, I see my mother's face, the mother who baked me muffins and hugged me hard and begged me to take better care of myself. She loves me so much, and now I've gone and broken her heart yet again. Because I'm already pretty certain that whoever broke through three locks to get into my security-tight apartment, let alone prepared this room, complete with chained manacles, is more than your average bear. This isn't me versus the arrogant loser I burned to death in his own garage, or even the amateur acts who preceded him. This is something worse, something more, someone to fear. And I wish, for just one moment, I've been brave enough to tell Dr. Keynes everything that happened five years ago. But there are secrets all survivors keep. Most likely, I'm about to pay for mine, just like Stacy Summers did.
I fall asleep. I don't want to, but I can't seem to help myself. The residue of the drugs, maybe even habit forged years ago, when I also spent hours, days, weeks at a time with nothing better to do. Fight or flight, except being all trussed up on a bare mattress, I can't do either. So sleep becomes a flight of sorts, a temporary reprieve from my overworked limbic system, which can't figure out what else to do. So much adrenaline, stress, and fear with no place to go, nothing to do but wait, 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 wait. Wishing my eyes would grow accustomed to the dark, wishing for any sort of ease in the relentless tar-black gloom. After a while, I give up on sight and focus on touch instead. Moving tentatively, I dance my fingers across the mattress, identify its size, standard twin, feel the welting of the edges, become aware of a faint odor of mildew. It's thin beneath me, most likely old and tattered, maybe even tossed on a street corner, then harvested by my host for just this purpose. It's not particularly comfortable or soft or soothing, but I like this mattress. It's a source of thread and stuffing, maybe even wire coils. It's a tool, and I'll take it. Next, I explore the garment now draped over my body. I'd gone to bed in an old T-shirt and men's flannel boxers. Now I'm wearing some kind of short satin negligee, lace trim around the neckline and bottom hem. He changed my clothes. While I was unconscious, he'd stripped off my comfortable nightwear and replaced it with a more feminine, sexy counterpart. I'm tempted to feel insulted and violated by this act, but mostly I'm confused. Most sexual sadist predators keep their victims naked. Easy access, further degradation, take your pick. Or they might clad their unwilling prey in various S&M outfits slash gadgets that fit their masochistic fantasies. But this, a silk nighty, speaks to something else. It's attentive in a way I already have a feeling I won't like. Jacob rarely gifted me with pretty nightgowns or anything more than practical clothes. I was a possession, and who wastes extra effort on their coffee table? This man, the newest predator, is a freak. I repeat the word in my head, try to feel it forcefully. A freak, a mutant, an aberration, something less than human, nothing worth worrying about. But I'm lying to myself, because already I can feel the metal handcuffs cutting into my skin, and when I tug on my wrists to make my arms more comfortable, I'm terribly aware of the sound of a tethering chain unspooling from above. Enough. I sit up, swing my legs over the edge of the mattress on the floor, remind myself this is already more freedom than I had with Jacob. Wow, a whole room at my disposal. I might just get giddy with the rush. The dark is still endless, oppressive. I can barely make out the lighter shadow of my bare arms as I take the first tentative step forward. One step, two, three, four. The room is bigger than I expected. I still haven't come to a wall. Then my foot connects with substance, a rattling sound as a plastic container tips over. I reach down and explore with my fingers, but I already know what I found. A plastic bucket, the latrine of choice for kidnappers and sadists everywhere. But of course... Behind the bucket, I discover a wall, drywall. It surprises me. For some reason, I've been expecting cinder block or maybe cheap wood paneling. But no, the wall is smooth and bare. Drywall is in a real room of a real house, which would also explain the thin carpet padding my bare feet. If I really am in a house, I halt, strain my ears, trying to get a sense of traffic outside or maybe the distant sound of footsteps echoing overhead. At first, I hear nothing at all. Soundproofing, to go with the blackout paint job. But then, faintly, steadily, it comes to me. Breathing. In, out. In, out. There's someone else in the room with me. I'm not alone. I recoil. I can't help myself. Then instinctively, I grab the empty plastic bucket and clutch it to my chest. As what? A hammer or a shield? I'm not thinking anymore. I want to. But for all my experience, training, and bravado, 
My heart rate has once again climbed, and I'm shaking uncontrollably on my feet, while across the room, maybe five, six feet from me, breathing, in, out, in, out. He's here, watching me, waiting for me to panic, freak out, beg for mercy, or just enjoying the show. Just like that, I'm angry. I don't care what he does or what he thinks he can do to me. Compared to Jacob Ness, Mr. Silky Nightgown, Mr. Breathing Heavy, is nothing but a carnival sideshow, a freak. Just because he broke into my triple-locked apartment, ambushed me with drugs, and spirited me away to some blacked-out dungeon, I refuse to be afraid of him. Instead, I'm thinking of my first visit with Samuel, the day after I got out of the hospital. Do you remember what you did to survive, Flora? Every rebellion, every submission, every lie, every adaptation. My own slow nod. Good. Don't forget. Don't second guess. Accept. It may not feel like it right now, but you're strong, Flora. You survived. Don't let anyone take that from you. And don't take it from yourself. You're a tough girl. 472 days later, you saved yourself. Based on that alone, you never need to feel frightened again. I set down the bucket. I focus on the sound of his even breathing. Slowly but surely, I match it to my own until I inhale as he inhales, then exhale as he exhales. In, out. In, out. We are breath for breath, perfectly pitched. And I understand already, in this introductory battle of wills, the person who speaks first loses. He'll move. I'm certain of it. No one goes to this much trouble just to watch. So I fix my gaze in the direction of his breathing, and I stare as hard and defiantly as I can. Come on, freak. Show me what you've got. In, out. In, out. I've never heard such even breathing, without the slightest quickening from excitement or a missed beat from shock. Just in, out, in, out. As if he really doesn't care that I'm upright and staring straight at him. As if he really is that much in control. With all the time in the world. My own breathing hitches. I don't mean to. Hate to give him the satisfaction. But the steady, even beat is getting to me. No one breathes that regularly. No one in this situation can possibly keep that calm. Then, suddenly, a dawning realization. A slowly shuddering fear. No, I don't want... Please not. I can't help myself. Having had the thought, now I must know. Shuffling forward, one step, two, three, four. My toe hits it first. I stop, freeze in my tracks, and focus my ears once again. Breathing, much closer now, but just as steady. In, out, in, out. I extend my arms, order myself to be strong, remind myself I've already been through the worst, I can handle anything. Still, as my fingers encounter the first wooden edge of the coffin-shaped box, while from inside comes the continued sound of the occupant's steady breath, in, out, in, out, sleeping, because what else is there to do when trapped in a dark wooden box? I close my eyes. It doesn't help. I can still hear her breathing. My fellow abductee, his prior victim. In, out, in, out. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. I am not afraid, I hear myself whisper. But in my mind, I can see Jacob, and he is laughing again. Chapter 17 Newbie detective Carol Manley was the first to arrive at Flora's apartment. But if she seemed surprised to discover her superior actually on site, 
She did a good job of disguising it. Phil and Neil followed shortly after, and then the party really got started. District detectives were assigned to canvas the neighborhood and interview available residents for any possible witnesses to Flora Dane's recent comings and goings, while a sketch artist would be sent to visit the landlords. Carol volunteered to pull security video from the corner store, as well as peruse local traffic cams for any sighting of Flora. Given the volume of footage, however, they needed to narrow down the timeline of Flora's disappearance in order to be more efficient. Phil did the honors of searching her computer, while Neil placed a call to the girl's cellular provider and credit card companies. Unfortunately, Flora's network browser didn't show any activity for the past 36 hours, since shortly before she headed out for her ill-fated adventure with the predatory bartender. Her cell registered only a single call from her mom the evening before, while her credit card hadn't been used in a week. Frugal of her, but not helpful for moments like this. Dee Dee prowled the tiny apartment, feeling restless. Keynes was tucked in a corner, mobile phone pressed against his ear. He'd agreed to fill in the mom, not a job Dee Dee envied. Like most major cities, Boston had electronic eyes everywhere. From business cams to traffic cams to ATM cams, every street, every corner yielded possible surveillance opportunities. In theory, this should produce a bonanza of information for investigators. Except that was exactly the problem. There was too much footage, and much of it low-quality resolution. Meaning security footage worked best when used backward, First, formulate what you think there is to see, at what time it most likely happened, and then go look for it. So what exactly went down in this security-tight apartment? Yesterday, late morning, Dr. Keynes dropped off Flora outside. Her mother was already upstairs, had made muffins. She fed them to her daughter. They caught up briefly. So, Mom, about last night, how did such a conversation go? And what did Rosa Dane think of her daughter's late-night escapades? Diddy stood in the kitchen. She pictured herself as the mom, baking muffins. She pictured Flora walking through the door, clad in second-hand Boston PD sweats and covered in garbage. She remembered the smell that had coated her own skin from the crime scene, then, with a short nod, headed for the bathroom. Sure enough, on the back of the door hung a bath towel, still damp, she removed the lid from the wicker clothes hamper, tucked in a corner, and immediately wrinkled her nose at the stench. Garbage-scented Boston PD sweats, check. So, among Flora's first order of business upon returning home would have been to clean up. And then? Girl had been up 24 hours at that point. She would have been tired as well as hungry. According to witness statements, she'd been drinking at the bar, not eating. Dee was biased on the subject, but given a choice between eating and sleeping, she'd go with eating any day of the week, especially given that Flora's mother would have been waiting for her in the kitchen with the scent of homemade muffins wafting in the air. Following that instinct, Dee Dee returned to the kitchen. This time, she discovered a gallon-sized freezer bag tucked in the corner containing six blueberry muffins, the leftovers, she would guess, and they still looked delicious. Next, she checked the refrigerator, where she discovered a brand new jug of orange juice and a bowl of recently cut up fruit. Edges of the apples were just starting to brown, so she was willing to bet they came from yesterday's snack with the mom as well. As for the other contents, she pulled out some takeout containers, sniffed experimentally, recoiled. Best she could tell, Flora had one edible meal in her whole kitchen, and that was the food supplied by mom, which meant... She never ate dinner, Dee Dee stated out loud. Pardon? Dr. Keynes had come up behind her. He still wore his coat, though it was now unbuttoned. How he didn't sweat, given the stuffy confines of the small space, she'd never know. Yesterday, Flora returned home, showered, ate with her mom a late breakfast, early lunch, brunch. Sure, muffins and fruit, brunch. But that was it. I mean, unless she went out, which given the lack of credit card activity, let alone her own state of mind, she would have rested, post-adrenaline crash. Okay. But she ate with her mom, what, one or two in the afternoon? Rosa confirmed she left shortly after one. So most likely she would have lain down for a nap. Too early in the day to go to bed, bed. 
Kane shrugged one shoulder. Given the large windows, the overall brightness of the space, I suspect she would retire to her room to rest. You mean the shrine to kidnapping victims everywhere? Another elegant shrug. He turned and headed for Flora's bedroom. Dee Dee followed behind him. Like the rest of the apartment, the room was small. The newspaper articles plastered all over the walls offered its main distinction. Otherwise, just the modest desk and the rumpled bed, which definitely appeared to have been slept in. Diddy pushed by Kane's larger build, which nearly filled the narrow space, to cross to the bed. She leaned over the thin pillow, sniffed experimentally. When she looked up again, she spotted Kane studying her. Searching for chloroform, she provided. It has a distinct smell, which takes a bit to fade. Might be traces on the pillow. Or maybe that's just my imagination. He would have to subdue her quickly, Kane said. Otherwise, given Flora's training... Where are the signs of a struggle? He had a point there. The apartment appeared relatively untouched, one of the more unsettling things about the situation. And indeed, given what Flora was capable of. He had already made a key for the locks. It was possible he was already inside, waiting for her. Not likely. Rosa was here for several hours before Flora returned home. When Rosa is anxious, she doesn't just cook, she cleans. And if she was puttering around, tidying up this small space, Didi filled in, where could an intruder hide that she wouldn't have seen? Exactly. Didi nodded, following the train of logic. All right, so first Rosa arrives at the apartment, lets herself in, does her thing. Then you drop off Flora. Mom and daughter catch up, exchange words. She eyed Kane's expectantly, but he refused to take the bait. Apparently, he either didn't know what Rosa had said to her daughter, which Dee Dee didn't believe for a minute, or he didn't feel it was relevant to the investigation. Mom departs shortly after one, at which point we know Flora didn't make any calls and didn't use her computer or credit cards, which leaves us with... She took a nap. Dee Dee liked it. Certainly, in her experience, unconsciousness was about the only thing that kept a younger person from his or her electronics. When she woke up, she said gazing at the rumpled bed. He was here, already in the room, already standing over her. Because this is where he chloroformed her, Kane said. Yeah. And she never ate again. I mean, up all night, then returning to muffins and fruit. I gotta say, first thing upon waking, I would have been famished. I'm told you're a woman who appreciates an all-you-can-eat buffet. Checking up on me, shrink man? You've been told correctly. Kane's ignored her sarcasm, staying focused on the matter at hand. He already had a key made, meaning he could enter the apartment at any time. Didi shook her head. He wouldn't go after her in daytime. Come on. The kind of guy who takes the time to copy a key is the kind of guy who does his homework. Given Flora's rap sheet, not a matter of public record. He would have done some digging. That whole ruse, posing as a building inspector? This guy has patience. He would have taken proper precautions to abduct a target as high risk as Flora, not to mention... This is the third floor walk-up unit. She puts up a fight. The other occupants would come out to the stairwell to discover what's going on. Didi paused, considered the matter. He needs it to be dark, she reiterated. Otherwise, he's too exposed. Think about it. He can't use a rickety metal fire escape without calling attention to himself, meaning he had to have used the main stairs just like the rest of us. Does the building have a camera? Former residential home? No, we're not that lucky but consider his options. He knows he can get into the apartment. He's planning on ambushing Flora, rendering her unconscious, which means he then has to carry her out. Carrying an unconscious body down three flights of stairs is pretty noticeable. So he'd pick a time after dark, when most residents wouldn't be coming or going. He watched the apartment, got to know the routines. Yeah, consistent with someone patient enough to scam himself a set of keys. He'd also be watching Flora, getting to know her routines. Kane's provided. Dee Dee nodded. She pushed her way back into the main living area, where she crossed to one of the front-facing windows. She drew back the filmy curtains Flora seemed to favor, the kind of gauzy affair that offered some privacy, while also still permitting plenty of light, and peered out onto the street. We should investigate vantage points, she murmured. Maybe even a new tenant in the surrounding area. If our theory is correct... Our guy would have had to have been hanging out for a while in order to learn everything he needed to learn. Permit parking. 
Keynes commented. Didi nodded, having noticed the signs earlier. Meaning parking on these streets was restricted to locals who had to prove residency in order to gain a parking pass. Those who parked without one risked being ticketed. Something else to have a local detective check out. Because their suspect definitely would have parked close in order to escape with an unconscious woman. Meaning, if he didn't have the proper permits, they might find a trace of a parking ticket. Does Flora have a car? She asked Keynes, as it was possible the kidnapper had stolen Flora's own vehicle for transport. No. All right. So we're talking early nightfall, not so late that Flora had woken up and eaten dinner, but not so early that it was still light out, say, 5.36. Seems like a high traffic hour, Keynes observed. Risks the other residents coming and going from work. Unless that's how he does it. Didi paused, the idea grabbing hold. Social engineering, that's his thing, right? Pretend to be a building inspector in order to get a key. Maybe he dressed up for yesterday's event as well. Boyfriend, taxi driver, escorting an unconscious woman from her apartment. Keynes raised an eyebrow. Well, EMT, home health worker. She glanced at him. Local cop? An occupation that could easily explain the situation, assuming he was noticed. Then he'd simply brazen his way through, walk straight down the stairs with his drunk or sick or groggy female companion. In a neighborhood as high traffic as this one, simply acting as if you belong is half the battle. Keynes nodded. Officers should canvas for neighbors who were out and about yesterday around dusk. See if anyone noticed a particularly large guy who appeared to be assisting an impaired woman, maybe an official worker of some kind who blatantly stood out. A particularly large guy, just like Stacy Summers' kidnapper. Didi glanced at him. Did you know Flora's mom is a mentor for Stacy's parents? Rosa mentioned it. Flora seems to have taken an interest in the case as well. As you can tell from the bedroom wall, Flora is interested in a good many cases. Yeah, but she's looking for Stacy Summers' abductor in particular. The way she spoke at the crime scene yesterday. That's who she was hoping to discover at the bar. And immediately, she drew a connection between that case and her own attacker. Do you know why she does it? Keynes asked softly. Why Flora continues to put herself in dangerous situations. Didi shrugged. Adrenaline rush? Post-traumatic stress? Some... God syndrome, where she enjoys reveling in her own power after 400-plus days of feeling powerless. I don't know, Kane said, which surprised her. I doubt Flora knows why she's doing what she's doing either. Or at least can put her finger on one particular stressor. Who she reminds me of is of a soldier who returns home from her tour of duty, only to re-up again and then again. At the end of the day... Real life feels too alien, while knowing the war is still going on, that she has brothers out there still fighting. Is that what those articles are? Didi asked. Her brothers in arms, the missing people she can't leave behind. Maybe. Do you think there's a connection between Flora's disappearance and Stacy Summers' kidnapping? Keynes didn't answer as much as he hesitated. Didi did a little double take letting a curtain drop and stepping away from the window. You do, don't you? When Flora's landlady, Mrs. Reichter, described the building inspector, my first thought was the Stacy Summers abduction video, not to mention three months later. There were no leads, no additional witness statements, no new information in that case. You have to admit, it takes a particular kind of predator to pull that off. You mean such as the kind of guy who would pose as a building inspector to copy a set of keys. And the idea crossed my mind. Plus, the front door of Flora's apartment being left open, all the windows unlocked. It feels to me, whoever did this, he's showing off, bragging even, which would make sense if this isn't the first time he's gotten away with something. Did he arch to brow? She didn't know exactly what to make of Keynes's suspicions, even if he was on to something, given how little they knew about Stacy Summers' disappearance, linking Flora's case to hers hardly helped them. What they needed was a detailed sketch provided by the elderly landlords downstairs. Then, they needed half a dozen witness statements tracking the perpetrator's trek through the neighborhood, plus a parking ticket issued to the evildoer's personal vehicle. Short of that, Didi turned toward the window again. Is it possible we have it all wrong? 
Flora wasn't kidnapped at all, but simply broke under the stress of the past 24 hours and ran off. No, because she wouldn't leave her cell phone behind or her personal computer, yada, yada, yada. No, because she wouldn't do that to her mother. Dee Dee sighed again. Everything about this case already hurt her, and she had a feeling it was only going to get worse. I need to talk to Rosa, both about her daughter, but also her involvement with the Summers family. If I might make a recommendation. Dee Dee shot Keynes a look. By all means. I don't think you should question Rosa just yet. If anyone knows about the family dynamics and the latest developments, it's Pam Mason, the Summers' victim advocate. You want insights? Speak to her first. Chapter 18 Would you like to know how to avoid abject terror? How to fight nighttime chills, the fear of the bogeyman under the bed? How to sleep like an angel? Or walk down dark alleyways with a spring in your step? Do you want to know how to be me? First, you find the void. It's a place everyone has deep, deep inside themselves. That spot no one can touch. I have it on expert testimony that some find it through meditation or Zen retreats or the diligent pursuit of mindfulness. Let's just say I discovered the void under different circumstances. But everyone has it. A place where you stand in silence. A place that permits you to be untouched even in a crowded room. A place where you are utterly, totally, simply, terrifyingly alone. Once you are there, no one can hurt you. And once no one can hurt you, you never have to be afraid again. It's the darkness that gets to me. I keep thinking that my eyes will adjust, that there will be a lessening of the gloom, but no. The pitch black depths remain absolute. I hold out my bound hands time and time again to test. I still can't see them. I'm left in a land of sound and feel, so I put both to good use. I don't understand the purpose of the tethering chain connected to the handcuffs around my wrists. Best I can tell, I have full range of the room, so it's hardly limiting access. Is it to keep me from bounding through a suddenly opened door, racing toward the light? I don't know. Then force myself to put it from my mind. Motives aren't worth worrying about yet. Tangibles are. I explore the room. Nine steps form the width, side to side. Twelve long strides provide the length. Contents appear to be three items. A twin-size mattress, flat on the floor, covered in a simple cotton blanket. A standard-issue plastic bucket, sans handle. And a coffin-sized box. I still hear breathing. Slow and even. In and out. In and out. It becomes the background noise for my endeavors like the sound of ocean waves, the rhythm of my heartbeat. I already hate it. Windows, three of them. With my fingertips, I can make out the trim. Two upon one wall, both modest in size. Singles, I believe you'd call them. Classic New England architecture. The larger window is on the wall across from them, twice as wide as it is tall. Its dimensions remind me more of a mirror. When I run my fingers along it, I feel cool glass. In contrast, the smaller windows across from it are textured and rough, as if painted or otherwise obscured. I try to scratch at the coating with my fingernails, but can't make a dent. So not residential paint, but maybe something more industrial, such as powder coating or enamel. These windows must be outer windows, thickly covered, hence my lack of light. As for the larger, unpainted glass surface across from them, I'm guessing that's an internal wall, which doesn't make sense for such a large picture window. Unless, of course, it's not a window at all. A one-way mirror? That's what I'm thinking. I can't be certain, of course, but why construct such an elaborate setting for his playthings if not to watch the festivities inside? I'm sure it's only a matter of time before the lights come on, blinding, disorienting. And the unsub, ask Samuel. That's unidentified subject, in FBI speak. We'll take advantage of the chaos to check in on his charges. Or maybe he's watching even now. 
military-issued night vision goggles, anything is possible. You must understand. Whatever demented thing you're too scared to consider, that's exactly what they're already fantasizing about it. The big bads out there. Denial won't help you. Suppression won't save you. Best to meet it head on. Understand the enemy. Accept their depravities. Then find the void and soldier on. Breathing. Still so relentlessly even. In, out, in, out. How can she remain asleep? How can she not hear me bumbling around in the dark, tripping over the mattress, stubbing my toe against a wall here, the box there? I can't think about the coffin-sized box. I can't consider its possibilities, its contents. If I do, I lose the void. Because I'm good alone. I understand alone. I intended, always, forever, to be alone. So the box, the fucking Darth Vader wannabe, not part of the equation a totally unwelcome addition to my plan. Is she drugged? That's the only thing that makes sense to me. How else to explain unconsciousness lasting this long? Of course, I'm not sure how long this long has been. I fell asleep early afternoon. I woke up to an intruder in my apartment after dusk. And now? I hate the damn dark. It's disorienting. I center my thoughts. I comb the room using sight and sound, which can be more helpful than you think. Above the larger window, the viewing window, I identify a high wall-mounted object, smaller, soft, and foamy to the touch. It's situated to the left of the smooth glass mirror, a speaker, I'm guessing. He watches, and then, eventually, he'll talk, orders, taunts, whatever. But sooner or later, he'll make himself known. And when he does... It'll be all about him asserting control. Breathing. In, out, in, out. I should use it. Roll it into the void. Turn it into part of my separation. Like focusing on the wind in the trees or utilizing the toll of a bell. I can't fight it. I can't change it. I can't block it. Hence, use it. Make it one with me. I hate the damn breathing. I find myself standing over the box, tracing its shape, noting the roughness of the edges. A crude job. I'd like to say I recognize the craftsmanship, but cheap pine boxes are a dime a dozen. I never learned if Jacob crafted his own or purchased it elsewhere. I never asked the question before, and I certainly can't ask it now. She's dying. I know that, kneeling over the box. Because that's what happens to girls trapped in coffin-sized boxes. Physically, mentally, is there a difference? This girl, whatever made her her, is ebbing away, leaking into the wood, the floor, the black-painted room, bit by bit, inch by inch. Soon, evil kidnapper will pop open this lid, and she'll do whatever, say whatever he wants, because it won't matter anymore. The person she was will be gone. Only the shell will remain. Girl bot, ready for programming the type of automaton ready to give up her own beloved father's name. I hate this girl in the box. As I discover myself slowly but surely shredding my own fingernails, a habit hard broken four years ago, I fist my hands, feel the pressure of my nails digging into my palm, and I will myself into the void once again, while she continues to breathe in, out, in, out. Padlock. Standard issue, that's what secures the lid. I have a moment tracing the metal latch, for once again I'm in a filthy, food-stained, sex-soaked basement, studying my own box from the outside in. The sense of deja vu unsettles me, makes this whole thing feel way too personal. More like evil kidnapper went looking for me than I went looking for him. Back into the void, back into the void, back into the void. Feel nothing. Analyze everything. Her breathing. In, out, in, out. Stacy Summers. Could it be possible? Have I found her at last? Suddenly the void is gone. I feel only panic instead. I hate her. This girl, Stacy Summers, whoever. I don't care. She shouldn't be here. I left behind this fucking box. I dealt with the devil. I bargained my soul. I did what, according to Samuel, survivors do in order to see another day. 
So how dare some girl get herself trapped in a box again? How dare she ruin this for me? In, out, in, out, breathing, breathing, breathing. And just like that, moving before I even know I'm going to move, I fist my bound hands together and smash them against the top of the box, again and again and again. Wake up, wake up, wake up! Wake the fuck up! Breathing, in, out, in, out. What the hell? Who could sleep through this? It must be drugs, the only answer. I bang again. I can't help myself. I'm furious at her, at me, at him. I don't know anymore. The box, I think. I'm furious at the fucking box. It must go. I need it to be gone. I find myself shaking the whole thing. It's cheap enough, wobbly enough, to move beneath my angry ministrations. While she breathes, in, out, in, out. I pound the box. Its corresponding shutter gives me another idea. Under different circumstances, I would pick the lock. But having been abducted from the comfort of my own bed, I lack the tools I would normally have on me, two very tiny, innocuous-looking black plastic clips that are actually universal lock picks. But maybe I don't need them. The box shudders and shakes every time I hit it. It's definitely cheap construction. I batter against it with fresh determination. I shove it side to side, feeling the top loosen, the joints give, until, with a horrific scream, I toss it onto its side, roll it all the way over a full 360. When it rights itself, rocking beneath my fingertips, I can feel the lid as a jar, breathing in, out, in, out. How can that even be possible? I grab the lid, wrench it further, until it dangles from its metal latch. Take that, Mr. Amateur Hour. Breathing in, out, in, out. I can't see. The darkness encroaches. The darkness obliterates. So I reach my hands in, fully prepared to grab the occupant from its depths and yank her to salvation. Except nothing. No body, no warmth, no solid mass. I find emptiness, emptiness, emptiness. And yet I can still hear it, breathing in, out, in, out, forever steady. The rhythm of my heartbeat. I search the entire coffin-sized box, with my wrists bound together, my fingers fluttering like butterfly wings, empty, 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 until finally, at the base, a tiny recorder, taped to the bottom of the casket, apparently playing over and over again, breathing in, out, in, out. And in that instant, I'm sure the breathing is mine, pre-recorded while I was unconscious, just as the box is mine. There is no second victim. There was only me. Always me. I look up at the glass window. I can't see it in the dark, but I can feel it before me. I know he's there, watching, waiting, enjoying the show. So I smile. I lift my wrists. I offer him one middle finger. Then I rise from the demolished coffin. I head to the single mattress. And though my heart is thumping wildly, and my pulse racing uncontrollably, though I understand now that this isn't a matter of a simple kidnapping, that this man seems to know things he shouldn't know, that I'm even less in control than I thought, not just another victim, but perhaps the intended victim, I force myself to lie down and turn my back to him. Find the void. Live in the void. In the void, no one can hurt you. And if no one can hurt you, then you never have to be afraid again. If I could go back in time, if I could do one thing, I would drive to my mother's farm. I would sit across from her. I would eat her homemade muffins, accept her sun-brewed tea, and I would let her love me. Except having spent so much time in an empty void, I no longer know how to feel again. Chapter 19 Once the decision was made to take me with him on his trucking route, Everett swung into full preparation mode. He adopted my father's name, while I would be called Molly. He drilled me. 
my name, his name, made me sign another postcard from my mom. I wrote what he said, signed what he wanted. I thought my handwriting looked foreign and strange. Maybe this is what handwriting looked like for girls named Molly. When I was done, fake Everett handed over stiff blue jeans and an oversized white T-shirt, declaring Florida the sunshine state. He'd included underwear and a bra as well, but the bra was several sizes too large and looked like something only a grandmother would wear. When I held it up questioningly, he just shrugged and knocked it to the floor. He ordered me to shower, on account of the close quarters, he informed me. I noticed he had also recently bathed, hair actually combed, and was wearing one of his less stained T-shirts. He watched me in the bathroom as I quickly soaped up my dirt-encrusted skin, scrubbed my long, matted hair. He continued staring as I awkwardly sorted through the cheap, oversized clothes, doing my best to pull them up over my still damp skin. My hands shook. I kept my gaze on the dirt-brown carpet, certain at any moment he'd snatch the clothes away, toss me down, and... But he didn't. If anything, he seemed irritated by my clumsiness. When I finally dragged the T-shirt over my dripping wet hair, he produced a comb from his back pocket and ruthlessly dragged it through my hair himself. Next up from his back pocket, scissors. I flinched. In response, he chuckled. Hair's a fucking mess, he said, his way of making conversation. I wanted to tell him, of course it was a fucking mess. No hair, and certainly not my fine blonde hair, was meant to be shampooed with a cracked bar of ancient hand soap. My locks were accustomed to a soothing regimen of tea tree oil-based shampoos and citrus-scented conditioners. Then there was the weekly deep-conditioning hair mask to add volume and the monthly highlights for shine. Once upon a time, I'd been a teenage girl with standards and gorgeous, glossy, California-inspired long blonde hair. Now. I kept my gaze lowered, feeling the stiffness of my new denim jeans as he fisted the first clump of hair, then went to town. Three snips, that's all it took. Three giant handfuls, three decisive cuts. The wet strands rained down onto the carpet. Crap, he said. I think I made it worse. Oh well, that's what hats are for. I didn't say a word. Just like that, I'd become Molly and we both knew it. But we weren't done yet. He forced me to turn around, covering my eyes with a black strip of cloth, smelled like a musty old T-shirt, then tied it behind my head, obscuring my vision. I never got to watch myself leave the basement prison. Best I could do was track the tops of my bare feet as he pulled me across the dirty carpet to the far door, a creak as it opened, and then, much as I'd suspected, Stairs leading up. He pushed me ahead of him. I stumbled once, twice, three times. He whacked me in the back of the head hard enough to make me wince, and I found my balance. At the top, a brief pause as he reached around me to open another door. Then a change in flooring from cheap commercial-grade carpet to peeling gray linoleum. Was this his house? I wondered as he yanked me forward into what I assumed must be a kitchen. It smelled like the rest of him. Disgusting. I tripped over my own feet, again, trying to slow things down, or honestly uncoordinated. I didn't know anymore. I'd agreed to my new identity. I'd given up my father's name rather than be left alone down in that horrible place. And yet... Funny how you can fear change, even when already surrounded by the worst of the worst. Fresh air. Suddenly I could feel it. Stumbling through the kitchen, out another door, we'd exited the house. To the outside. Front yard? Backyard? Who knew? Who cared? I was standing outside with the wind on my face. And for a second I couldn't help myself. I dug in my bare heels. I lifted up my face. Outside. Fresh air. The rustle of trees. After so, so long. How long? So, so long. 
Frank Everett paused. He gave me one moment. I used it to peer straight up over the top of my blindfold, and then I could see them. Trees soaring high above me, thick and dark against a dimly lit sky. Woods, forest, freedom. Maybe I really was only miles from my mother's farm. Georgia, Everett said, as if reading my mind. Found this place years ago. My own little mountain hideaway. Of course, old geezer who owned it died, and now his no good kids want it back. So we're out of here. Life on the road, that's more fun anyway. Trees, I was still thinking. Forest, woods, just like my mother's farm. And then I couldn't see anymore, because there were too many tears blinding my eyes. With the blindfold on, I couldn't see my way around the house to his big rig. He had to help me step awkwardly onto the wide running board, then grab my arm as I tripped over the driver's seat. I'd never been in a semi before, knew nothing about them. Long-haul trucks were merely vehicles I'd seen on the highway, carrying goods this way and that. Definitely, I'd spent more time and attention on my hair. Now, fake Everett chatted proudly about his raised roof sleeper cab, his home away from home, came complete with a top bunk, coffee maker, and of course a portable DVD player for entertainment. He dragged me around to the driver's captain chair as he was talking. I could feel carpet beneath my bare feet, thicker and nicer than what had been in the basement. It smelled better in here, too, still tainted by the lingering odor of greasy food, but with an overlay of pine-fresh scent, as if at least the truck had been cleaned recently. It deserved that much effort. When I first heard the screech of a latch opening up, I didn't understand it. Then, fake Everett gave me a push, and I pitched forward, as if falling off a step or two. Before I could recover, his hand was squeezing my shoulder, forcefully pressing me down. Too late, I realized I was now standing on a hard wooden surface. The smell of pine. And just like that, I was back in a coffin-sized box, fully clothed this time, with a blindfold over my eyes. What's your name? He demanded from above. Molly, I whispered, too disheartened, too defeated for anything more. Mine? Everett. Who am I? Whoever you want to be. I'm your uncle, Uncle Everett. Where are you from? Florida, I guessed. With that accent? Hardly. We'll say your mama raised you up north, but now you're staying with me. I didn't say anything. He'd get his way. He always got his way. What did I care? Maybe I really was Molly now, because surely the girl I'd been loading up, dropping off, you're in the box, he stated. I didn't respond, feeling more confused than rebellious, locked in a box with a blindfold on. What did it matter? He tugged sharply on a ragged lock of my hair. I nodded belatedly, if only to show I was paying attention. Rest stops, sleepovers, you're in the box. I nodded again. Other times? His voice drifted. He seemed to hesitate. Be good. Play your cards right, and maybe you can come out for a bit. Keep me company. I frowned, not understanding. Was he saying I might join him in the cab? As in, sit in the passenger seat? As in, like a real person? You'll sit on the floor, he clarified now. No one can see you. Maybe, maybe not. I'll take the blindfold off. But you'll be out of the box. Assuming you're good, of course. Do exactly as I say. He paused, waiting expectantly. And finally, I got it. I was leaving the basement, really, truly leaving. And for my punishment, reward, I would now spend all my time, 24-7, with this man. This mean, filthy, awful man in his castle of a big rig, where he got to rule the highway, personal sex slave chained to his side. And in that instant, I understood something else as well, that he was doing this versus killing me. 
which he'd promised to do so many times before right before explaining how he'd then roll my body into the nearest canal and let the gators ensure my mother never saw me again. Everett wasn't going to kill me. He was going to keep me instead. I wondered, in the back of my mind, if that meant he'd grown to like me somehow. And I wondered, in the back of my mind, if that meant I was supposed to like him, too. Everett planted the palm of his hand over my face and forced my head down into the box. I assumed the position, mind churning, as the lid came down. The padlock jangled. My moment of freedom ended. I became once again a girl in a coffin-sized box. Except now. Now I was a girl in motion. He liked to talk while he drove the big rig. Complain, really about the price of gas, the asshole in the Honda Civic who just flipped him off, the pricks at the understaffed loading dock who just cost him two damn hours, and now he couldn't even take a break for lunch. In the good old days, he'd grouse, the smart trucker could fudge his driver's log and carry on. But no, everything's now federally mandated electronic this and federally mandated electronic that. Big brother, always watching. Welcome to the life of a long-haul trucker, he'd tell me, working for assholes while driving through an entire country of assholes. In the beginning, every time the rig's engine fired to life, I flinched. Every time the truck bounced down a rutted road, I went bug-eyed with nausea. After so much time alone in the basement, this, the smell of diesel, the roar of pistons, the violent hum of the beast, was almost too much to take. And yet, much like my experience with the overwhelming boredom of the basement, I learned to adapt. I relaxed my shoulders into the jerk and sway. I absorbed the relentless growl and hum. And bit by bit, I started to discern the nuances of different road surfaces, the cruising speed of highway, the deep grind of slow climbs. Life on the road. Where, according to fake Everett's incessant grumblings, he was permitted to drive 11 out of 14 hours before taking a mandated 10-hour rest. Then, regardless of actual time on the clock, say 11 p.m. or 2 a.m. or 4 a.m., he'd start driving again. And true to his word, away from loading docks, rest stops, and the hustle and bustle of civilization, he'd pull over and let me out. I got to pee squatted behind bushes versus trapped in my own filth. I got to eat Egg McMuffins for breakfast, Subway sandwiches for lunch, and fried chicken for dinner. Downside of the job, Everett would say, handing over yet another bag of fast food while self-consciously patting the grotesque swell of his belly. Dinner was inevitably followed by other demands. He'd driven all day. Of course he needed to blow off some steam. And he had his love nest all ready to go. Was it better being out of the basement? Was it worth it being out on the road, where, from time to time, the blindfold came off, and I watched the world whiz by in a blur of greens and blues and grays? So many other vehicles racing side by side, so many other drivers, an entire country filled with assholes, as Everett liked to say, and yet not a single one who ever saw me. Everett talked a lot, Complained, mostly. And sometimes, once in a while, he even cried in his sleep. Which is how I finally learned about Lindy. Chapter 20 Dee Dee liked to be prepared. Hence, before she and Keynes met up with victim specialist Pam Mason at the FBI's Boston field office, Dee Dee did the practical thing and Googled her. According to the woman's professional bio, Pam Mason had a master's in forensic psych from John Jay. She'd worked crisis management at a major women's shelter in Detroit, talk about baptism by fire, Dee Dee thought, before joining the FBI. She'd moved around the Bureau for the past 15 years, including a stint in Miami, specializing in human trafficking, then a position with the squad specializing in crimes against Americans overseas, the victim specialist was known for her work on a major kidnapping case in Mexico, where the oil executive was returned alive, 
and for a situation in Guatemala where three young American missionaries weren't. In other words, the woman's work history was as impressive as the number of frequent flyer miles she'd accumulated. Diddy wondered what she thought of life in Boston, let alone her current assignment with the Summers family. Keynes had arranged for them to meet in his office at the FBI's downtown Boston headquarters. The meeting place didn't surprise Dee. Federal agents were big on home court advantage. Though why anyone would consider the enormous concrete structure, one of Boston's ugliest buildings, in Dee's humble opinion, an advantage Dee would never know. Then again, compared to the Hoover Building in D.C., never let it be said the federal government was known for good taste. Dee Dee debated bringing Phil along. Sure, he had his own work to do with his own squad and his own co-detective, Carol, but the FBI valued appearances. Given she was meeting with two federal employees, it felt logical, even balanced, for there to be two representatives from the BPD. But the moment she thought it, Dee Dee knew she couldn't do it, precisely because it smacked of politics, and she hated that crap. She'd called Keynes from Florence Dane's apartment not because he was a big-time federal guy, but because he was a known associate of the victim. She planned on keeping that tack here. Flora's disappearance was a BPD case all the way, hence Dee Dee's involvement as a supervisory officer. Interviewing Dr. Keynes and victim specialist Pam Mason was her call, and she would handle it. She was pleasantly surprised to find Keynes waiting for her in the lobby of the FBI headquarters. Given it was Sunday, and federal agents prided themselves on working banker's hours versus an urban detective's relentless 24-7 drill, the building was quiet. Dee Dee still had to present her credentials and sign her life away, but, sadly, no registering of her sidearm she was no longer qualified to carry. Once she'd secured her visitor's pass, Keynes escorted her to the elevators, and away they went. He wasn't one for small talk. No, how was the parking? Did you find the offices okay? What do you think of the weather, chatter? Instead, Kane stood quietly, hands clasped before him as the floors flew by. He discarded his heavy black coat, first time Dee Dee had seen him without it. For his Sunday attire, Kane's had gone with an impeccably tailored charcoal gray suit with just a hint of texture to the fabric. Dee Dee wondered if he had a whole closet full of suits, each one looking more elegant than the last. And just how much time and money did he spend on wardrobe anyway? She had on her caramel-colored leather jacket. It was her favorite. She wore it right up to the coldest, darkest days of winter. Now she noticed how shiny and worn the leather appeared at the cuffs. Oh, yeah, and the apple juice stain, lower right side. Awesome. Elevator stopped. Doors opened. Keynes gestured for her to step out first, so she did the honors. According to Dee Dee's research, the FBI had more than 120 victim specialists and four managers. Dr. Keynes, as one of the head muckety-mucks, was entitled to his own office, complete with an imposing cherrywood desk, a long bank of bookshelves, and a smaller seating area to one side. His desk bore a state-of-the-art-looking computer, a leather cup of requisite pencils and pens, and, of all things, a Rubik's Cube, colors mixed. Dee Dee couldn't help herself. Her gaze went immediately to the 80s phenomenon, and she was already itching to solve it. You can, you know, Kane said, following her gaze. She kept her hands fisted at her side. Who messed it up? I did. To solve later? Or as a test for this little meeting? Sergeant, you read entirely too much into a common toy. She eyed him warily. You're a behavioral expert. Of course I'm suspicious. He smiled. It was a good look on him, easing the severity of his smoothly shaved scalp, high sculpted cheekbones. For a moment, he almost appeared human. I like to shuffle the cube. It helps me think. Given what we discovered at Flora's apartment, I've had much to think about. I like mobiles, Dee Dee found herself saying. Studying intricate patterns where at first glance it appears as one graceful, multi-leveled whole, and yet in fact, as many separate levels moving in precise rhythm. A rap on the door behind them. Dee Dee and Keynes turned to find a woman standing in the doorway. Pam Mason, Dee Dee assumed. At first glance, the woman was older than Dee Dee would have thought. Ash blonde hair worn in a close mass of curls 
that was last popular right around the same time as the Rubik's Cube. Even though it was Sunday, she'd followed Keynes's professional wardrobe example, though with less elegant results, having selected a block-cut 1990s tan suit with padded shoulders and a cream-colored silk blouse that buttoned all the way to the throat and was finished with some kind of silk ruffle. The victim specialist appeared about Dee Dee's height, but with the cut of her jacket, appeared significantly wider. She was also a woman on a mission. She entered the office, simultaneously tucking a file folder under one arm while sticking out her other hand. Sergeant Detective Dee Dee Warren? Pam Mason, victim specialist. I understand you have some questions about the Summers family. The woman grabbed Dee Dee's hand in a firm grip, shook it twice, turned to Kane's with another brisk handshake, then moved straight to the seating area, ready for business. Dee Dee had to admit, she didn't care for the woman's suit, but she had to like the woman's style. A considerate host, Keynes did the honors of offering up coffee. Both women immediately agreed, and he disappeared in search of every investigator's favorite beverage. Dr. Keynes has apprised me of the situation, Pam stated briskly. Okay, Dee Dee shrugged out of her leather jacket, her motions awkward given the stiffness in her left shoulder. She took a seat. I'm sure you can understand we're operating on the QT for the moment regarding Florence Dane's disappearance. Press gets a hold of this. You mean the same media that raked the BPD over the calls on the evening news? Thank heavens it was a Saturday, Dee Dee commented, as the weekend news had notoriously lower viewer numbers than the weeknight editions. Pam Mason arched a brow, but kept the rest of her thoughts to herself. She folded her hands, placed them on the small table. How can I help? Keynes reappeared. He bore two mugs of steaming coffee for them, nothing for himself. Man was so superhuman, he didn't even require caffeine? Figured. I understand that Rosa Dane is acting as a mentor for the Summers family. Pam Mason nodded. I'm wondering. Dee Dee had to collect her thoughts, not sure how much she wanted to say, not sure how much she had to say. I'd like to understand more about the Stacy Summers case, from the family's perspective, the father, Colin, called me this morning. At the first mention of Flora's name, he already assumed she was involved in taking down Devin Goulding. Well, given we never released that detail to the press, he knows things. Exactly. But combine that with the fact Flora has taken a personal interest in Stacy Summers' disappearance and now appears to have gone missing herself. Another arched brow. Then it was Pam's turn to collect her thoughts. She took a sip of coffee. I'm assuming you're familiar with the details of Stacy's abduction, she said at last, given that the BPD is handling the case. I know we have the world's most watched kidnapping video, and yet no real leads. Do you think she's alive? Pam asked abruptly, which was not the question Dee Dee had been expecting. She found herself staring at Keynes, of all people, who sat with his long, elegant fingers steepled in front of him. What's that expression? Dee Dee replied finally. Hope for the best, but plan for the worst? I hope Stacy is still alive. But given the statistics on missing persons cases... Pam nodded. No doubt she was as familiar with the primacy of the first 24 hours as the rest of them. I guess the question is, Dee Dee found herself saying, does the family believe? Or maybe, she thought about it, does Rosa Dane as their mentor believe? The family wants to believe, Pam supplied. Most families do. But as the days stretch longer with no sign of their daughter, they're under a tremendous amount of stress, both feeling the pain of their daughter's disappearance and the agony of their own helplessness. How are they coping? Interestingly enough, it's the mother, Pauline, who is probably doing the best, though I'm sure Colin would disagree. By all accounts, the marriage is a solid one, Traditional New England roles. He's a workaholic investment banker. She raised their daughter, tends the home, and is involved in the community. Church, local high school, various charities, the like. Stacy is their only child. Pauline suffered several miscarriages before her birth, which makes Stacy a miracle child. Dee Dee winced. She couldn't imagine that kind of salt on the wound to have already lost multiple babies, then, 19 years later, having the lone survivor no doubt the apple of her parents' eyes. Stacy is described as kind, vibrant, happy, athletic, Dee Dee said, 
mother or father, definitely takes after the mom. They're very close, the kind of mother-daughter that are often mistaken for sisters. Pauline took the news of Stacy's disappearance very hard. I'd never describe her as weak, but she's one of those women who wears her heart on her sleeve, which makes her transparent in her pain. Support network? Didi asked. Good. In addition to church ties, they have a close network of friends in the neighborhood, other families from Stacy's school, that sort of thing. In the beginning, they were deluged with food, offers of assistance, etc., etc. One of my first jobs, in fact, was turning everyone away, given Pauline's delicate mental state. Delicate mental state. The initial shock definitely overwhelmed Pauline. She fell apart. But, to be fair, she then let her support network help put her back together. The tight network of ladies from church, fellow moms, her own sisters, they gave her strength. Colin, on the other hand, concerns me more. He's the consummate alpha male. For most of his life, there's been no problem he couldn't solve. Now this. The very foundations of his world have been rocked. Pauline externalizes her pain, which allows others to help bear the load. Colin purely internalizes. He was quite angry when he spoke to me by phone. The victim specialist merely nodded. And Rosa Dane's role in all this? She's the equalizer between the two. She's empathetic enough and optimistic enough for Pauline, Rosa's daughter's safe recovery one year later being an example of success. But Rosa is also tactical, which is what Colin wants. She's well-versed on media appearances, as well as the need in this day and age to work social media. But the lead investigator loves that, Dee Dee muttered. Pam Mason shrugged. All detectives wanted to control their own investigations, and all families wanted to be involved. Was Stacy close to her family? Dee Dee asked. Very. Any reason to harbor any suspicions on the home front? No. I spent three months with the Summerses. They really were the postcard for family closeness, and frankly, I don't say that lightly. In my line of work, I spend more time pulling skeletons out of closets than framing happy family photos. So Pauline is leaning on family and friends to get her through, while Colin nurses his rage and rides the local investigators. Is he back to work? Yes, limited hours, but I recommended his return. Staying home isn't good for him. Work is how he copes. Dee Dee couldn't argue with that, given her own predilections. Is the wife angry about that? No, like a lot of stay-at-home wives, she's accustomed to the house being her domain. Her husband's sudden appearance 24-7 strained the patterns of their marriage more than it helped. Part of my job is to help a family understand that the more it deviates from its established rhythms during the time of crisis, the more everyone's stress escalates. Normalcy is also an excellent coping strategy. Does Rosa Dane agree with that? The victim advocate hesitated. Rosa is a rare mentor. She listens to Pauline. She talks to Colin. I've been impressed. Generally speaking, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's Program. Pam Mason made a noise in her throat. I've never worked with a family mentor, Dee Dee confessed. And the program has the best of intentions. Let parents who've already been through the worst offer support to families who've just entered the crisis. I'm sure the volunteer mentors receive some training for the role, but at the end of the day... They're lay people, not experts. They've had one experience. Whereas someone like me, Pam's gaze flickered to Kane's, like us. There is no such thing as one response to crisis. Our job is to appraise the family and identify the approach that is right for this one particular situation. Whereas the volunteer mentors, inevitably, they are operating from a place of their own trauma. Whatever advice they offer, suggestions they have, has more to do with who they are and what they went through than the family they are supposedly aiding. To me, they're more inclined to try and fix whatever they perceive as having gone wrong in their case than help the new family through their own experiences. Now Rosa, on the other hand, Pam frowned. She's a rare mentor who seems to be able to distinguish between her daughter's disappearance and what the Summerses are now going through. How often does she meet with them? In person, not often. Rosa lives three, four hours north, and given in the first four weeks, the media circus camped out on the Summers' sidewalk. She speaks to them by phone, mostly. 
How often is hard for me to say. The summer's phone rings a lot. But you've seen her, obviously. Twice. First time, she spent the day with mostly Pauline, quietly holding her hand. Pam paused, regarded Dee Dee intently for a second. That's rare, you know, just being with someone. I'm the supposed expert, and I'm not even good at it. Well, you have a job to do, Dee Dee countered. That's different. The victim advocate shrugged. Second visit was at the five-week mark. Pauline was coming out of the worst of her funk. Rosa had more of a strategy meeting with both Summerses. Questions they should ask, rights they have, resources that are available to them. In particular, Colin wanted to know media strategies, how to make a personal appeal for his daughter's safe return, that sort of thing. Yeah, I've seen a couple of those on the news, Didi agreed. Rosa's advice was solid enough. Most of it was things we'd already told them, but I can understand it sounding better coming from someone who'd been there, done that. The biggest thing she repeated, which I appreciated, is that this is a marathon, not a sprint. If they really want to be there for their daughter, they need to come up with a way to stop living from minute to minute, waiting for the phone to ring, and settle in for the long haul. Come up with a system for family and friends to visit where it's helpful but not overwhelming. Return to work, the everyday patterns of life. Ignore the press unless it's on their terms. And her advice on managing the case detectives? Didi asked, because there had to be advice on investigator relations. Any family had issues with investigator relations. The detectives are not their friends or allies. They work for the state. If the Summerses really want to know what's going on, they should hire their own private detective. Didi's eyes widened. Did they? Colin talked about interviewing candidates. Lovely, more cooks in the kitchen. But the case agent will love that. Pam merely shrugged. Do I think a private eye is magically going to make a difference in finding Stacy? No. Do I think it helps Colin feel more in control of the situation and therefore ease some of his stress in the short term? Sure. Problem is, Rosa Dane had it right. This is a marathon, not a sprint, meaning eventually a PI's lack of progress will be just as hard to take. So when did they meet with Flora? Dee Dee gambled. Rosa's daughter? They haven't, to my knowledge. Did Rosa discuss her daughter's experience? Yes. So they're familiar with her case. Makes sense they might want to personally meet her, don't you think? The walking proof that a young girl can disappear from a bar and still one day be found safe. Maybe. But I've never seen Flora at the house. Dee Dee frowned. She was following the Summers case. Closely. She shot Kane's a look. He didn't deny it. Again, Pam shrugged. Could she have talked to them by phone? Didi asked. Possible. They never mentioned it, but Colin, especially, isn't one to share. Why are you so sure she had contact with them? Colin, when he called this morning, he asked directly if Flora had been the one to kill Devin Goulding, which was a pretty big conversational leap. Furthermore, when I pressed him about Flora, he immediately became evasive. I would swear he must know her if only from what he wasn't willing to say. I never saw her at the house, Pam considered out loud, and Pauline never mentioned anything to me, but it's possible Flora met Colin at his office. Why meet with him and not Pauline? Talk to the father but not the mother, Dee Dee asked. I might know the answer to that. Kane spoke up abruptly. He was relaxed back in his own chair, fingers now clasped on the table. By all means, Dee Dee indicated. He turned his gaze to his fellow victim advocate. According to your assessment of the family dynamics, Pauline, the mother, functions as the heart of the family, the emotional epicenter. True. While the father, Colin, he's the brains and the brawn. He's focused on tactics, strategies, anything to ensure his daughter's safe return. Alpha male, Pam agreed. Flora isn't interested in emotions. She's not comfortable with them. Tactics, on the other hand getting things done. At that moment, Dee Dee got it, knew exactly where Keynes was leading. Colin Summers didn't hire a private investigator to find his daughter, she said. Kane shook his head. No. Chances are, he hired Floor instead. Chapter 21 Are you in pain right now? Do your joints ache? Your fingers burn? Does your skull throb? 
No? Then you're fine. Are you thirsty right now, doubled over with hunger pangs, looking at your own skin just to have something to taste? No? Then you're okay. Are you freezing right now, or maybe overheated, with sweat streaming down your face, feeling either stifling hot or bone-cracking cold? Not yet? Then you've got nothing to complain about. Are you lonely right now, terrified or frightened or overwhelmed by the dark? Are you thinking that if he left right now, never came back, there would be nothing you could do? You would be stuck here. You would die here, all alone. And your mother would never know, never even get to bury your body. Just as he has threatened, promised, time and time again. No? Then you're fine. Listen to me. Believe me. Trust in me. I know what I'm talking about. I'm comfortable. I'm not in pain or hungry or cold or hot or frightened. I need nothing. I want nothing. I am fine. Locked alone in the dark. I'm perfectly all right. When I wake up again, I'm immediately aware of a change to the room. Food. The smell of roasted chicken wafts toward me through the dense black, and the scent of something hot and savory. Gravy, dressing, mashed potatoes, maybe all three. My stomach growls immediately, and despite my best intentions, I start to salivate. I still can't see. I remain alone in a sea of night, not even a sliver of light to illuminate the frame of a doorway. But the smell is strong and fresh. Definitely, there's food somewhere in the room. I sit up gingerly, feeling around with my fingertips. The last thing I want to do is knock over a plate of sustenance and waste this unexpected offering. I still have no sense of time or rhythm in this sensory deprivation chamber. Does a chicken platter mean it's dinner time? of the day I was taken or later? And does this mean I'm entitled to food, three hots and a cot, as the saying goes? Or is this yet one more experiment being conducted by evil kidnapper, first to explore my reaction to a cheap pine coffin, now to witness the animal in the zoo at feeding time? Had he read my case file? Maybe he's one of the crime junkies who followed my case in the news, a fan of sorts, who heard about a girl who was kidnapped and held in a pine box. Except, instead of being horrified that such a thing could happen, it struck a nerve, unlocked a deep, dark fantasy he never even knew he had. Such guys exist. After I returned home, I received letters from several of them, turned on by all the lurid details of my captivity. I even received a marriage proposal because Jacob Ness isn't the only monster out there. And yes, they take an interest in one another's work. I remind myself I'm not interested in motives yet, just tangibles. And the scent of chicken could promise more than just food. What about a ceramic plate, or better yet, a cutting knife? I move slowly off the mattress, dropping to my knees as my tethering chain rattles behind me. It irks me to crawl on the floor, I'm nearly positive he must watch through the one-way glass, wearing night-vision goggles to penetrate the gloom. Because, again, why go to all this trouble if not to enjoy the spectacle? Most likely he waited till I dozed off, then opened the door I haven't found yet, delivered the food, then exited in time to take in the show. I hate the idea of some person, some faceless, nameless freak, watching me crawl. But tripping over the dinner offering would be worse. So forward I go, bound hands in front of me, chain rattling behind me as I inchworm forth. The smell is coming from the opposite side of the room, where the pine box was. I make my way carefully through the dark, feeling my way with my fluttering fingers. Sure enough, I hit the edge of the pine box with my left shoulder. I pause, back up, feel around the edges. He's rebuilt it, son of a bitch. I'd smash the thing apart, left it in half a dozen distinct pieces. Why not? But now it's once again intact. I curse, 
am tempted to halt my pursuit of roasted chicken in order to destroy the box out of pure spite. But I force myself to stop and think. Why rebuild the box? Head games? Because even now, somewhere outside the viewing window, he's grinning to himself, watching me explore a cheap pine coffin with my fingertips. He wants a response, is probably leaning forward in anticipation of my look of terror. Fuck him. No way I'm giving him that satisfaction. Okay, so when did he rebuild the box? Surely if he'd come into the room, even while I was sleeping and worked on it, I would have heard him, and given I'd yanked apart all the various wooden panels. He must have removed it, snatched up the pieces and carted them out. Then after rebuilding it, or buying a second one, re-delivered it. This makes me frown. I keep my back to the one-way mirror, feeling suddenly uneasy. I'm not sure which thought disturbs me more, that my captor can enter and exit the room multiple times without rousing me, or that he might have an unlimited supply of cheap pine coffins. I finger the lacy edge of my satin nightgown. Again, the level of preparedness indicated by his actions. A predator who is more than your average bear. A man who has done his homework. He knows me. I'm almost certain of it. One of the men who wrote me a letter in the past five years. One of the very many predators who read every salacious detail of my captivity and thought, wow, if only I could get a girl like that for myself. My hands are shaking. With my wrists bound, I can feel my fingers tremble against one another, and I hate the weakness. Worse, my instinctive desire to start picking at my own thumb, find a ragged edge, tear off the nail, use the pain to ground me. As I did so many minutes, hours, days ago, when I was trapped in the box. Food. I can smell it so close it tantalizes. I need to focus. I'm hungry, definitely, and given I don't know when I might be able to eat again. Evil kidnapper might have read all about me. Evil kidnapper might even feel he knows me. But that was the old Flora, not the one who spent the past five years studying, training, preparing. I am now Flora 2.0. I'm a woman with promises left to keep. Dinner. The promise of sustenance. I will not waste it just because of a stupid pine box, some twisted blast from the past, or the unnerving realization someone is most likely watching me. Time to eat. I scoot around the box, inching forward with my bound wrists rocking against the floor. I explore between the box and the wall for the prospect of roasted chicken, but nothing. I move all around the box, continue through the rest of the room. Nothing. Finally, I sit back on my heels next to the bare mattress, my back once again to the watcher's window, and contemplate things. Smell is hard to trace. It could be coming from another room, I suppose. Or worse, he's piping it in somehow. Maybe from the grate next to the one-way glass. Meaning, there's no food at all. This whole thing is just like some bad science experiment where I'm playing the role of mouse in the maze. But the smell is so strong, so close. Heat. It comes to me. I'm not just smelling chicken, but I swear I can feel it. Steam wafting through the air. And I felt it strongest, smelt it sharpest, over by the pine box. My shoulders come down. Immediately. I know what he's done. Son of a bitch. I cross back to the rebuilt, or second, box. Sure enough, Crude holes are drilled in the lid. Should I rub my fingers against the jagged edges, tear my own flesh, jam a sliver into the softness of my skin, then suck out the blood? Good times from the good old days? Is that what he wants from me? I keep my fingers fisted tight as I lean closer and sniff at the first hole. Chicken, no doubt about it. And yes, I don't just smell it. I can feel it. A trace of heat and steam wafting up from inside of the box. Son of a bitch. I find the padlock easily enough. Of course it's locked, because why not? As long as you're torturing someone with the olfactory promise of dinner, of course you're going to lock the actual food away. I mean, leaving the lid open, where would be the fun in that? 
Am I hungry right now? Yes. Am I thirsty right now? Yes. But am I in pain? Am I terrified, depressed, beaten, too hot, too cold, too overwhelmed? No. Then I'm all right. I can think this through. Option one, walk away. Or, being me, more likely turn around, once more flip him the finger, then resume my position on the mattress. Disadvantages include going hungry, but also food might not just be food. What about utensils, plates, hell, a plastic cup, resources, potential tools? The box is a care package of sorts, and being all alone in the dark, I can't afford to give up on the contents, which means I'm going to have to open the box. I did it once before by hammering it apart with my bound wrists. I was pretty pissed off at the time and, frankly, trying to shake up the occupant, an approach I'm not so sure will yield great results from my prospective dinner. I could pick the lock. Mattress has coils. Coils 